the boy looked ahead with bewildered eyes. He was sitting on the floor in front of a colorful special door that could change his life. In his bloody clothes, he reached for it. He reached for the door handle. Suddenly, two evil men began to threaten him. They wanted to kill him. This happened to the boy for the second time. There was an explosion behind him. His legs were half burnt. He was screaming in pain. He did not want to make the same mistake a second time. He regained consciousness. He opened that door. This time he was determined that the door would be his. He pulled himself to the entrance with his hands. The men behind him were aggressively attacking him. But the guy was ready to give his life for that door. He wanted it back for himself. That was all he wanted to achieve. There was a TV in the room with news on it. Two anchors were introducing the studio's guest, the country's first gold medalist, Renji Hirasaka. A red-haired boy was sitting on the couch, and a dark-haired boy was kneeling behind him. Renji Hirasaka said hello. A 15-year-old boy named Ariaki Subaru was in awe of the golden player. A 13-year-old boy named Ariaki Taiga, who was not happy, asked him to be quiet. They were not blood brothers. So Taiga asked Subaru not to act like an older brother. Subaru became upset. On television, they talked about yesterday's incident with the opening of the Otherworldly Gate with Hirosaki's participation. They found it too late, so the monsters that came out of it caused a disaster that killed 13 people. Renji Hirosaka quietly agreed. Conventional weapons were ineffective against the creatures trapped there. A countdown was displayed until the end of the opening. They had three seconds left. When the timer ran out, the monsters from the other world would come out. Hirosaka interrupted the host by saying that they, the players selected for the summoning door, had to enter it before the timer expired and destroy the otherworldly creatures to prevent this disaster. Hirosaka said that what happened was a tragic accident, and he saved everyone by killing the monster. Rinji did it with just one punch. He expressed his regret that he could not prevent the situation that led to the deaths. The host began to convince him that he had done everything in his power. She added that citizens considered him a hero. Rinji told the audience to report the gate as soon as they saw it, so that something like this would not happen again. This was the only way the players could protect people from the creatures, even at the cost of their lives. Subaru was in awe of Rinji Hirasaka. Something happened five years ago. Suddenly, Gates of the Underworld began to appear all over the world from which hostile beings were coming. Conventional weapons were powerless, so people lost hope. Soldiers could not resist goblins and dragons, but eventually they were conquered. This was done by a special person who entered the summoning door that appeared at the same time as the gate. He was called the player. There were gold, silver, and bronze doors depending on the rank. Gold players were the strongest. In exchange for protecting the population, he received high status, honor, and a large amount of money like Rinji. Such a player was considered unsurpassed, an example for others. The host asked him what qualities he needed to have to become such a player. Rinji said that the challenge doors had taught them that they should choose the person with the strongest soul. Taiga laughed at his words. He turned and looked at his brother. In an instant, he turned pale. Subaru was as if mesmerized. A golden door appeared in their kinata. Subaru stared at it without blinking. Renji's interview continued. Subaru began to reach for the door handle. He was about to open it. Suddenly, Taiga pushed his brother away from the door. Subaru fell to the floor. He got up. Taiga was opening the golden door. His face was terrified and he hypocritically apologized to Subaru. Taiga wanted to take the door for himself. Subaru rushed to him. But Taiga had already entered the door. Three years later, low-rise buildings stood next to each other. There was a cobweb stretching across two buildings. On it hung a thin boy in only shorts. He was 18-year-old Arake Subaru. A stone flew. The boy grimaced in pain. Three boys were mocking and ridiculing him. They threw stones at him. Subaru's face was sad. The boys were laughing and telling him to try to dodge. The blue-haired boy swung with a stone in his hand. 
someone called out to Toru Har. It was a man who grabbed the boy's arm, stopping this abuse of Subaru. Next to him stood a pretentious man with a pink-haired girl in his arms. He was looking at us with his yellow eyes. That day, Subaru's brother, who had taken the door, returned alive. Taigu then became the youngest player in Japan. And now, he was watching Subaru being bullied. He hung there powerless to do anything. He was being bullied by three bronze-class guys. Taigu said he was disgusted to be his younger brother, even though they were not blood relatives. Subaru was sad. Taiga asked the bronze-class boys for a stone. He grabbed the stone in his hand. It burst into flames. A yellow column of smoke rose above the buildings. The three bronze boys covered their faces and turned away. Subaru hung there with a confused expression. Taiga had a golden hand, which he raised in the air. The boys assumed it was similar to Hirasaki Renji's golden sword killing technique. Tears spilled from Subaru's eyes. Taiga swum. He kicked the stone with all his might. It flew like a meteor. The stone almost hit Subaru. Suddenly, the web broke. The stone flew far into the sky. The boys were shocked that the clouds were scattered by such a force. Subaru's shorts were wet. He was hanging on the torn spider web, listening to the boys mock him for wetting himself. Taiga looked up. He covered his eyes and bowed his head with a smile. Taigu took the girl's hand and left, telling them to do whatever they wanted. He didn't feel sorry for him at all. The boys looked at each other. Tears were flowing down Subaru's face. The boys looked at him with disrespect. They wanted to continue the abuse. A girl who was passing by took a picture with her phone. Subaru was lying on the floor with all his belongings scattered around. He and his brother were the complete opposite of each other. The girl exclaimed that she would have killed herself a long time ago. Subaru was lying there with tears in his eyes. It was already dark outside. There was a report about the gates of the other world. The TV newscaster said that all the gates that had appeared in Kodo, Sujinami, and Shinishawake had been destroyed. Gold-ranked player Ariaki Taiga predicted four incidents with otherworldly gates. The cork flew off a bottle of champagne. Taiga had a rich feast. The father was proud of his son. The mother raised her glass, expressing her pride in her son, who was still studying, but was already providing for his parents. VOA said that he was not like the unfortunate boy his father had made with his mistress. My father remazed at what he heard. He considered him a mistake of this world. They had a fancy house with a big house. Subaru lived in a tiny room where he barely fit. Taiga turned the bottle over and noticed that it was already empty. He got up and left with a wad of money. Subaru heard an offensive shout from outside. He came out of his closet. Taiga ordered him from the window to buy him a soda. Subaru said he was doing his homework, but that was not the reason for Taigu. He said that Subaru belonged to him for the rest of his life. He crumpled the bills into a fist and threw them at Subaru. He covered his face as he listened to Taiga's scornful exclamations. The bag contained six bottles of water. Subaru walked down the dark street. He was disappointed with his life. Taiga was waiting for his brother. Subaru's face showed hopelessness. He was thinking about what Taiga had said. He was afraid that he was doomed for the rest of his life. Even in decades to come, he would lie in a closet and die from the heat in summer and the cold in winter in that insect cage. Subaru imagined covering himself with boxes, working until he fainted, listening to his parents scold him about how useless he was. Subaru was called a stinging worm. He imagined how, in his old age, he would grab the door frame and get out of his cage, getting down on his knees and taking money to buy his younger brother a soda. He was scared, imagining his old age like that. Subaru did not want this. He grabbed his head dropping the bag. Subaru wanted to go back a few years, where he was standing in front of that golden door. He wouldn't let anyone in. He held his hands over his face and wanted to die rather than live this life. Three bronze guys came up behind him. Subaru looked back at them with fear. The guys said they were tired at the gate. The monster in Sado had left him scarred. 
There was a sword blade in front of Subaru's face. The boy asked him out to ease the tension. Subaru started to run away. The guys watched Subaru run away from them. The pain was driving the guy crazy. The second one suggested going to hospitals. But the guy with the scar and the smile on his face wanted to kill Subaru. Subaru ran as fast as he could. The guys were already there mocking him. Saatari swung his sword. He cut Subaru. The boys were having fun. Subaru suspected that they wanted to kill him. He screamed in pain, begging them not to kill him. He just wanted to die, but he didn't want to be killed. Subaru was running away from the guys, holding his cut arm. Tears and snot ran down his face. They ran past a dark alley. Sawtari pushed Subaru into it. He was lying on the floor. Subaru was screaming. The guys were standing over him. Subaru was punched in the face. He asked them to stop. Subaru kissed the guy's boot with his chin. He was hiding from the blows. He was in pain. He thought he was going to die. Subaru was lying beaten. The guy was about to finish him off. Scarred used an explosive red rose skill. Subaru called for help. Sautari swung his arm at him. Suddenly, something strange happened. One of the bronze men noticed it too. A door began to appear nearby. Subaru stood up a little to see. The guy with the scar looked scared. After all, the door cut Kuzaki in half. Subaru was on the opposite side of the door. The two guys' faces showed fear. They were looking at the dead Kuzaki. They didn't understand why the door had appeared right there. Subaru was looking at the bronze door. Suddenly, it began to crack. They became silver. This shocked the boy. In an instant, it became gold. So Atari could not comprehend what had happened. Subaru looked at the door exhausted. He was sitting right in front of it. Suddenly, the door began to shake. Subaru watched in fascination. The golden door began to crack. It became colored. Subaru was shocked to see a rainbow door. The boys did not understand it, because there is no better door than the golden one. They noticed that there was no handle on the door. It was on the Subaru's side. Sautari looked at the door, the other at his dead friend. Subaru was going to open the door this time, as he had promised himself. His hand reached for the handle. He got to his feet. The boys were furious. They wanted to kill Subaru. This was the second time this had happened to him, when he was sitting in the room next to the door. He was not going to make the same mistake. The guy with the scar attacked Subaru. He flew up, but held on to the handle. His legs flew off in the other direction. Subaru screamed in pain. He remembered how he was hanging from the spider's whip. He remembered lying naked on the ground. He remembered Taiga, and how they called him a miserable worm. Subaru found his strength. This time, he wanted to take the door for himself. The boys aggressively attacked Subaru. He crawled into the rainbow door. Subaru was ready to give his life for that door. The colorful door closed. Recalling how he had once been pushed away from a door, Subaru was determined to take it for himself. He wanted the power of a golden hand like Taiga's status like his, honor like Renji's, and money. That was what Subaru wanted to achieve. He was lying in a white room with a door. There were tears in his eyes. A system plate appeared in front of Subaru. It greeted Ariaki Subaru. He was still lying head down. A foot was approaching him. Someone stood right next to Subaru. The alert announced the beginning of the rainbow challenge. In front of Subaru, was a strange creature with terrible fangs and long claws. The monster opened its jaw. It touched Subaru's head with its hand. From that day on, his story began. The rainbow monster touched the head of the crippled Subaru, who had crawled through the door. Its claw touched Subaru's hair. The monster pierced his head with its finger. Suddenly, an electric charge appeared around Subaru. A notification informed him of an update in the system. The damage in Subaru's body was regenerating, and his vision was also being corrected. Subaru's limbs began to recover. His heart and lungs were coming back to life. Subaru opened his eyes. He sat up and started screaming. Drops of sweat were running down his forehead. 
Before his eyes was a rainbow monster. He recoiled in fear. The monster was walking away. Subaru turned his head in fright, looking around. The creature was walking toward its throne. He realized that a moment ago, he had walked through the rainbow door. The creature sat back down and addressed the boy. Subaru remembered television. The anchor asked Renji Hirasaka what was behind the door. He answered that everything was made of gold, and the place looked like a medieval castle. Renji assumed that this was the place where the Lord lived. These words shocked the host. Behind every door were the rulers of space. And the future player had to meet them and accept the challenge. And Subaru saw nothing but the alleged master. He was looking at him. Subaru began to worry. He remembered that Renji had said that his master was a knight in golden armor. He had recognized him after Renji had struck him. From then on, he received some of his master's powers. Renji had a huge sword, which he showed in the studio. Subaru looked down. He realized that the challenge meant that he had to strike the master once. Subaru looked at the master. He could not comprehend that he needed to hit what was obviously a monster. The creature sat leaning on his arm. Subaru forced a smile. The creature called him a boy. Subaru's face was frightened that the creature could speak. It asked how long Subaru was going to be sitting there. After all, his body was restored, but he was not sure about the functioning of Subaru's brain. He said that they were fine. Subaru was shocked that the creature spoke so well. The master told him to get down to business and accept his challenge. He was waiting to strike to give the boy power. Subaru asked to wait. He asked who the creature was. This confused him, so he asked again. Subaru explained that he had only heard of gold, silver, and bronze doors. The creature shouted and asked what difference it made. The monster waved his hand. Subaru knelt down with his hands over his ears. A circle of fire began to surround him. Subaru did not understand what was happening. He turned back. He realized that he could not hit it. The creature was tapping his finger on the arm of his chair. It was demanding that Subaru do something to end it and go to sleep. Subaru was thrown back by the loud noise. His legs were shaking, and he could not stand on them. The creature was surprised by what he heard. The monster did not understand why Subaru was chosen among all the others. He covered his face in shame. Resigned, the creature waved his hand. A sword fell next to Subaru. He was frightened. Looking up, he saw a huge number of different weapons falling down from the sky. Subaru began to scream. The creature cringed. The red weapon landed. It didn't hit Subaru, but only surrounded the frightened boy. The creature pointed to the axes and swords, adding that Subaru could use them if he was scared. It also suggested that he turn around and leave if nothing worked. Subaru held his head. He was thinking about what to do. The monster sat waiting. Subaru looked at the door. He had a choice, either to hit it or to return to his old life. The boy looked at the rainbow door. Subaru began to lift his body. His legs were shaking. He stood on two legs. The creature began to smile. Subaru grabbed the door handle. He surprised the creature, who added that if he had not wanted the soap, he would not have opened the door. Subaru stopped. It was true, but he was scared. He realized that those who had the power could not understand him. Subaru's hand held the handle. The creature called the boy pathetic. Subaru stood next to the door. He held the pen in silence. The boy remembered all the insults from the boys. How they called him a worm. Those words echoed in his head. The creature said that he should continue to live, crawling on all fours. Tears began to flow down Subaru's face. His eyes were frightened. He saw a reflection of himself in his old age. Subaru saw himself unhappy. He closed his teeth. He touched the door with his hand. The creature was looking at Subaru. It was asking him to stop. He was hitting the door with his hand. He was hysterical. Subaru said that it was easy for everyone to say that. These words interested the creature. Subaru shouted that with power, it is very easy to call someone pathetic. The creature laughed. Because it was true. Subaru asked it to stop playing with him. He remembered how much he had been beaten. 
how he was treated like garbage. Subaru was screaming out of despair. This made the creature very happy. He said that the worm had gone mad. Subaru screamed. He called the creature a monster. Subaru began to run toward him. The creature looked at the boy in confusion. Subaru ran to attack to take back his power. He swung his fist. The creature smiled. His fist touched the creature's face. Subaru opened one eye. He saw the cracks from his fist. Subaru threw a punch. The creature stood in front of him. It praised Subaru. The boy was confused. The creature noticed the blow caused by hatred. He had never seen so much madness in the eyes. The being took Subaru by the shoulder. He said that the boy was right for him. The creature bit Subaru's shoulder with its teeth. The boy screamed in pain. A bloody flame appeared nearby. Subaru's face was covered with bloody streaks. He did not understand why the creature was killing him. Subaru screamed. He bit the creature's shoulder in anger. He wanted to get this power. This confused the creature. It began to laugh. Subaru's face continued to turn red and his teeth clenched. The creature said it would serve the boy. Subaru's eyes were shocked. They continued to stand side by side. Subaru was cringing. They pulled away from each other. The creature was smiling. Subaru was screaming with rainbow cracks on his face. The system issued a notification that the challenge had been confirmed. Subaru was lying on the floor with rainbow cracks. The notification said that the player's body was restored. The being told Subaru that they would see each other again. The boy lay with his eyes rolled back. The being answered the question of who he was. His name was Vankish. The being stood over Subaru, saying his name. Vankish called the boy strange. He laughed at Subaru. Vankish began to disappear. The notification said the call was over. Ariaki Subaru became a player. He was at the first level. Subaru accepted Vankish's abilities. Subaru opened his eyes and spoke the creature's name. He also got the blood manipulation skill. There was also the bonus of the rainbow skill. These were additional bonuses in the form of steps in front of the eyes, hatred of brightness, and usurpation of blood. There was a rainbow in Subaru's eyes. The notification said that the empty summoning world was ceasing to exist. Subaru did not understand what was meant. The notification warned that the player had 30 seconds to leave the room. The surface was collapsing. She was almost at the door. But the Subaru couldn't move. The door collapsed. Subaru fell into the abyss. He found himself in endless darkness. The rainbow door shattered. The guys on the other side saw that the door had split. They concluded that Subaru had failed the challenge and was dead. The guy with the scar was annoyed by this situation. They were already leaving, thinking that they should have gone through that door. But behind them, a rainbow split was forming. They turned back in shock. Subaru jumped out of the rainbow portal. The bronze two were puzzled. Subaru looked devastated. The boys were not happy to see him back. Sawatari glared at Subaru. The boy landed on his feet. Subaru became a player. His eyes shone with a rainbow. The bronze boys could not comprehend that he had become a player. Subaru looked at the two. He bowed his head. Subaru realized that he had received the power of Vankish. Suddenly there was a commotion. Subaru was being attacked. Savitari attacked him with fury. Subaru tried to stop them, but the bronzes were furious that he had intercepted the door. Ariaki believed that they were meant specifically for him. The guy with the scar swung his sword. Subaru dodged it. His eyes tensed. A rainbow poured out of them. The boy was approaching Ariaki. The knife flew by. Subaru noticed something strange. He saw everything. The knife blade could not touch the boy. Subaru dodged all the blows. He did not understand why he could not hit him. Subaru saw everything in slow motion. The guy didn't stop, but he missed. Subaru saw the trajectory of the sword. He could see it, so he managed to dodge it. The other guy was shocked. His friend was consumed with rage at his failure. Subaru, with his rainbow-colored, calm eyes, continued to dodge. He took his hand that held the sword. Subaru asked him to stop. Sawatari looked him straight in the eye. 
and suddenly he looked down. Subaru's legs were shaking, and he was holding a sword. He had a smile on his face. He was angry that Ariaki had grabbed his arm. Subaru immediately apologized. The boy's foot flew into Subaru's stomach. He called him a wimp. He swung his arm, but it hit the wall next to Ariaki's face. He punched him quickly, and the Subaru flew away. Ariaki held his jaw in pain, but he noticed that there was not a single scratch on his face. The Subaru's eyes reflected a warning. He could see the level of his health. Subaru looked at the system alerts further. It informed him that if his health reached zero, he would lose the ability to fight. Subaru tried to comprehend all this new information. He saw the world differently. There were different indicators, reticle hints. It was an area that was visible only to the player. He realized the reason why he didn't feel any pain from the hit. He was just scared, but his jaw was intact. Subaru realized that he had actually become a player. The guy with a scar was shocked at the zero effect of the punch. His friend suggested that Subaru now saw the menu and fought with it. Sawatari shut his friend up. He thought Subaru had only been peeing in his pants during the day. Sawatari wanted it to stay that way. Sawatari used his skill. It was a blood rose. The barrel of force was aimed at Subaru. The guy tried to jump away from the impact. The fire was a centimeter away from Subaru's face. There was a big explosion. Sawatari was already happy. But then he saw something and changed his expression. He could hear some strange sounds coming from the column of smoke. Subaru stood on his feet with a few scratches. He could feel the burns. Subaru thought he was going to die. But the health indicator decreased by a quarter. He realized that he shouldn't have taken too many blows. Sawatari was frightened, because usually his red rose would make the car fly into pieces. He could not comprehend what level of damage the Subaru had if it could withstand such a blow. His friend suggested that Sawatara leave, but he did not agree with this suggestion. Sawatari wanted to finish Subaru off before he leveled up, because then they would not be able to take him down. Sawatari said that the first level would be his last. Subaru looked at the two bronze men who were planning something. He thought about escaping. Suddenly, his body became wrapped in threads. Subaru remembered that these were the same threads on which he had been hanging recently. These ash-colored threads were the blue-haired boy's scalp, and they were hard to break. Savitari took this opportunity to attack. Subaru realized that things were bad. He also had to have some kind of skill. The edge of the knife was coming towards him. Subaru thought about using his powers, but he didn't know how to use them at all. Suddenly, blood was pouring out. Blood-colored blades stuck out of Subaru's body. He opened his eyes, closed in fear. These red blades stopped the enemy's sword. They also pierced Savitara's body. He began to scream in pain. It was Vankish's power to manipulate blood. Subaru turned back when he heard his master. Vankish said, that he would show him how to use the skill only once. The blood manipulation controlled her condition for ten seconds. Now it turned into blades that pierced Savitari's cap. Blood gushed out of Savitari's body. Blood was also dripping on the ground near Subaru's feet. Vankish told the boy that he could use his hatred. Subaru looked to the side, mumbling his master's name. The point of the knife was suddenly next to the pupil of Subaru's eye. He had managed to dodge Sawatari's last thrusts. He was furious. Subaru didn't understand why he kept coming at him. Spitting blood, Sawatari ordered Subaru to shut up. He held him responsible for Kazaki's murder. Subaru listened to him in confusion. Sawatari said that no one would be upset by Subaru's death. Pointing a finger at him, Sawatari added that no one needed Subaru. The boy looked at the ground and closed his eyes. He was filled with hatred. With rainbow eyes, he ordered him to stop talking. They stood opposite each other. Sawatari ran at him. Subaru attacked back. His eyes were white, and his body was filled with hatred. Subaru broke Sawatari's sword with his fist. The bronze guy's arm dropped. Subaru's hand touched his face. Sawatari was falling. Ariaki radiated hatred. He struck the scarred man again 
saw Atari flew away. He rocketed through the sky. The friend looked up. Savatari landed next to him. The friend was shaking with fear. Subaru's eyes glowed with rage. Saatari was lying dead. The friend sat down next to him, shocked that Subaru could do it with one punch. The guy was walking away. The blue-haired man, seeing Subaru approaching, was frightened. He watched in silence as the Subaru, radiating rainbow flames, walked away with his head bowed. The blue-haired man used the ash threads to save his friend. Subaru looked at them. The friend picked up Saatari. With his other hand, he held on to the threads. They were running away from Subaru. The player looked at them. He was surprised that the bronze had escaped. He did not understand what monster could give him so much power. He fell to his knees. Raising his hand, he shouted a phrase in victory. Subaru bowed down, realizing the fact of victory. He turned around. On the ground was the star that had fallen from Saatari. The wall next to it was pierced. Kuzaki was lying cut in half. Subaru did not understand what he was supposed to do about it. Night turned to morning. Three policemen came to the alley. One of them was taking photos. Seeing the body cut in half, one of them came to the conclusion that it was not a human being who did it. But they could not believe that it was a monster from the other world. Suddenly, a voice came from behind them, asking them not to worry. It was Renji Hirasaka who had come to the scene. He said that there were no traces of the otherworldly creature nearby. The police were surprised to see the golden player. They asked Renji to come closer. The policeman handed him the player's account card of Kuzaki shot Aro. Renji was thinking that the criminal was someone who was clearly above silver status. Next to him was Ludwig, the knight in golden armor. Renji returned the card to the police. He believed that the players were not supposed to fight each other. Their mission was to destroy as many gates as possible. Renji threw back his head and added that it was their mission until the celestial clock stopped at zero. They showed a timer that would expire in almost 22 hours. Renji stood next to the policeman, who was holding onto his cap. Time was gradually running out. Ariaki Taiga was furious. In the morning, when he went to Subaru's room, he noticed his brother was missing. He checked his phone and saw that he hadn't read Subaru's text messages either. Suddenly, his expression changed. He saw the news that a bronze player had been killed by another player. This surprised Taiga. He continued to scroll through the news. He saw a picture of Kuzaki. Taiga remembered that he was the guy from the group that had bullied Subaru. He could not believe it. He refused to believe that Subaru had done this. Taiga's eyes lit up with a golden light. He clenched his hand into a fist and smashed Subaru's collar with one punch. Taiga stood there in shock. He was filled with rage. He refused to believe that Subaru could become a gambler. The headquarters of the Players Association was in Shinegawa. It was the official organization that managed Japan's awakened players and goalies. Subaru went there and liked what he saw. He looked at the players around him. At the registration window for new members of the organization was a nice girl, who congratulated Subaru on his awakening and offered to register. He hesitantly agreed. In Japan, it was illegal to allow players, who were not members of the organization, to enter the gate. This was because leveling up could only take place within the gates. In this regard, to become stronger, you had to become a member of the organization. The situation with Kuzaki was a murder. The investigation of this case was the task of the players themselves. Subaru realized that if Taiga took over the case, he would definitely kill him. This made him afraid. He wanted to conquer as many gates as possible to be as prepared as possible. The girl in the window wanted to explain everything to him. There were three main points. When capturing a gate, the level increased. The more stars on the outside, the higher the difficulty level of the gate. Once captured, the remaining stars could be converted into money. Subaru was interested in converting stars. He put a star on the table and wanted to get money for it. It was the star that had fallen from Saatari yesterday. Subaru had no money at all. The girl from the window approached the star in shock. She wondered where he had gotten it from. 
Subaru got excited. He said that right after he became a player, he saw the gate and went to fight. The girl said that an unregistered player faced a penalty of five years of forced labor or a fine of one million yen for entering the gate. This frightened Subaru, as he was not aware of these penalties. The entrance to the organization was open. He started talking about the murder and asked where to go for witnesses and evidence. He pompously took off his glasses and said he was going to confirm something. The girl from the window was talking about the punishment for capturing the gate, but she added something nice. She made an exception for Subaru. The guy was incredibly grateful. Subaru continued to look at something on his phone. There was an exchange rate. One star was one million. Two stars, three. Three for ten. Four stars, thirty. And five stars, one hundred million yen. Subaru was shocked at how much the players could earn. So far, he could only dream about it. The guy stood and thought about finding the gate. But he noticed something ahead of him. It was a barber shop and a clothing store. He looked at the windows of these stalls. Subaru was wearing a torn suit and long, overgrown hair. He was getting a haircut. The employees of those stalls were calling Subaru to come in. He had a million yen in his account. His wallet was down by 125,000. The workers thanked him for his purchase. Subaru had a new haircut and was wearing fresh clothes. Subaru was enjoying the day. The sun was shining through the large windows of the cafeteria. Subaru remembered all the horrible and humiliating moments of his life. He sat there and realized that he felt free for the first time. Subaru wanted to finish his coffee and go in search of the gate and then come back for another drink. Now Subaru was a player. A an angry Taiga stood outside the window at his side. Subaru turned pale. Taiga put on a sneaky smile. He called Subaru a worm. The boy turned to the side. He was frightened to see Taiga. Subaru was shocked that he had found him. He did not understand why Taiga had come. Subaru wanted to run away. Taiga's hand flew through the window. He broke the window to grab Subaru. Screams and. The sound of breaking glass could be heard in the cafeteria. Taiga grabbed Subaru by the collar. He pulled the boy. Taiga pulled him through the window. They were on the street. Taiga started the Subaru. He fought off cars. The girl with the stroller next to him was shocked to see the Subaru flying at her. He turned back with a bloody face. There was a frightened woman and her child crying bitterly. Subaru regained consciousness. He stretched out his arms and used a skill. Taiga was puzzled. Blood gushed. From Subaru's hands. He grabbed the bloody ropes from the minivan. He wrapped them around another car. Point four cars were wrapped with his ropes. The Subaru was close enough to the woman who had fallen to her knees. The guy stopped. Subaru's eyes glowed with a rainbow. He had no choice. There was a traffic jam on the road. The drivers did not understand the reason for the delay. The girl looked out the window and saw pedestrians running away. She was shocked and was advised to leave the car and run. There. Eyes were filled with rage. Taiga looked at Subaru. He wondered how Taiga had found him. He smiled and told him to figure it out for himself. Taiga attacked Subaru. He managed to dodge it. The boy jumped away from Taiga. He used the golden glove skill. Subaru said it was sudden. Subaru turned to Vankish. He wondered if he had a chance of success. Vankish said that blood manipulation was a skill that could turn mana into one's blood and manipulate it as one pleased. But if the player gets carried away by the moment, then health and mana will quickly decrease. Subaru wanted to stay alive anyway. That was the only thing he had to think about. His mana and health were not at their maximum. The rest of his stats were within 30 points. Taiga's stats were several times higher and better. Taiga used his golden punch. Subaru stood there and watched his opponent approach. There was an explosion. Taiga had a smile on his face. But in a moment, it was gone. Subaru flew his bloody ropes behind Taihu, catching them on the roof of the building. Taiga turned around and was shocked to see the ropes. Subaru was helped by the fact that he had seen the bronze guy's use of threads. He was flying, running away from Taiga. He was right behind Subaru. The golden strike was approaching the guy. Subaru threw the threads in the other direction. He managed to dodge Taiga's golden glove. 
His punch was very destructive. Subaru was shocked by the power of Taiga. He would have died from one such blow for sure. Taiga stood there and did not understand if the threads from his hands were the only thing that made up his skill. He thought it was stupid. The Subaru stood on the split asphalt as Tiger ran to attack him again. He was quite calm. Red smoke began to form next to him. The thick bloody haze stopped Taiga. He didn't believe it because he still had another skill. Suddenly, Subaru ran out of the smoke. He remembered Vankish's words. Memories of betrayal, humiliation, and envy flashed through his mind. Vankish had told him to use his hatred. Subaru punched the dazed Taiga. They looked into each other's eyes. Suddenly, Subaru's fingers bent. Dot. He started screaming in pain. Dot. He managed to put Sawtari down with one punch. But it didn't work on Taiga. Dot. Subaru's vitals went down. Taiga continued to attack Subaru while humiliating him. Dot. He cut Subaru. His health indicators became even lower. Blood was pouring out of Subaru's body like a fountain. His health was almost at zero. Dot. Subaru was shocked. Taiga was smiling with all his teeth. Dot. He reached out to touch Subaru's black hair. The smile disappeared from Taiga's face again. Subaru disappeared from his eyes. Dot. He was furious that Subaru was resisting him. The boy was running. Dot. He waved his hand. Taiga stood there in shock. Subaru formed a mist of blood. Dot. He put his hand in front of him. Several bloody stakes entered Subaru's body. Dot. Taiga's face was devastated. These were the sharpest blades he could make. His body was completely intact. Subaru was terrified. Dot, he didn't have a single scratch on him. Taiga was fast, strong, and penetrable. Dot, he was on a completely different level. Taigu walked, crushing Subaru's blades. Dot, and no oh, matter how much he crawled out of his skin to become a player, his eyes were filled with fear. Taigu was reaching for Subaru with his hand. Dot, he couldn't defeat Taiga yet. Dot, Taiga's eyes were surprised. Dot, he took the boy by the head. Taigu realized that things were only going to get more difficult. Dot, he knew he had to kill Subaru now. The golden fist was approaching his face. The golden light reflected in Subaru's eyes. Dot, he hit him. The Subaru coughed. Dot, Subaru's health bar still read five points. Dot, Taiga's fist hit him in the soft and viscous blood clot. But it wasn't that. Taigu removed his hand. Taigu was screaming. Dot, he tried to shake off the stuck-on consistency. Subaru imagined an image of unsticky chewing gum. Taigu could not believe his eyes. Subaru's mana was diminishing. Viscous bloody balls rose into the sky. Subaru shot them at Taiga. The effect of the blood manipulation lasted for 10 seconds. Even though Subaru would use up all his mana, he could immobilize Taiga. A bloody consistency enveloped the golden player's body. It stuck to his body, and he couldn't get it off. Taiga realized that this skill was much more serious than he thought. He screamed Subaru's name. Taiga's body was completely covered with blood clots. He was screaming and trying to get out. Taiga was furious. Subaru was standing close to him. They were looking into each other's eyes. Taiga told Subaru not to expect to win. Subaru said that his goal was not to win, but to survive. Taiga did not say anything. Subaru thought he had achieved his goal. He formed even more blood clots. His mana was almost at zero. Taiga tried to break free. The viscous blood blocked Taiga's eyes and breathing. Subaru started counting to ten. He let go of the thread and started to run away while Taiga was blinded. Subaru had already counted to nine dot, and at the tenth second, the effect disappeared. Subaru flew away. Taiga began to free himself. Dot. He realized that it was the same blood. Dot. He wanted to catch up with Subaru. But there was a thick bloody fog in front of Taiga. Dot, he was angry when he saw the smoke screen. Dot, Subaru's goal was to survive. And he fulfilled it. Taiga could not accept the fact that he had been played for a fool. Dot, he thought that Subaru could not run away from him forever. Suddenly, he froze. Dot, he had been called. Dot, he got to his feet and looked alarmed. Sweat began to pour down his face. Three boys asked him why he was in such a fuss. Point one of them was Renji Hirasaka. Udu and Shikishima were also there. Taiga said that there was no time to explain. Suddenly, he found himself in golden chains. Dot, he did not understand what had happened. Someone came out of the bloody fog and said that someone had overreacted. Taiga could not believe his eyes. The chain was stretching toward the fog. 
All seven members of the golden rank had come to him. Renji pointed his sword at Taiga. Renji was ready to hear. His story after Taiga was in chains. The sun was already setting over the horizon. Subaru was on one of the rooftops. He hoped there was no tail on him. His health was at five, and his mana was at two. Subaru rested, realizing that he had managed to get away, but he realized that he would not be so lucky next time. He looked down at his clothes. His new clothes were torn. The rest of his clothes were still in the cafe. Subaru was happy to buy new things. He sat down on the roof. The boy covered his wound with his hand. Subaru realized that he had to fight to be free. He remembered his first cup of coffee. He had to become stronger. Subaru did not want to go back to the shed where he lived. He wanted to become stronger. The night passed. I in the morning there was a commotion at the gate. A girl was arguing with a crowd of boys. She said she had confirmed the reservation on the website. The guys didn't care about the reservation. Point one of them asked to give up the gate and called the girl weak. She hit her hand with her fist. The girl said with a smile that they didn't realize who they were dealing with. Dot, IT was the bronze medalist Amamiya Sayaka. The guy stood over the tousled girl. Dot, he asked Sayaka what her level was. She answered that she was level 8. Dot, the guys laughed at her. Dot, IT was a Gracchus team with an average level of 13. Dot, the guy with the glasses was laughing at her. Sayaka got to her feet. She realized that the guy's skill was too much for her. The boys asked her to just let them enter the gate. They had just under four hours left. Dot he added that in this world, the strong devour the weak. The girl stood surrounded by six guys. She understood the saying perfectly. That was the reason why she couldn't afford to lose. The guy called her a pain in the ass and told her to get out. Sayaka stood in the rack. She was angry tears were in her eyes. Suddenly, someone's voice stopped their fight. The guy with pink eyes turned to him. Sayaka and the white-haired guy also looked at him. The whole team turned their attention to Subaru. He raised his hand and happily wanted to take part in their fight. And oh, one around them realized who was in front of them. Point one of the team members approached Subaru. He took him roughly by the shoulder. A viscous layer appeared under the team member's feet. He bounced as if on a trampoline. The guy fell face first to the ground. Subaru turned to everyone standing at the gate and apologized. He said that he needed to get stronger as soon as possible. The team members asked what level Subaru was. He embarrassingly replied that he was the first. They did not believe him. The Gracchus team decided to crush him with his status. They surrounded the Subaru. The guy was standing in the rack. He looked closely. The bald man attacked first. Subaru easily repelled this attack. The man fell head first. The rest of the team stopped. Subaru didn't understand why he always had to fight the players. He punched another player in the nose, another in the jaw. This team was obviously weaker than Saatari or Taiga. Subaru was kicking everyone's ass. They didn't realize who Subaru was. He stood waiting for the next player. The team members couldn't believe that Subaru was the one who had the first level. The guy fell down and right behind him was another teammate with glasses. Subaru saw him. The guy used a skill, and a firearm appeared in his hands. The skill was called Six Volleys of Tremolo. He shot Subaru. He looked at Subaru with a smile. There were bloody viscous clots on Subaru's body. He managed to use his skill and defended himself. The guy was shocked by the shields. The Subaru hit him and broke his glasses in half. Sayaka was sitting next to him and was shocked. She was surprised that Subaru had taken out the whole team in one go. He had stained his new shirt again, so he began to take it off. Sayaki realized that if Subaru was truly level one, it meant that his initial performance was very high. She assumed that he had a gold rank. Subaru was pulling the other guy's shirt off with his bare torso. Sayaki bowed her head in confusion. Subaru threw his shirt over the naked teammate. He liked the new shirt. Sayaki was shocked that Subaru had just stolen. The sweatshirt. It was just under two hours before the gates opened. Subaru stood near the gate and smiled and bowed his head awkwardly. Sayaka did the same. Subaru touched the gate with his hand. The timer on the clock started counting down from ten again. It was a dangerous area with creatures, but he admired the beautiful view. He was scratching the back of his head. Sayaki was glad that Subaru didn't have time to close the door. 
she twisted the lock. Sayaka was glad that those guys wouldn't come in. Even when they woke up, Sayaka wasn't interested because she had booked the gate first and those guys were just wrestling it away from her. The found goals were registered on a special website where players could reserve the right to win them. Subaru realized that he didn't have to fight for the gate. He rushed to apologize to Sayaka, saying it was his first time entering the gate. Subaru added that he had a reason why he was in such a hurry and offered Sayaka help. The girl realized that the guy was indeed a first tier if it was his first time here. She agreed since he had helped her with that team. Subaru was happy. Sayaka added that she shared his desire to become stronger. Subaru thanked her sincerely. Sayaka added a condition that she would keep one-seventh of the money. Subaru agreed. She held out her hand to him. The girl said her name with a smile. He extended his hand to introduce himself in return. Subaru instantly realized something. He could be the one charged with Kazaki's murder. He wondered what name to give him. Subaru introduced himself as Vankish. They shook hands. Sayaki thought he was a foreigner. She clenched her hand into a fist. With the right attitude, she lifted it up and said it was time to go. Subaru stood there with a puzzled expression on his face. He saw the stone behind Sayaka. Subaru rushed to Amamiya's aid. Suddenly, her fist touched the stone. She smashed it. Sayaki said they had talked too long. The creatures were already approaching the players. A herd of goblins. And Cobalt was coming toward them. Sayaka asked them to leave them to her. She put her feet on the starting line. The girl ran to attack the goblin with an arrow. Why could only players fight otherworldly creatures? Because the players had supernatural physical abilities, reflexes, and of course, skill. She tensed her fist. Sayaki invited the goblin to watch the dream. She smiled at it and punched it in the jaw. The goblin looked at her. Dot, IT fell to its knees. Subaru was surprised by what he saw. Sayaki ran to attack further. She was kobolds and goblins with incredible speed. She hit them all in the jaws. Sayaki stopped. Behind her was a crowd of falling creatures. Subaru was surprised that Sayaki was so strong and had knocked them all down with one punch. The girl asked him with a smile about his impressions. Her skill was that the enemy who received the blow lost consciousness without exception. The skill was called instant vacuum. She was good at close combat, unlike ranged combat. Suddenly, a bunch of coblins and kobolds stood in front of Sayaka. Subaru was shocked that they were able to get up. This skill left you unconscious for three seconds. Therefore, during these seconds, it was necessary to either kill the enemy or escape from it. Sayaka stood surrounded by the creatures and called the so-called Vankish for help. Subaru stood there because Sayaka asked him to leave the creatures to her. Tears appeared in her eyes. Subaru thought that her skill had the same duration as the blood manipulation. He looked at the creatures and realized that since Amamiya was in the crowd, he was not allowed to release the blades. Subaru used blood manipulation. The goblin swung his club at Sayaka, but suddenly a bloody thread wrapped around his back. All the creatures were wrapped around his neck with his thread. Subaru, like a puppeteer, held the creatures on the thread. He was pulling them away from Sayaka. The boy began to walk in the opposite direction. Sayaka watched with shocked eyes. The goblins and kobolds lay with their tongues sticking out. Subaru rejoiced. His level had risen three times. Now he was level four. He looked at his hands. Pulling up his shirt, Subaru saw that the wounds Taiga had inflicted on him were gone. The girl looked at the creatures and was surprised that he had knocked them down with a single punch. Subaru told Amamiya that her skill was very cool. She did not take his words personally. Subaru clarified the effect of her skill. Sayaka said that the difference should be within three levels and the effect should only last for three seconds. Subaru said that if she used the skill every three seconds in a one-on-one -on -one situation, she would win. She thought about IT. IT dawned on her that Subaru was right. The guy jabbed her in the side with his finger. He pointed to the split landscape. There were goblins and kobolds coming out of it. Sayaka caught her breath. She ran toward the enemies with a smile. Subaru waved after her. The goblins stood in the gap. Amamiya swung her fist. She used the instant vacuum and hit the goblin. 
The first thing it did was lose consciousness from the impact. She counted three seconds. The goblin woke up again. Sayaka hit it a second time. She got the point. And then she began to beat the goblin. She struck it many times. And the last one was fatal for the creature. She defeated the goblin of the sixth level. A sparkle appeared in her eyes. She began to rejoice at what she had done. Sayaka stood in the gap in front of the kobolds and wanted more. Subaru watched her progress. Amamiya was fighting a kobold. A notification appeared in front of her eyes. It said that the boss had arrived. She turned around to tell Subaru. Subaru was standing in front of a huge kobold with an archer goblin on its back. He told Amamiya not to be distracted. The opponent was a 17th level goblin leader and a large kobold of the 12th level. Subaru wanted to fight them. Subaru and the creatures looked at each other. The kobold was close to the player. Suddenly Sayaka saw an explosion. She looked up. Subaru was fighting the boss. The kobold was stretching its paws toward the boy. Subaru was ready to fight back. The boss received a lot of blows from the boy. The goblin aimed his arrows at Subaru. The creature activated its skill. This surprised Subaru, who was in the crosshairs of the goblin's arrow. It glowed green. This skill was called a group of glowing arrows of the second level. The green arrows flew at Subaru. He began to hide behind a viscous blood shield. It formed a large layer around him. The arrows hit him, but did not touch Subaru. They remained a centimeter away from him. He realized that if he didn't reach the second level of blood manipulation, he might die. Subaru realized that the silver-ranked archer with strong skills was his boss. He landed on his feet. Sayaka was calling out to her friend. She wanted to help, but because of the difference in levels, her skill wouldn't work. Amamiya was at level 8. While the boss was at level 17 and 12. A kobold suddenly appeared behind her. She knocked it out without turning around. Subaru's eyes shone with a rainbow. He had accumulated blood clots on his hands. Subaru touched the ground, forming a bloody circle around him. Cobalt ran to the player. Subaru stood waiting. He raised his head. He ran away, covering himself with a bloody shield. The boy waved his hand, but the cobalt managed to jump away from the blow. Subaru was surprised. This creature was very evasive and maneuverable in close proximity, and the goblin had a long-range archery skill. Subaru wondered what it could do besides bind with bloody ropes. Subaru received a notification that the skill had been used. He immediately began to form a protective shield. The goblin was drawing an arrow. This arrow was called a third level perforation. It pierced the shield that Subaru was forming. The boy turned back in surprise. The goblin's arrow had pierced his shoulder. The goblin could be seen through the hole. Blood gushed out of the wound. Subaru realized that the shield was ineffective against the goblin's arrows, which had high penetrating power. He realized that the rain of arrows was just a trap, but it was his last trump card. Subaru knelt before his boss, holding his shoulder. He did not know what to do. His face was contorted in pain. The goblin aimed his arrows again. Suddenly, Sayaka was hit by a cobalt. Subaru's eyes lit up when he saw Amamiya. She used her instant vacuum. Subaru was surprised, because he thought her skill only worked within three levels. The kobold lost consciousness. He fell to the ground. Subaru did not understand how it happened. He turned around. His eyes were shocked. He looked down the aisle and saw that Sayaka had completely destroyed all the opponents. Amamiya Sayaka had reached the ninth level. Now she could knock out a level 12 kobold. She hit it again, giving it an extra three seconds before it lost consciousness. The goblin jumped. Up dot he went up with his bow. Sayaka was worried and said that they were screwed. Subaru turned to the girl and thanked her. His hand began to cover with a bloody rope dot he tied up the cobalt. Subaru pulled it and started running dot he was approaching the goblin with the cobalt tied to him dot he threw his arm back dot he swung it forward. The flexible rope suddenly stretched. Sayaka stood next to the cobalt as its neck twisted the other way. Subaru had killed a level 12 large kobold. His level rose to 6. His health and mana were fully restored. The hole in his shoulder was completely healed. Subaru looked down. 
he thought of a skill similar to the one Taiga had. Subaru used blood manipulation and formed a blood fist. The goblin launched his perforated arrow. It sliced through the air. The hand took the impact of the arrow. Subaru approached the goblin. Blue blood poured out of the creature. Subaru looked at it with cold-blooded eyes. He destroyed the boss with his bloody fist. The goblin began to disappear. Subaru raised his level to 9. The skill increased to level 3. The duration of the power increased from 15 to 20 seconds. Sayaka stood and looked at the boy. She realized that he had won. Subaru stood there. After a moment, he turned to Amamiya with a smile. They had managed to clear the two-star scribble gorge. They finished in 16 minutes, with three hours to spare. Ariaki Subaru's performance increased several times. The quest is over. There were 30 seconds left before the other world was destroyed. The system asked the players to go outside. The guys from the Gracchus team were waiting outside. The guy without a shirt started sneezing. He was shivering from the cold. He was waiting for Subaru to kill him. The other player noticed that the underworld was in a cleanup status. They were shocked that it took him 15 minutes to get through a two-star gate that usually takes two hours. The naked guy was silent. Amamiya Sayaka and Ariaki Subaru came out of the gate. The guy couldn't believe that the girl had made it through the gate. She confidently answered that she had. The guy couldn't believe them. A system notification appeared in front of the players, which distracted everyone from the commotion. It was said that the completion of the two-star dual gorge had been confirmed. The remaining three hours were transferred to the celestial clock. The number of hours in the sky increased. The players looked up. From 19 hours there were 22. Subaru looked up. He thought about the sky clock. A supergiant gate that could be seen from anywhere in the world. When it reached zero, the world would probably be destroyed. The only way to stop the clock is to deal with the gate, after which the remaining time will be added to the sky clock. This was the reason why the players continued to fight. The guy from the team realized that those two really did well. The recommended level for two stars is above the tenth and the two who had the first and eighth were able to handle the goal. Subaru suddenly went up to the guy whose shirt he had stolen and apologized. The guy was confused. Subaru apologized for the theft, adding that he would pay him back. But the boy interrupted him and said he was giving it to him. Another team member reminded the boy that he wanted to kill him, but he started to deny it and said with a frightened expression, that he hadn't said that. The boy said that everything was fine now, and nervously asked the guys to leave. The team stood in a line and bowed to Anamiya and Subaru. The guard team left. Sayaka said they were probably scared of Subaru's strength. A guy was standing near the gate and heard a strange sound from behind. Anamiya and Subaru turned around and saw that the gate was starting to split. Two stars fell to the floor. The girl picked them up. She called Subaru with a smile to go and exchange them. Her smile disappeared. Subaru began to talk about it. They came to the city. Sayaka asked if he was sure he wanted all the money transferred to her account. Subaru stared at the coffee cup mesmerized. Anamiya was trying to get Subaru's attention by shouting. His mind was only on coffee. He had tears in his eyes from pleasure. He was glad to have a second trip to the cafe. Subaru regained consciousness. Anamiya tried to find out what they would do with the money. Subaru said they would divide it up later. Sayaka turned to the boy. She suggested that Vankish was not his name after all. He spilled his coffee out of his mouth in surprise. The girl continued that he had done this so that some people would not know about his attack on the gate. In addition, he had a power not typical of the first level. She wondered who he was. Subaru didn't know what to say. Sayaka stood up abruptly and added that she didn't blame him for anything. 
she thought he was a good guy. Besides, he had saved her life. She wanted them to deal with the gate together. Anamia put her hand to her chest and asked to become comrades. She added with a flirtatious tone that she would help in any way she could. Subaru looked at her with fascinated eyes. He remembered the moments of humiliation, hatred, and indifference towards him. Subaru could not realize that someone had offered to be his friend. He leaned into his coffee with a smile. He thanked Anamiya. She was surprised to hear that. Subaru added that she had also saved him. He would be happy to continue fighting together. The boy told her his real name and was ready to tell her everything that had happened to him over the past two days. It was already sunset. Subaru told her about the rainbow door, Vankish, and the false murder charge. Sayaki scratched her head and said that his circumstances were more complicated than she thought. Subaru said he was still confused. Anamiya realized that he was Ariaki Taiga's older brother. She was shocked that he had taken the golden door from him. She said that she would never forgive him. He laughed awkwardly and added that they were not blood brothers. Sayaki asked him if he wanted to become stronger just to kill Taiga. He scratched the back of his head and said that his life was at stake. Sayaki looked at the boys silently. She said she had three sisters, and they were all gamblers. Ariaki was surprised to hear that. The older sister and the younger ones had silver doors, only she had bronze ones. They started out as a team, but eventually they decided that Sayaka was a burden to them and chased her away. So now her goal was to become stronger and look down on her sisters. Their goals were similar, and Subaru agreed. She laid down on the table and told him right to his face that they would become stronger together. Sayaka sat back and offered a friendly handshake with a smile. They agreed never to betray or abandon each other. Subaru looked at Anamiya in shock. They stood next to each other with smiles and shook hands. The boy kept calling her Anamiya, so she told him to call her Sayaka, which was easier. He nervously agreed. The main office of the Players Association had a large conference room on the top floor. All the gold players were sitting on a long table. They were discussing Taiga and came to the conclusion that Taiga's freedom would be limited. Renji Hirasaka said they were the only ones of the gold rank who could act. Shikishima said that six was enough in principle. He never liked Taiga. Udu said he was just as rude. He added that only gold rank people could handle the four star gate. They didn't have enough people to handle gates of high difficulty. Renji Hirasaka took a look and decided that they would increase the number of shifts until Taiga's restrictions were lifted. And the silver players will also participate in the attack of the five star gate. Shikishima was shocked to hear about the silver players. Udu said that this would only be possible if there were 10 people with a level above 30th. Renji Hirasaka showed a map with markings. He said that there were exactly seven five-star gates in Tokyo and other cities that had to be closed immediately. There was an attack on such a gate in Meguro. This case was on the shoulders of the Juliet team. Their average level was 31. The leader was Hisaki Juliet of the 38th level. Sayaka and Subaru walked through the door where Team Juliet was. They were surprised at what they saw. Subaru was walking close to them. He accidentally hit someone and immediately apologized. It was Hisaki. He turned around and asked them to be more careful. Subaru said they looked powerful. Sayaka explained that they were a high-ranking silver-ranked team called Juliet. They wondered where they were going with the full team, but they quickly dismissed that thought. They had already converted the money and were about to go book the next gate. Sayaka had already found a two-star gate on her phone. Subaru asked where it was. She showed him the location on her phone 
and named the Meguro District. The sun shone orange on the city. The gate stood right among the buildings. It was visible from the main roads. There was a timer on the gate. The two-star gate showed a timer for 17 hours and 43 minutes. Inside it were long and winding steps. This scene was called the battle in a junkyard. Subaru was screaming his girlfriend's name. There was blood on the floor. He was holding a bloody Sayaka in his arms. Blood was flowing from her lips. The bleeding did not stop. He was looking at her. Suddenly, he turned his head with rainbow eyes, calling someone next to him a bastard. Subaru walked exhausted, his severed arm bleeding. The rope shortened and gave him his arm back. Subaru told the enemy that he could not escape from him. He shouted furiously that he would kill him at any cost. Two hours ago, they were in the Meguro area near the gate with two stars. Subaru asked Sayaka if it was possible to find out in advance what awaited you beyond the gate. They walked down the steps and the girl explained to him that if you don't lock the door from the inside, you can go in and out safely. The scouts collected information and brought it to the others. Sayaka looked at the path and said that it was good enough for her skill. Subaru agreed. The girl asked the boy to close the door to start the quest. He did so. The system confirmed the start of the quest. Sayaka happily walked down the steps. Skeletons were climbing up the stairs. This surprised Subaru. He decided to check something out. Subaru felt a strange danger in the air. Looking down the steps, he probably saw his boss. Skeletons in different clothes were climbing up. Sayaka looked frightened. There were an infinite number of skeletons. There were too many of them. They had already reached the players. A skeleton swung a sword at Sayaka. Subaru began to scream. The blade was almost close to her face. Subaru held out his hand. He released a bloody shield. This prevented the girl from being hurt and gave them a chance to defeat the skeleton. She fractured its skull. It was very close. Sayaka was scared. Subaru shouted that the next creatures were coming. They were running down the steps. Subaru used his blood clots to protect Sayaka. It helped her attack the skeletons. She smashed the skulls of all the next creatures. Over and over again, she crushed their bones. Subaru came downstairs worried. Sayaka apologized and thanked him. Sayaka said that the creatures were already at level 10 and above. She had defeated soldiers with a 10th and 11th level fake bone stake. Subaru asked if it was really impossible to get out when you closed the door. They had no choice but to deal with those creatures to move on. The skeletons ran toward them. Subaru shouted that he would stand in defense. Each of them could individually reduce the number of opponents. Sayaka, smashing the skull of another skeleton, agreed. Sayaka was very good at fighting them in this kind of terrain but there were an incredible number of creatures. And the feeling that came to Subaru from down below confused him greatly. It was obviously stronger than the goblin he had encountered last time. The skulls of the skeletons were smashed one by one. Sayaka was good with creatures. She broke their bones. Subaru called out to Sayaka. She didn't get distracted and kept fighting. Subaru shouted that it was better to move up a step because of the huge number of opponents. He asked her to use as little energy as possible. Sayaka did not respond. She suddenly turned around and asked Subaru again. She said it was better the other way around. Subaru didn't understand. Sayaka said that in the gate space, her health and mana were fully restored as she leveled up. Her level had already risen to 10th. She said that it was better to go ahead and fight until her level increased. Sayaka winked at Subaru. He hesitantly agreed. She advised him to fight with all his strength. 
a stream of blood flowed next to the cheerful Sayaka. She turned back to Subaru. The boy was using blood manipulation and derivation to destroy his opponent. The steps were covered with a red stream. Subaru used a shaft of blood. Sayaka called out to Subaru. She was shocked by what she saw. His mana bar had dropped dramatically. But he didn't need to worry about his remaining mana. He was releasing a lot of blood from his hands. The crypts were drowning in a sea of red liquid. He used everything he had to defeat them all at once. He commanded the blood to freeze. The skeletons were covered in bloody resin. Sayaka looked at the skeletons and told the boy that his skill was as anarchic as ever. Subaru bowed in powerlessness. He said it wouldn't last that long. Sayaka did her part. She jumped up and kicked the skeleton sticking out of the bloody resin. She ran up the steps, killing the creatures. She raised her level. The skeletons gradually disappeared. She raised her level more and more. There were enough skeletons to raise her level. She had reached the end. Sayaka raised her level from 10th to 15th. She thanked Subaru, but told him not to miss his chance either. They were able to get down low enough. Subaru accelerated with his fist. He was going to smash the creatures to pieces. The guy waved his rainbow hand to the side. He destroyed many creatures, thereby increasing his level. The steps became empty. Ariaki Subaru reached the 16th level. He was happy with the result. Sayaka praised her friend. Meanwhile, creatures were sneaking up behind her. A skeleton noticed her and started attacking her from behind. Sayaka turned around, and a bloody arrow flew behind her. It pierced through the skeleton that wanted to attack Sayaka. The girl smiled as she looked at the flying Subaru. He landed in front of Sayaka, who was apologizing for letting her guard down. Subaru was pleased. He assured himself that with such success, they would quickly reach the end. Subaru attacked the approaching skeletons. Sayaka also kept up and cut down the skeletons. Subaru had a bad feeling. The feeling of a hovering threat was getting stronger. The players were successfully raising their levels. They were going down the ladder. Amamiya Sayaka was already at the 20th level. Ariaki Subaru was at level 19. Subaru turned around. They had already reached the bottom of the gate. An alert warned them of the boss's appearance. It was a skeleton with a crown and a fashionable dress. They looked at the skeleton realizing who was standing in front of it. It was the dungeon boss Dowager Queen Judith of level 29. The players were determined. The queen launched the first attack. Purple blades flew from her hands. She shattered the surrounding dungeon. Stones fell to the ground. Sayaka had a frightened smile on her face. Judith was terribly terrifying. Subaru formed a shield to protect himself from the falling stones. He noticed the rods in the queen's hands. He was surprised at her strength. Judah held a weapon, decorated with a flower, to her face. They had some doubts. A boss, a large area, a long-range attack, a trajectory that changed quickly. Sayaka turned to Subaru. Judith was standing in front of the players. With a sly smile, Sayaka asked if she was too much for her to handle. Subaru was scared. He concentrated. Subaru thought about the feeling he had even on the upper floors. He didn't know if it was definitely because of the queen. Subaru looked at his boss. Suddenly the steps in the dungeon disappeared. Something strange was happening. Judith launched an attack. Sayaka barely dodged it. Subaru covered himself with a bloody shield. The players jumped away from the queen's attacks. Sayaka asked Subaru what they were going to do. He was thinking. He noticed the boss's skill. Subaru thought that it was probably an augmentation of the slashes with magic. He could see the similarities in the stretching of the slash 
and its bloody mass. The boss was a tough one for Sayaka. The level difference made her skill ineffective. Subaru continued to dodge the queen's attacks. He decided to fight with a steady offensive and defensive strategy. Subaru glanced back. He looked at Sayaka, who would not get any points at all in this case. He remembered her words, how she had said they would be stronger together. Their friendly handshake. The agreement not to betray. Subaru was happy with those words. Subaru turned to Sayaka, who was doing her best to avoid her boss. He said that he would completely block her cuts. Sayaka tried to get into the conversation while dodging the queen's attacks. And after blocking, he told Sayaka to hit Judah from all sides. She crouched down, dodging the slashes. Subaru used a scythe. It produced blood of 100% viscosity. The queen was surprised. Subaru raised the clots of blood above him. Judah began to worry. The guy pointed his hand. The boss gripped the weapon tighter. She swung it sharply. The Subaru sputtered with bloody clots. He blocked her blows. Judith was confused. She saw the clots of blood falling from above. The queen looked up. The clots were falling at her feet. Subaru clenched his hand into a fist. Blood surrounded Judah. Sayaka stood behind her, not realizing what was happening. Subaru had ordered her to attack. She prepared herself. Sayaka ran to the queen and told the boy that he was invincible with his skill. Subaru said that he was just lucky with his compatibility. Sayaka swung for the kill. She hit the queen in the skull. Nothing happened from her blow. She was frightened at first, but then she focused. Sayaka struck again. Judah flew away. Subaru remembered what the girl had said. To get points in a fight, you had to reduce the enemy's health by at least 20%. That's why it seemed difficult for players playing defense or healing to become stronger. He was thinking about how people get out of this situation. Suddenly, Subaru came back from his thoughts to reality. He saw that the skill would expire in five seconds. He warned Sayaka about it. She landed on the ground. Judith gradually released herself. Sayaka jumped back. The queen's hands were completely free. Her lashes almost touched Sayaka. She was surrounded. The queen and Sayaka looked into each other's eyes. Sayaka was covered with a bloody shield. She found herself in a bloody sphere, which Judah had unsuccessfully attacked. The ball with Sayaka was behind Subaru. He asked if she was okay. She came out alive and unharmed. The queen was furious. Subaru was ready to repeat the trick. Suddenly, Judith began to speak. This surprised the players. She asked where Subaru got the skill from. Subaru couldn't understand why the otherworldly being was talking. The queen said that it was impossible for him to help people. Subaru asked if she meant Vankish. He tried to bring her out to talk to him. She angrily refused. The queen pulled off her dress, under which were the remains of skeletons. Judah could not believe what she saw. The players were puzzled. They had seen a transformation. Sayaka said she had heard about this skill from her sister. If the boss was almost at zero mana, he could transform. Judith emitted light from her chest. The system alert informed him that the skill was being used. Subaru began to bleed. Judith fired her weapon at the players. They hid behind the shield. Subaru couldn't hold back the attack. The bloody shield was boiling and evaporating. Unless he replenished his blood supply, he would not be able to rebound. His mana bar was decreasing every second. He had to think of something urgently. Besides, Sayaka was right behind him. Subaru's eyes tensed and turned a rainbow color. Judah was puzzled. The boy was getting even closer to the queen. Subaru decided to push forward. 
Judah released the thorns in her skirt. Subaru's face was tense and covered with blood. He approached Queen Judah and was able to pierce her with his spear. The boss began to disappear. He looked intensely ahead of him. Judah was speaking her last words. The boss was defeated and Subaru's level rose to twentieth. He thought that Judith knew something about Vankish, but he had no choice but to kill her. Subaru wondered if the creatures from the door and the gate could be the same. He was distracted by Sayaka's words. He turned around to hear the girl praising him. She was happy about the leveling up. Sayaki said that they had done well on the second gate. Subaru was glad that the girl had also gotten stronger. He was thinking that the next time he met the boss, he would try to strike up a conversation. Sayaka was scared. The notification to remove the lock did not come, despite the defeated boss. Subaru wasn't happy about the idea that they wouldn't be able to get out. Sayaka said with fear that this had never happened to her before. Something strange began to happen. Subaru's and Sayaka's eyes froze. A rainbow door appeared behind Subaru. He turned around and was shocked. It was the summoning door in the dungeon. Sayaka was surprised to see that the door was indeed colored. She was happy to see that it was the second time the door had appeared in front of him. Subaru didn't know it could have happened again. Sayaka came closer and said that each door had its own conditions. Subaru suspected that it might have something to do with getting to level 20. Sayaka said that Hirasaka Renji had already entered the door seven times. Subaru was shocked. Sayaka said that if they continued like this, they would become the strongest duo. Subaru looked at his arm and realized that he had only gotten to this point by manipulating blood. He realized that he could get one more skill, which would probably allow him to fight a gold-ranked person. Sayaka told the guy to come in. He was puzzled. Sayaka was incredibly happy. A smile appeared on Subaru's face. He touched the handle. There was happiness on the faces of the players. He opened the door. A bloody sword came from there. Subaru's arm was cut off. His eyes were devastated. His arm flew away, and Sayaka was cut across the body. He looked at the girl. She was apologizing to Subaru. His eyes were filled with sadness. Blood gushed out of Sayaka's chest. The boy rushed to her side. He ran with his hand bleeding. He cried out. Subaru slipped and fell. He looked at the door. Subaru sat up and saw someone in the doorway. It was a strange creature with blindfolds and a long weapon. Subaru looked at the creature. He bowed his head in surprise that Subaru was not alone. He realized why he had the feeling he had at the beginning of the quest. He did not understand who it was. Subaru ran over to Sayaka. He took her on his lap. The bleeding did not stop. Subaru was furious. The creature began to apologize. Subaru laid Sayaka on the ground. The creature asked if she was his dear friend. Subaru got to his feet. The creature asked why he needed her, saying that Sayaka would have been a burden to him. Subaru had no face. The creature with a blue tongue and a vile smile said, that he had freed Subaru from the need to stand still. Suddenly, a rainbow circle formed around Sayaka and Subaru. Hate overwhelmed Subaru. The creature looked at the player with a smile. The severed arm was returning to its place. Subaru threatened the creature. He wanted to finish it off at any cost. The creature stuck out its tongue in response, smiling. Subaru flew at the creature. It just laughed back at him. The creature said that it was time to meet him. He was one of Vankish's subordinates. The king of the vampires, Kalion. He had created this challenge. Subaru's eyes were filled with rage. He wanted Kalion dead. Suddenly, 
he received a notification that a friend with whom he had come into contact was on the verge of death. There were 48 seconds left before death. The system suggested using the blood user patient skill. Subaru and Cal Island stood in the middle of the desert. The guide looked at his subordinate, who was constantly smiling. Subaru closed his eyes. Vankish appeared in front of him. He asked him to explain the reason for the attack. Subaru was furious. Vankish bowed his head and remained silent. He began to disappear. Subaru did not understand what had happened. Kalan said that none of it made sense. After all, in his mind, Vankish was not a being, but only a manipulation instructor. He was not able to talk about other topics. Subaru glared at Kalion. The king bowed and welcomed him into the challenge space. The condition of the territory was to inflict wounds on Kalion's body. He was looking forward to seeing Subaru's progress. The boy jumped up without hesitation. He attacked Kalion. The king stopped him and asked him to listen to the end. Subaru was puzzled. Kalion said, that if he completed the challenge completely, he would have the opportunity to receive the treasure of Vankish the Chisels of Heaven. Subaru was not interested. Kalyan bowed his head in confusion. The boy was filled with rage. He wanted to kill the king. Using the manipulation of blood, Subaru directed the blades from his back. Kalyan jumped up. He enjoyed the boy's skillful use of force but he added that Subaru was too slow. The boy's attack interrupted the king's speech. The bloody spears attacked him. Kalyan deftly dodged the attacks. He noticed that Subaru was using a skill similar to a boss he had just defeated. Subaru's back was covered in slashes. Kalyan said he saw the battle with Vankish. Subaru had the ability to use his opponent's style. The king cut the bloody slashes. Subaru shouted at him that he was fighting, not running away. He was thinking about Sayaka. The boy had no time for long fights. Kalion smiled and agreed. He jumped off the sand. Subaru launched his bloody slashes. The king swung his axe. He cut the bloody rods almost to the root. Subaru's face was terrified and blood was flowing from his ear. He fell to his knees. The lashes were all around him. Subaru held onto his bloody ear. Kalyan, on the other hand, raised the chopping block up and said that this was the chisel of heaven. Vankish put the essence of his technique into the weapon. The highest degree of bloodshed using a sword that pierces the air. Kalyan called the boy's defense paper. The king's expression suddenly changed. The sand in the desert began to ripple in different places. Kalyan laughed. Suddenly, the king was struck from below. He flew upward. Subaru was pulling the lashes underground from his feet. In front of Kalyan were bloody ropes with spikes. The king rejoiced at the ingenuity of Subaru's attacks. He ran along these ropes and said that the boy could be a great fighter. Kalion was in a pile of twisted spikes. Subaru was furious that the king was able to dodge. While the boy was looking up, Kalion had already landed next to him. Subaru held his bloody ear and was shocked at the speed. Kalion assessed the guy's abilities, but they were not enough. He punched Subaru in the stomach. Blood poured out of his mouth and eyes. Kalyan spun him around like a spinning top. The king was smiling bloodthirstily. He hit Subaru again. The boy was bleeding out. Kalyan touched his face with his hand. Subaru flew away. The king swung his axe. He looked at Subaru and said that the boy had obviously underestimated him. Subaru lay buried in the sand. Kalyan said that this challenge was not a joke. He stood over him and told him to pull himself together. Suddenly he cut off his words. Subaru was on his feet. He looked exhausted. His eyes were filled with blood. 
Kalyan looked at him. He was shocked that Subaru had obviously not listened to him. He was. A bloody gauntlet began to wrap around Subaru's hand. He used blood manipulation, derivation, and a bloody fist. Subaru was completely enveloped in armor. The guy was using his hatred. Cal Island stared at the boy in awe. Subaru's armor was a blood color. He began to run toward the king. The boy swung his hand. It had claws on it. He hit Kalyan with his hand. But the king was already behind the boy. The king was already behind him. Subaru jumped and successfully dodged. Subaru approached Kalyan. He had no intention of letting the king go. He was laughing at the boy's words. The fists of the opponents were approaching each other. There was an explosion. The sand was raised in the desert. Subaru and Kalyan's blows met. The fight continued. Subaru defended himself against the king's blows. He appreciated the quality of the armor that the boy had made. But he said that the chisel of heaven could handle them. Subaru attacked Kalyan. He responded by swinging his axe. It cut Subaru's arm. The arm fell off the boy's body. Kalyan looked at the boy. The blood began to clot the mangled limb. This surprised Kalyan. Subaru attacked again with his restored arm. He finally hit the king in the face. Kalyan was surprised. He struck the boy again with his axe. The king cut off the boy's other arm. He began to bleed it back together. The arm regenerated and was put back in place. Subaru hit Kalyan again. The king became furious. He cut off the leg with a heavenly chisel. Kalyan moved quickly, so Subaru did not have time to react. His leg came back again. He kicked at Kalyan's face. No matter how many cuts Subaru received, he could have simply covered them with blood. But the king realized that as soon as the boy ran out of mana, he would simply collapse and die. Kalyan thought the guy was just desperate. The opponent kept swinging at Subaru with the chisel of heaven. The guy had a cold look in his eyes. He stood there cut by the chisel. Kalyan said the guy had gone mad. The king stood next to Vankish. He listened to what he was saying. Vankish was talking about Subaru, who first gained his power when he felt very painful, biting him back. Kalion was surprised and laughed. Vankish said that the king would surely like Subaru. Kalion smiled. He laughed and stood in front of Subaru. The king said that he liked the boy. He confidently shouted that the attacks of such power were not enough. In an instant, the smile on his face disappeared. Subaru asked what exactly made Kalyan laugh so hard. The king stood there confused. Subaru used blood manipulation and derivation. Branches began to wrap around his arm. He launched a bloody spear. Subaru said that it was not Kalyan who underestimated him. Green liquid began to pour out of Kalyan's mouth. Subaru pierced his stomach with a spear. He wanted Kalyan dead. Subaru cut the king in two. The boy watched as the two parts of Kalyan fell. Subaru's armor began to disappear. The king continued to laugh. He said that Subaru had not just wounded him, but killed him. The guy asked him to die as soon as possible. Kalyan called him cruel. Subaru was thinking about Sayaka. Until he died, the lock would not open. He had to take her to the hospital. Kalyan told Subaru not to worry. Time did not pass inside the door, as it did outside. This surprised Subaru. Kalyan asked the boy how he was going to survive. Subaru looked at the king. He said that when the boy ran out of mana, he would simply disintegrate. He wouldn't be able to hold his body parts that Kalyan had cut up. Subaru agreed. This answer amazed the king. Subaru had no other choice. He had to take Sayaka to the hospital and die. Subaru demanded that Kalyan die as soon as possible, because his mana would soon run out. 
The king asked if he had fallen in love with Sayaka. Subaru's eyes filled with tears. He said he had promised never to leave her. She had become his first friend in life. Kalion was silent. He was remembering a moment in his life. When he was little, he had a friend. He had sworn vampire pride. He gave little Kalion his hand and said that he would never betray him. It was Vankish. Kalion realized his mistake. As an apology, in addition to the chisel of heaven, he decided to give Subaru and his skill as well. Kalion added that it was also a greeting for skipping class. Subaru didn't see the point, because he was going to die anyway. Kalion said that was not true. After all, this door was in the gate. Kalion was smiling. Extra Boss Kalion, the 57th level vampire king, was defeated. Subaru's level had risen. The guy was shocked. Subaru had reached the 26th level. He looked in front of him. He looked at his hands. His health and mana indicators were fully restored. A system notification informed him that he had received the bit of heaven. The vibration channeling skill and the deadly kin were received. The passive skill of understanding deadly kin was added. Blood manipulation was upgraded to level 6. Subaru was frightened that by defeating the otherworldly creatures in the gate there was a chance of leveling up. He wondered if he and Vakish were the inhabitants of the door and the otherworldly beings at the same time. Kalion answered that yes, the origin was the same. He said that Vakish was also from this number, but there was one thing he didn't have time to say. Kalion began to disappear. He pointed his finger to the side. The king advised using the blood usurper on Sayaka. It was a passive skill. Subaru thought about it. Kalion's last words were that Subaru was like Vankish at the end. Kalion disappeared in front of the boy. Only rainbow ashes remained. The quest was complete. Thirty minutes remained before the destruction of the underworld. The system asked the players to go outside. The gate was right in the middle of the highway. Subaru came out of it with Sayaka in his arms. The remaining fifteen and a half hours were transferred to the celestial clock. He didn't care about the clock or the confirmation of the quest. Subaru held Sayaka on his lap and made a phone call. He reached the fire station. The gate behind them had collapsed. There was a new gate next to it. It was a five-star gate. It was called the White Whale's Lair. Juliet's team was in this snowy desert. There was a terrible massacre. The team members were dying one by one. The leader of the team, Hisaki Juliet, was looking at the mountain. A frightened team member approached her. Hisaki was shocked by what she saw. She saw a celestial whale. It was a level 59 monster. It was releasing ice spheres. It attacked the team. Juliet's subordinates were being killed one by one. And the whale wasn't even the boss. Juliet's shoulder was touched by a hand. She was told that unless most of the players in the gate died, they would not leave. She wondered how many people needed to die. The team member was puzzled by this question. Juliet turned around with a demonic expression and asked the guy the same question. He was shocked that Juliet had decided to abandon her comrades. He said that leaders should take care of their subordinates. Suddenly Juliet killed him with a sword. She pierced his head. Juliet started screaming and talking about the value of her life. She looked down. The system notification said that most of the players were dead. The castle was off the gate. She laughed that he was the last one she needed to kill to save herself. Juliet stepped forward with a smile. The team members behind her shouted at her about the alerts. The leader's face was angry. Her subordinates were asking what they should do, because the otherworldly beings could get outside. Juliet pointed her finger at the player and asked why he had returned. 
She said that monsters were coming. They asked her what they should do. She angrily told him to figure it out for himself. Juliet was about to leave. The leader was running away. The team members were shocked. The monster was already approaching the team, which was looking at the betraying leader. One of the players said that they had to prevent damage among their people, even at the cost of their lives. The whale flew past the team. It dropped icy spheres on the snow pyramid. The gate opened and Juliet came out. She was happy to be outside. She opened the system. The alert said that there were no more survivors in the gate. The otherworldly beings were coming out. Juliet was shocked. Not even a minute had passed. Monsters began to come out of the gate. Juliet was attacked and knocked down. She fell to the ground in front of the gate. She was screaming and crying because her team was useless and unable to stop the monsters. The otherworldly creatures were aiming first at those who had invaded the gate. A whale was coming out of the gate. Juliet was lying down and calling for help. Subaru stood next to the doctors who were examining Sayaka. They said that she was breathing. The doctors put an oxygen mask on her. Subaru was worried about the girl's life. Suddenly, he received a notification. The system reported a defeat on the quest. The attack on the white whale's lair had been stopped. There were almost 6,000 hours left. The celestial clock began to tick down. 49 days remained on it. 240 days had been written off. He did not understand who could have stopped the attack. Subaru turned to hear shouts behind him. It was Julia walking down the road, waving. She was obviously scared and running toward Subaru. The guy remembered seeing her. Julia demanded that he give her the ambulance. Subaru did not understand this request. Julia took Subaru by the shoulders. She pointed to the whale in the sky and said, that the whale was following her. Juliet asked him to stop while she was getting away in the car. She demanded the doctor to be faster. He said he had to move the wounded woman. Juliet was indifferent to these needs. The doctors carried the girl to the ambulance. Juliet told them to spit on the girl because she was bronze. Subaru turned pale at what he heard. Juliet pulled one of the doctors away saying that her childhood as a silver was a priority. Subaru touched Juliet's shoulder. He stopped her. She turned around and started yelling at him. Subaru was furious. He looked to the side. The icy spheres were flying in their direction. The whale was approaching them. It was right above Subaru and Juliet. The Players Association reported that an otherworldly creature had broken through a five-star difficulty gate into the Maguro district. People in the streets of Maguro, Setagaya, Shibuya, and Shinagawa districts were evacuated. People from these areas were asked to evacuate and stay safe. Subaru apologized and told the doctors to go. He said he trusted them with Sayaka. She was wearing an oxygen mask. The doctors heard Subaru. The ambulance left. Juliet was shocked and tried to stop the car. She turned on Subaru and said she would finish him off. Suddenly Subaru used his skill against her. He told Juliet to try to kill him. Subaru attacked Juliet. She was scared. Subaru was looking up and calling out to Juliet. She was all beaten up. Juliet was in a bloody cocoon, hanging from a building. Subaru wondered if the whale was chasing only her. She said yes. The whale was already approaching them. Juliet added that the otherworldly creatures were killing the players, who were already in the gate first. Subaru realized what he had heard. Juliet did not understand how the boy had such strength. Subaru realized that as long as Juliet was alive, Harm to other people could be prevented. He was not going to let the whale move towards Sayaka. He was looking up. He wanted to defeat the whale right there. Subaru clenched his hand into a fist 
and asked about the whale's skill. Julia got slapped in the face by him. She said it summoned water and shot something like a laser. The whale was very strong and fast. The whale began to release its water spheres. It came closer and closer. Juliet was afraid that the whale was going to shoot. The whale was flying in the sky with spears of water. Lasers began to attack the area. Juliet began to whimper. Subaru was calm. A bloody shield appeared under the whale and deflected the attack. The monster did not realize what was happening. It looked like a big bloody flower had formed in front of it, protecting the area. Julia was shocked. Subaru stood there using blood manipulation. He made it rain. Drops began to pour all over the neighborhood. Julia was amazed. It was a hydraulic hammer that could pierce even a silver-grade shield. Subaru jumped up to the whale. It was to his advantage that the monster was sailing through the sky. Blood appeared in front of Subaru. He used his bloody fist. Having broken through the shield, Subaru jumped to the whale. The boy swung his arm. He hit the monster with a bloody, hard fist. Subaru's hand was smoking from the blow. Suddenly he noticed something. The whale was still flying. Subaru was falling and did not understand why there was no effect. He landed on the ground. The whale opened its mouth and began to scream. He made a strong wind with his voice. The windows in the building shattered. Juliet swayed in her cocoon. Subaru didn't know if he could even deal a decent blow to the five-star monster. A bloody path formed under Subaru's feet. A sword began to emerge from the ground. It was the bit of heaven. A bunch of eye pupils came out of the whale's mouth. They were looking down. Suddenly they began to turn red. They flew out. They were rockets that started flying out of the whale. Juliet was frightened by what she saw. Subaru stood ready with a chisel. The missiles were aimed at the boy. He assumed it was the whale's secret weapon. Subaru's eyes began to shine with a rainbow. He adjusted his bit of heaven. Subaru swung it. It crossed the trajectory of each missile. They exploded in midair. The whale began to scream. It turned in the other direction. Julia did not understand what was happening. Subaru looked at the notification that appeared before his eyes. There was information about the bit. The player's mana was being spent on the attack. As mana appeared, the number and strength of the chopping blows increased. His mana decreased by a third. Subaru did not yet understand the specifics of the chisel. He stood looking up at the sky. Water rings were forming around the whale. It released a water sphere. It was huge. Subaru realized that he couldn't let such a huge thing get shot. He decided to use another third of his mana to attack. He swung his chisel. He attacked the whale. The chisel cut through the monster. Blood gushed out of its wounds. The whale exploded, and tons of water began to fall down. Subaru was puzzled. The water was splashing, and screams were coming from the area. It started to rain in the neighborhood. A rainbow appeared over the city. The people around him were shocked. They looked up at the sky. People were surprised that someone had defeated the otherworldly being. Subaru was completely wet. The boy had defeated a level 50 celestial whale. Juliet, hanging in a bloody cocoon, looked at Subaru. She couldn't believe her eyes that the boy had killed the monster with one punch. She assumed that the newcomer was a gold rank. Subaru noticed that the level didn't rise when you won from outside the gate. But he was still glad that the damage was reduced. A wet Subaru was determined to hurry to Sayaka. He used his skill and jumped off the ground much higher. Blood pushed him off the asphalt. The old man with a phone on the balcony saw Subaru. He shot an obviously cool video. He posted it on social media and added a caption calling Subaru the savior of the world. 
The sun was setting over the hospital's horizon. Sayaka was undergoing surgery. The monitor showed the girl's stable condition. Sayaka was wearing an oxygen mask. A tear appeared in her eyes. It was running down her cheek. Subaru ran as fast as he could to his friend Sayaka. He came to the morgue. Subaru pulled back the sheet that covered someone's body. He saw Sayaka lying dead on the couch. Subaru froze. There was no face on the body. He fell to his knees. He began to cry. Subaru felt guilty for her death. Because of that rainbow call, she was injured. He was the one who got her into it. Subaru was furious with Kalion. Suddenly his eyes relaxed. He remembered King Kalion's words, who had advised him to use the usurpation of blood if his friend was dying. Subaru looked up. He began to scroll through the system. He was looking for something in the admin panel. The guy was doing it as fast as he could. Subaru found a passive blood usurper skill. He clicked on the one available. His name was Paravara. A player connected to you was resurrected as a vassal, but on the condition of dying within one hour. He didn't understand the meaning of the word vassal, so Subaru hoped it would bring Sayaka back to life. The girl was lying on the couch. Subaru had 15 seconds left before his girlfriend died. He pointed his scalpel hand at the girl. He knew he could make it. Subaru used Parivar's skill. Everything in the room was covered in bloody flames. Many red lines appeared on Sayaka's body, like spider webs. Subaru was tensing up. He had eight seconds left. The red cobwebs on his body reached Sayaka's eyes. Subaru remembered happy moments with his friend, her smile, her joy. He wanted her to come back to life. He had only three seconds left. Subaru's eyes shone with a rainbow. He tried even harder. He had one second left. Suddenly, Subaru's pupils shrank in shock. He was out of time. The timer had run out. He stood over Sayaka. She was in a bloody haze. The smoke was gone. Subaru was shocked that he had failed. Suddenly, two girls who were obviously her sisters ran into the room. Their faces were full of sadness. They stood next to Sayaka. They tried to shout to her. Subaru realized that they were the older and younger sister Sayaka was talking about. The older sister was depressed because she was asking Sayaka to quit gambling. The younger sister was telling Sayaka to wake up. Subaru's heart was breaking with pain. The sister glared angrily at him. She asked Subaru who he was. He stammered out incomprehensible answers. We will never betray or abandon you. That was what it meant to be comrades. These were Sayaka's words. Subaru began to choke on his tears. His older sister was furious. He did not respond to his sister, who ran up and pinned him to the wall. With tears in her eyes, she asked him if he had dragged Sayaka on a dangerous quest. Subaru was silent. He was angry with himself. The younger sister sobbed and said that they wanted to become stronger and return to protect Sayaka. She didn't understand why Subaru appeared next to her. The sisters began to swing their fists. Subaru stood silently. Suddenly his eyes saw something. The younger sister also stood there mesmerized. Sayaka stood up from the couch, emitting a bloody flame. The younger sister was shocked. The others could not believe their eyes either. Sayaka looked down. A mark appeared on her neck. She jumped out of bed and covered herself with a sheet. Suddenly, clothes began to appear around her chest. She was wearing gloves on her hands, heels on her feet. She stood in front of everyone with her hand up. She lowered her index finger. Sayaka sat down. She had red eyes and pointed ears. The sisters were happy that their Sayaka was alive. Subaru stood silently. 
Sayaka told them to take their hands off Subaru. She started to run. Sayaka was approaching her older sister. She pointed her hand at her. Her sister was shocked. Subaru stopped Sayaka's attack with his bloody hand. She looked him straight in the eye. Subaru was shocked by the strength of the new Sayaka. She stood there with a trembling hand. The girl calmed down and Subaru let her go. Sayaka bowed and apologized to Subaru for being rude. The sisters did not understand what was happening. Subaru was embarrassed and frightened to hear her call him master. He was shocked that it wasn't Sayaka. She said that she had been reborn as a vassal with the help of the skill. She had no memories of her past life, but she was ready to serve Subaru's orders. The sisters looked at each other. Subaru looked at his vassal and realized what had happened. Subaru turned around and heard someone's angry voice. It was the younger sister, who was furious about what had happened to her sister. Subaru turned pale. The older sister called him a pervert. Subaru realized that things were going badly. The sisters wanted to kill Subaru. He screamed in shock. Sayaka's vassal asked Subaru if he was a pervert. He started to deny it, scared. Sayaka said she would kill them then. Subaru froze. Sayaka pulled out a gun. She said that now it would take her ten seconds to win. Subaru started to ask her to stop. The younger sister was devastated. The older one was furious. Subaru tried to stop the whole thing. He did not know what to do. Subaru let go of the bloody ropes and apologized at the same time. He stopped the two sisters. They were in a cocoon. Subaru took Sayaka's hand, apologized, and ran away, saying he would explain everything later. The sisters were furious. Subaru ran down the hall with Sayaka. He was cursing Kalion for his advice. Sayaka asked if she should kill those girls. Subaru didn't know what to do. He wanted to ask Sayaka about the vassal first. They ran out of the station and suddenly stopped. Ariaki Subaru's face was on the TV. The news was reporting on an attack by an otherworldly being. They were showing a video that my grandfather had made. Subaru was angry. The news called him. Maguro's savior. Subaru stood with Sayaka in the middle of the hospital hall. In front of him were the golden players. One of them was even shocked that Taiga had an older brother. But Uriusei was a gold player. So was Shikishima Ryo. Subaru was shocked to see these stars. He concentrated in an instant. He realized that their presence did not mean anything good. Shikishima reported to Rinji that Subaru was nearby. He paled when he heard Hirasaka's name. He walked away expressing his joy at meeting Ariaki Subaru. Renji Hirasaka stood between Shikishima and Udu. Renji Hirasaka said that Subaru was responsible for the destruction of commercial establishments in the Shinagawa area. He was also suspected of killing a classmate who was also a player. Renji Hirasaka said they had a lot to talk about. Sayaka was furious in the back. Subaru was worried. The golden players stood opposite Subaru and Sayaka in the hospital hallway. Renji Hirasaka was a role model, the strongest player in Japan. Subaru was a fan of his and could never have imagined meeting him in such circumstances. Renji Hirasaka asked Subaru not to be nervous. With a smile, Hirasaka said that all suspicions against him had been cleared. Subaru opened his mouth in surprise. A limousine was driving down the road. Sayaka and Subaru were sitting in it. Rinji Hirasama thought about the rainbow door. He was amazed by the stories of the two door summonses and that he had brought Amamiya Sayaka back to life. Subaru was visibly nervous about talking in such a setting. He was interested in dropping the charges. Renji Harasaka smiled. Shikishima Ryo threw the tablet on the table. There was a video on it. 
Renji Harasaka asked if the boy knew the number of cameras in the entire city. Subaru was shocked. Renji Hirasaka went on to say that the destruction around the mall was shown in every detail. Subaru was the victim who retaliated against Taiga. Secondly, he was suspected of killing Kazaki, but two guys who were there confirmed that he was cut in half by the rainbow door. Subaru was surprised that those guys said that. Shikisha Mario said it was an acquittal. He clicked on the news app. They were talking about an incident with a five-star monster that was defeated by an unknown player. A large number of videos were shared. Subaru became a real hero for people. He could not believe his eyes. Shikisha Mario said that now the mystery of Ariaki Taiga was solved. Subaru did not understand what they were talking about. Shikisha Mario said that the guy's only skill was a golden glove. The player who knocked the door off the other player would never have a door again, no matter how many levels he raised. Subaru was stunned. This was the reason why Taiga kept Subaru close to him. He expected to see the door again. Subaru remembered Ariaki Taiga's frightening words that he now belonged to him until the very end of his life. Subaru sat in the limousine and realized what he had heard. Renji Hirasaka was smiling. They were on their way to the Players Association. They went up to the headquarters on the sixth floor. The players took the elevator to a special prison for players. There was an angry Ariaki Taiga sitting there. His hands were tied with gold chains. Subaru looked at his worthless brother. Renji Hirasaka said he was being restrained by gold chains. Shikisha Mario kicked the cage with his foot. He said they now know the truth. The player added that this case will now be looked into much deeper after the new testimony. Taiga was out of his mind. He wanted to kill Subaru. Ariaki Taiga said that that door was supposed to be his. He was getting out of control and threatening his older brother. Subaru listened to him in silence and didn't even pay attention. Sayaka wanted to kill Ariaki Taiga. Subaru blocked her with his hand. He was surprised that his heart was finally at peace when he was with Taiga. The imprisoned boy was screaming with rage. He was trying to catch Subaru's eye. Subaru and Sayaka walked away from him. Taiga would not calm down. He shouted after Subaru. Uda asked if they would leave the boy. Renji Hirasaka agreed and said he wanted to give him some privileges. Of course, if Subaru wanted to become stronger. An article about the appearance of a six-star gate was opened on the tablet. Subaru was giving two stars. He wanted to convert them into a bank. The girl in the window said that Subaru would get three million and a bonus of twenty million for conquering the otherworldly being. Subaru was silent. The girl handed him a black card. Subaru could not believe it. He was being given a privilege from the association. By showing the black card, he could use the various properties of the association for free. The girl wished him good luck. Subaru turned around. The crowd was staring at him. They were discussing Subaru and his achievements. People talked about the whale, about Juliet, about how cool Subaru was. He began to realize that he had really become famous. The girl from the window said she remembered him. She noticed that Subaru had grown much stronger since then. She asked if it was true that when you had everything, power, money, fame, there was nothing to worry about. These words scared Subaru. The girl asked him what he planned to do now. Subaru thought about it. The evening came. There was a commotion in the association on the sixth floor. The elevator doors were opening. Taiga was in prison, pounding the grate with his elbow. A silhouette was visible from the elevator. A hand stretched through the elevator door. The chained Ariaki Taiga looked frightened. He fell to the ground, completely bound and immobilized. The silhouette came closer to the prison cell. A girl was looking out of a bank window in front of him. 
The girl asked Ariaki Taiga why he was making noise. She was a golden player. Her name was Kinokawa Sakura. But her real name and face were hidden. She also worked at the reception desk. Taiga saw her and recognized her. She raised her golden fist in the air. Ariaki Taiga twisted and turned in pain. Subaru stood before his eyes. He saw how his brother had become much stronger. Taiga was shocked that Subaru didn't care about him. His behavior said it all. Ariaki Taiga wanted the boy dead. He was furious that the world had chosen him again. Kinokawa spoke to Taigu. Ariaki Taigu was going crazy. A strange dark matter began to appear. He screamed that he did not need this world. On top of Ariaki Taiga was a strange new growth. Kinokawa's face was full of wonder. A dark door appeared next to Ariaki Taiga. There was a seal on the door. There was a dark door in Ariaki Taiga's cell. Ariaki Taiga looked in front of him. Kinokawa asked him what he had done. Taiga did not understand what was being said. He looked up. From the door, he heard questions about hatred, sadness, and envy. Kinokawa and Ariaki Taiga were frightened. They were saying from the door that this world was not kind to him at all. Ariaki Taiga froze. A hand came out of the purple door. He was invited there to kill everyone without mercy. Ariaki Taiga was being called to go in to take revenge. The door opened completely, and an endless number of hands came out, reaching for Ariaki Taiga. They grabbed him and dragged him through the door. Kinokawa was shocked by what she saw. She ordered them to stop. The girl began to control the golden chains. From the door, she was told to be silent. A dark fog began to engulf the room. The material knocked out the bars and broke the chain. Kinokawa tried to resist the inexplicable force. Her hands froze. They turned to stone and began to disintegrate. Kinokawa became like concrete, which began to crumble. Her hands were holding Ariaki Taiga. He looked at Kinokawa and did not understand what kind of power it was. The voice from the door said that he was giving him his power. Hands were pulling him in. The voice invited him to destroy the world together. The cell door closed. It was daytime. Sayaka stood outside the hotel and turned to Subaru. He was lying on the ground, and she wondered what had happened to him. Subaru looked up at the sky. He thought about what the girl from the bank window had said. Subaru remembered her last question. What he was going to do now. Subaru stood up. He thought about the word now. He glanced to the side and realized. Subaru asked the girl how to address her, because he didn't want to call her Sayaka. She suggested the name Saya. Subaru agreed. He wondered if there was a way to change Saya back to his old Sayaka. Subaru looked at the floor. Saya realized that her body belonged to someone important to Subaru. She asked to see the window of the user patient skylight. Subaru was surprised that she could see it. Saya said it was because their souls were connected. She looked at the closed 35th level. Saya said, that it was likely that the door would open when he got his next traveling skill. She added that if there was a way to bring Sayaka back, it could only be found on the other side of the door. Vankish, Judith, Kalion. Subaru thought about it. He thanked Saya. He realized that he needed to raise his level. He was 26. Gloves appeared on his hands. Subaru put on a new costume. He put on his robe and said he was going to the new gate. Subaru wanted to meet with Vankish as soon as possible. The salesman fell to his knees in front of Subaru. His sales had dropped since the gate appeared next to his shop. He was glad to see the savior. Subaru smiled awkwardly. He opened the gate and looked back at Saya. Subaru asked if she would come with him. She said, that she would serve him for the rest of his life. 
she asked to see the status window. Saya could use blood manipulation, but she had zero luck. The vassal received mana from its master, and its mana usage would be reflected in its indicator by the rating of physical strength sensations. Subaru considered her stronger than Taiga by a factor of two. Sayaka thought she was twenty times stronger. They entered the three-star gate. The stage was called Children's Limbo, the lower classes. There were big monsters on the other side of the gate. Subaru assumed they were demons. Xiao asked Subaru for mana. He told her to do whatever she wanted. Subaru wanted to see her power in action. Saya used the bloody fruit. After that, she circulated the blood. The bloody clot was over the crowd of monsters. Saya wanted to kill everyone who stood in Subaru's way. The bloody disc began to destroy the monsters. Blue blood poured out of them. Subaru appreciated what he saw. Saya added that it was not as effective on stronger creatures. The monsters were lying dead. A monster stood in front of them. It was a huge boss. Subaru said he would deal with it. He picked up an axe. The guy cut the opponent with it. Saya and Subaru cleared the gate. They did it in ten minutes. The other eighty were added to the celestial clock. The salesman was shocked at the speed. Ariaki got the twentieth level. Subaru was too easy. So he decided to book a four-star gate. He stopped when he heard a voice behind him. It was Shikishima, who stated that the gate would be completed in ten minutes. Subaru and Saya turned around to face the golden player. Subaru did not understand why he came. Shikishima wrote him messages that he did not read. He told him that Taiga had escaped. It had happened last night. There was nothing on the news yet. But Shikishima knew that someone had been expelled from the gold rank. Subaru was curious who he was talking about. He said an anonymous player. She was holding Taiga back with gold chains. Shikishima said her name was Kinokawa Sakura. Subaru remembered the girl with pink hair sitting at the reception desk. He froze. They were traveling in the car. Ryo said that Kinokawa was unconscious and the videos had only been transmitted. Given the risk, gold rank players would be entering in twos for a while. Subaru wondered if this also applied to him. Shikishima said that his rainbow door could be higher than the gold one, so it didn't apply to him. Shikishima drank a soda and said that the golden ones would be united for a while. He expressed a desire to operate from Subaru. This surprised him. The gold player thought that Subaru would be his first victim. Subaru froze. The three stood next to a four-star gate. Normally, each star increased the enemy's strength tenfold. But for this lineup, Shikushima considered it an easy victory. The track sawing had almost 900 hours on the timer. Subaru wondered if it would be his turn. Saya exclaimed that it would. Shikishima Ryo's skill is a golden bullet. With it, Ryo could shoot invisible bullets from the tip of his finger. Blood-stained Ariaki Subaru stood there, lost in thought. He looked at the blue meteors falling down. He did not understand what kind of attack it was. The fifth skill was Sulfur Rain. Four monsters were standing in the dungeon. One of them was making animal sounds. A blue explosion occurred in front of Ariaki Subaru, Saya, and Ryo. Ariaki Subaru noticed that those creatures from the other world were quite strong. Many of the half-armed executioners were defeated. Shikishima was annoyed by these notifications that appeared every time he killed someone. Ryo said that the Golden Ones had a rule that using more than one skill on the other side of the real-world door was forbidden. Ryo pointed to the explosion behind him and said that this rule was put in place because of the high damage. Saya and Ariaki Subaru were standing behind Ryo, who was calling them to fight the boss. The top of all players was the gold rank. In Japan, 
They were called the Seven Ninths because of the creatures in the Golden Door. The skill that Shikishima had was the embodiment of a dragoon, a cavalryman who used firearms. Behind Ryo, a kind of tank formed. He used a flurry of death flames. Then the golden player remembered something. He told Ariaki Subaru to choose the next gate. The boy was surprised. In front of the players stood the level 62nd Dust King boss. It had a long body with blades on its limbs and wheels for legs. Ryo had asked Ariaki Subaru to do it because he wanted to deal with three more things by the end of the day. Shikishima was walking, with his burnout boss behind him. The gate was cleared. They had done it in fifty minutes, and the remaining almost nine hundred would be transferred to the celestial clock. They were driving in the car. Shikishima looked at his phone and was not very happy about the speed of the work. Ariaki Subaru looked at the golden one and realized that he wanted to have the same amount of power. But Ariaki Subaru realized that the people who got the golden rank door had completely different standards. Ryo apologized. He told Ariaki Subaru that he would let him try to launch a main attack in the future. The boy bravely agreed. The team arrived at the gate with a glass waterfall scene. The difficulty was four stars. There were ice circles. There was a difficult area under the player's feet. Ryo said that players of lower ranks could not even move there. As it turned out, it wasn't just the boss who was on that spot. A cat jumped out behind Ariaki Subaru. He turned around. A huge cat's paw was approaching them. The cat stepped on the ice. Saya shouted out her master's name, worried about him. This cat was an extra boss. It was a level 42 glass blob. She looked at the players. In an instant, red lines appeared. Ariaki Subaru used the chisel of heaven to cut through the ice cat. Shikishima was surprised to see that his sword could cut through a four-star boss. Ariaki Subaru's face was cut. He realized with fear that the boss was more difficult than Kalion. Only the chisel of heaven helped him. His indicators had dropped significantly. Ariaki Subaru was preparing to strike again. Suddenly, he looked up in surprise. The cat's paw, which had been cut off, began to glow. The boss had grown a new paw. Ariaki Subaru froze when he saw the regeneration. The cat hit the icy ground with its paw. Ariaki Subaru managed to jump away from the boss's attack. He was above the boss and realized that the chisel was useless here. The mana cost was too high to use the axe against an opponent with regeneration. The boss opened its mouth. Saya shouted that she could come to the rescue. Ryo objected. This surprised the vassal. Shikishima sat on the icy lawn and said that it was a matter of interest. Saya said she would not leave Ariaki Subaru. Ryo said that was not the plan. If Ariaki Subaru needed help, he would help him. Shikishima sat there and thought that it didn't matter how cool a player's door was if he was an idiot who relied on luck. Ryo was curious to see the potential. Meanwhile, Ariaki Subaru realized that there were very few opportunities to use blood manipulation in such a terrain. There was no place for ropes. The fog would be blown away by the wind from the waterfall, and the opponent was too big to mediate, so the mana consumption would be huge. He waved his hand and decided to blind him. A bloody cloth fell over the boss's eyes. The cat threw up its paw. Ariaki Subaru was hit by the paw. The guy was amazed at the accuracy. He suspected that the boss did not use his eyes. Ariaki Subaru flew away. The cat was still blind. Ryo said that the boy was probably not good at it. He believed that there were too many expectations for Ariaki Subaru. Sayad told Shikishima that he had not underestimated Subaru. She asked him to take a closer look. 
Ariaki Subaru had hooked the thread to his boss's paw. He held on to it. The guy jumped off the ground. If the place didn't allow it, he could have clung to the cat. Ariaki Subaru concluded that it was like a slime that took the shape of a cat. He decided to use the momentum skill he received from Calion, Deadly Kin. This skill destroyed the object from the inside. The passive skill provided a deep understanding of the techniques. Subaru listened to the tips from his inner vanquish. The guy was by the boss's side and used blood manipulation in tandem with the deadly kin. The rainbow fist flew at the enemy. Subaru hit the extra boss in the side. His blood swirled, forming a spiral that became like a punch. He used the momentum push. The cat leaned back from Subaru's blow. The extra boss fell apart. But the opponent regenerated and was back on the ice arena. Subaru grabbed the cat by the neck with his bloody rope, using the blood manipulation and death kin in tandem again. Subaru pulled the cat. Using the dead man's springer, he hit the boss. Subaru personally experienced the rejection of a fatal wound. Therefore, it became obvious to him that the boss was using mana to regenerate. He was ready to crush the boss indefinitely. Ryo was surprised that Subaru recognized his opponent's weakness so quickly. Shikishima noticed that Subaru had also combined two skill sets. He had never thought of fighting this way. Subaru was breaking his boss into pieces. Shikishima called Subaru a madman. Saya smiled with pride. Subaru was smashing the ice cat with his fist. He used his double skill and jumped away from the mangled boss. Ryo thought about it and noticed that they were already losing strength. The cat was coming back in one piece. Saya was rooting for Subaru. He was already sweating. The boss was meowing at his opponent. Saya supported her master. Ryo decided to cheer Subaru up by going for sushi. Saya didn't think her master would go for it. Suddenly, rainbow flames began to emanate from Subaru. He was using a dead man's springer. The cat meowed loudly. They cleared the sulfur rain gate in 48 minutes. The balance of more than 900 minutes was sent to the celestial clock. Ariaki Subaru received the 31st level, raised the deadly kin to the 3rd, and blood manipulation to the 7th. The team arrived at Sushi Hibiki's Redoran. Ryo, chopsticks in hand, asked Subaru how much longer he was going to stick around. The guy was looking at the sushi with pleasure. He wanted to admire it a little more. It was the first time he had ever seen sushi, so he was so excited. Ryo was shocked to hear this confession. Suddenly, Subaru was called from the side. It was Saya, who was playing strangely with the cat, saying that Subaru had gone through a lot of hardships. Ryo was furious with her behavior in a first-class restaurant. She was stretching the glass cat's arms and legs. They got a glass cat that could regenerate itself by feeding on its owner's mana. Rinji once spoke of an element that fell out of the extra boss. For Hirosaki, it was earrings. For Taiga, it was a coat. The earrings increased the maximum mana by 50%, and the coat reduced physical damage by 50%. Ryo asked if that was how he got the red sword. Subaru thought about it. He glanced at the playful cat that roamed the restaurant corridors. He wondered how this animal could help him. Ryo said that otherworldly beings usually did not serve people. He suggested giving the glass drop a name. Subaru began to think about it. He decided to name the cat Sushi with a fervor in his eyes. The name of the glass drop changed to Glass Sushi. Shikishima asked Subaru to start eating. Subaru thanked him for the food. Ryo turned around when he heard a noise outside. A 48th level griffin creature had broken free in the streets. People were running away from the otherworldly monster. The players quickly stood up. The griffin was screaming. 
It grabbed a child in its chicken-like paws. People screamed for help. The griffin flew away, flapping its wings. Shikishima and Saya stood in the way of the griffin. The girl used blood circulation, and Ryo used a golden ball. Subaru, in turn, attacked the griffin from above through the roof. He pierced the body of the otherworldly creature with his drill. The girl fell out of the griffin's grasp and began to fall. She suddenly fell on a rather soft bloody pillow. She threw it back up and was caught by Subaru. The girl was safe in the player's arms. He was smiling. The girl was confused and scared. Subaru landed in front of Ryo and Sai. He asked the girl if she was okay. She thanked the player. He set her down on the ground. The man started to run, saying Kana's name. He stopped abruptly. Subaru suddenly remembered the boy who had bullied him many times. It was Sawatari. Kana had called him her brother. She hugged Sawatari. The boys looked at each other. Ryo entered the conversation when he saw the interrogation boy. Shikishima adjusted his glasses and suggested that Sawatari thank Subaru. He turned around and said that he had nothing to thank him for. Kana thanked him sincerely. Ariaki Subaru looked at her. In an instant, he melted into a smile. Saya and Ryo looked at the player with a smile. Sawatari rebelled and did not understand why she was thanking Ariaki Subaru. Kana was ashamed of her brother and asked him to thank her for saving his sister. Sawatari leaned against Subaru and called him a worm. He threatened him to distribute the video of Subaru shaving. Suddenly, he stopped his overly bold conversation. Subaru just stood there quietly and listened in silence. Sawatari grabbed Subaru by his clothes. He fell down and wished for a strong door to pick him up. Subaru turned to the grieving Sawatari. He said that he had heard Sawatari give a statement denying that Ariaki Subaru was guilty of the murder. His face was puzzled. Ariaki Subaru thanked him. Sawatari walked away with a sad look on his face. Ryo told Sawatari that none of this made sense because he was on the other side. Ariaki Subaru asked Shikishima to return to the restaurant. The team walked down the street. Saya said she didn't need water or food. Sawatari followed them with his eyes. Kana asked if her brother was in pain. He was holding his head and realizing how miserable he was. The restaurant was closed because of the otherworldly being. Subaru was very upset, and Ryo promised to take him there again. Sawatari was sitting in his office at school. He was holding his phone. There was a video of Subaru's humiliation that he wanted to delete. He did it. His friend with blue hair, Aidashima, came over and asked him why he deleted the video. He added that it was a smart thing to do so that Subaru wouldn't think of taking revenge. Sawtari said it wasn't about fear of retaliation. The blue-haired man noticed something from the window. He called Sawatari to look at the stadium. He turned around. While Subaru was at the hotel, Shikishima called him on the phone. He answered and listened. Sayo was hanging in the window opening. Real wondered where Subaru was. Shikishima said that Taiga had shown up at his school. Ryo asked him to come downstairs as soon as possible to get to the school. Sawatari received a message from Kana's sister. She wrote that she wouldn't mind eating tonkatsu for dinner. Sawatari thought for a couple of seconds and sent a reply to his sister. Suddenly Aidashima pulled him away from the phone, asking him to look at the stadium. They and another boy looked out the window of the office, frightened. They saw Ariaki Taiga, who looked terrifying. A dark energy followed him. A dark door appeared next to Sawatari and Itashima. In the gym next to the ring, too. Doors were everywhere. Someone was ready to open it. Taiga said that this door would give them a new power that could rival that of a gold rank. These words confused some 
angered others, and interested others. Ariaki Subaru, with crazy eyes, offered to get the power and join him. Shikishima showed a photo of the newly revamped Taiga that came with a message from school. Ryo said he had copied his hairstyle. They hurried to school. Ariaki Subaru asked about the door that was behind Taiga in the photo. Shikishima said he didn't know, but he suspected it was something obviously not good. The team hurried as fast as they could and took the shortest route. They reached the school. Sawatari looked at the door. Taigu appeared in the window and asked the boys what they were in doubt about. This scared the students who were in the classroom. They were standing in front of the door. They turned at the sound of Taigu's voice and looked at him with fear. Ariaki Subaru was depressing the boys. He talked about the injustice between the players, that some were carried and some were not, although everyone was doing the same challenge. Ariaki Taiga talked about the chosen ones, who had to be put in their place. So Atari stood there in a daze. He was remembering the past. Kana was sitting in the littered room, asking why her mom and dad were not there. She was crying bitter tears. Kana said that she was bad, so her parents did not want her. Savitari smilingly convinced her otherwise and told her that she had him. He asked the girl not to cry. On the street, he was kicked by workers because Savitari was digging through the trash. He walked in the cold and thought about hungry Kana. He was hungry himself. He passed a house where he saw a happy family celebrating their son's birthday. When they saw Savitari, they were frightened. They drew the curtains. Savitari walked away saddened, wondering what would happen to Kana when he was gone. He bent down and was about to give up. He fell to the ground. At that moment, a bronze door appeared in front of him. Savitari told Ariaki Taiga, that he was also on the side of the Chosen Ones. Taiga was sitting on the windowsill and interrupted the boy and said that he had taken the door from Ariaki Subaru. Renji Hirasaka said that doors choose people with brilliance of soul. Taiga could not believe that his soul could be inferior to that of Ariaki Subaru. Saatari said that the boy did achieve the rainbow door. Ariaki Taiga angrily ordered him to shut up. He believed that Subaru should have remained under him for the rest of his life. Taiga said he was going to turn the world upside down with the back door that had chosen him. He was calling for Sawatari to take revenge on Ariaki Subaru. Taigu offered to kill him. Sawatari thought that if he refused, Taigu would definitely kill him. He thought about Kana. Sawatari realized that he had to die so as not to leave his sister alone. Idashima and Sawatari turned to the door and were ready to walk in. Sawatari was distracted by a sound. He received a message on his phone. Kana was thanking her brother and calling him kind for agreeing to eat tonkatsu. It was like a switch went off when Sawatari saw that Kana had called him kind. When the bronze door appeared in front of him, he was very happy. He thought he would finally be able to feed Kana. At school, Sawatari formed a group of bullies to take revenge on everyone who was mean to them. At school, he learned that Ariaki Taiga was joining them. Kazumi said that their reputation was not so great anymore, but he heard that his brother was also studying with them. They came to the classroom where a scared Ariaki Subaru was sitting. He was wearing glasses and was not very happy to see this group. The boy was mean to him. Sawatari realized that Kana was wrong when she called him kind. He bullied Ariaki Subaru by throwing stones at him. Because of his weakness, he did not let Ariaki Subaru, who was even weaker, rest, mocking him by wiping a dirty mop on him. Sawatari stood in front of the door with his phone in his hands. He did not know what to do. Kana was a very good girl. Sawatari suddenly asked Aitashima to cook Kana tonkatsu for dinner. 
he agreed to do it with a misunderstanding. Idashima's eyes were frightened. Sawatari began to use the skill, and added that his friend should tell Ariaki Subaru he was sorry. The guy was aiming at Ariaki Taiga. This surprised Taiga. Idashima shouted at his friend, not understanding his actions. Sawatari asked him to run away. Idashima used ash threads to fly out of the office, asking Sawatari not to die. He stood in front of Ariaki Taiga. Sawatari said that yesterday Ariaki Subaru had saved his sister. Taiga realized that it was all out of a sense of duty. Sawatari said that Ariaki Subaru did not reproach him, but thanked him. This made him hate his insignificance. Sawatari recalled lying exhausted on the ground, thinking about what would happen to Kana when he was gone. He added that he then thought of something else. He recalled how Ariaki Subaru had killed the griffin and caught Kana. No matter what terrible things happened in this world, he felt that everything would be fine with Subaru. Ariaki Taigu jumped from the windowsill to the ground and said that he did not understand what was going on. He called it insolence that Sawatari meant to be softer to those they were bullying. Sawatari didn't care about insolence. Ariaki Taiga looked at the boy. Saya, Subaru, and Ryo were already outside the school. Sawatari was telling Taiga that Ariaki Subaru had grown so much that he didn't care. Sawatari's face was calm. He told Taiga that he was not growing. These words shocked Taiga. He grabbed Sawatari's head with his hand. His last thoughts were of Kana. All he wanted was to be content with whatever made Kana smile. Suddenly, the blood started to flow. Subaru was already at the office window. Ariaki Taiga turned around. Smashing the window, Subaru flew at Taiga. He yelled at him. Taiga seemed pleased to see him. Suddenly Subaru turned pale. He saw Sawatari behind him, lying in blood. He was remembering Kana. Subaru was overcome with rage. He hit Taiga with such force that he broke the facade. Taiga looked happy. He was looking forward to this revenge. Subaru and Taiga flew down with the pieces of the broken facade. Subaru had no positive feelings toward Sawatari. But no matter what kind of person he was, he did not understand why Taiga had killed him. He was screaming with anger. They landed. Taiga wanted to see what Subaru was capable of. He was smiling and ready to extinguish Sawatari's power with his own. The boys confronted each other. Suddenly, Subaru's bloody gauntlet began to disintegrate. Dust rose next to the school building. They stood opposite each other. Subaru looked at his hand and did not understand what had happened. Taigu had smashed his power with his own. Taigu would an odd. Subaru looked angrily at his incomplete brother. Taiga scoffed that it was quick, but enough to kill him. A gunshot went off next to Taiga, distracting him. For more players appeared in the schoolyard. Shikishima stood with Renji Hirasaka and Udu. A smile appeared on Taiga's face. He remembered that this was not the first time they had surrounded him. The same thing had happened at the mall. Now he was much more angry than then. Taiga was laughing and mocking him for wrecking the Subaru so quickly. The gold players tensed up. Suddenly, Renji cut off Taiga's hand with his sword. Taiga screamed as he saw the fountain of blood. Renji looked back at Taiga. His eyes were frowning. Subaru stood there puzzled. Taiga laughed and pointed a finger at Renji. It was the first time he had seen Hirosaki's negative expression. He thought that he must have really pissed him off. Renji agreed. He was seriously angry. Kinokawa was lying in the city hospital. Her limbs were wrapped in bandages. A frame hung next to her bed. There was a photo of them together in honor of the creation of the gold-ranked team. Renji, to his surprise, was fuming with rage. Ariaki Subaru looked at Renji and Taiga. 
He did not understand when the latter managed to cut off his hand. Subaru was shocked, because it was like a flash. He realized the power of the strongest gold rank player. Renji asked if Ariaki Subaru was injured. He said he was. Taiga told Renji that he had to fight him now. Smoke was coming out of his severed hand. The smoke was in the shape of a hand. The players around him were surprised. Taiga turned around frantically asking Renji how dare he take an interest in Subaru in front of him. A huge arm began to cover the calm Renji with a golden sword in his hands. Hirasaka was in shock. His sword was shattered into small pieces. Ariaki Subaru realized that he had done the same to him. He screamed for Renji. Suddenly there was a blow. Udu had used the second skill of the golden wall. It was a wall that confined Taiga. Subaru jumped away from the wall, which was forming in a circle. Udu was focused. Renji was in the golden walls. Udu realized that he was breaking the rule that prohibits a golden rank from using skill other than the first one outside the gate. He was ready to be punished for this, but the power of Taiga was very unclear. Ryo asked Subaru and Hirasaka to move away from Taiga, pointing his finger forward. He was joined by Saya, who suggested that they work together. Ryo launched a golden ball. Saya launched a blood arrow. Taiga was smiling. Shikishima and Saya were shocked. The bullets simply disappeared, and the blood disintegrated. The golden wall began to crack. It completely collapsed. Taiga laughed at the players' faces. Udo thought that even a five-star boss couldn't break the wall. Kinokawa was also impressed by this. Hirasaka walked beside Udu, who asked if he was okay. Rinji was thinking about the opponent's attack and defense. Shikishima realized that these were just special effects that had to be read. Udu asked Rinji to use his skill freely, because he thought that at this pace there would be a complete rout. Rinji said that this way they would get innocent people involved, which he really didn't want. He also realized that Taiga was counting on this. Udu was confused. Shikishima tried to solve this mystery of the disappearance. He noticed that Sai and Udu's skill had gone off as if they were in fast forward. The doctor at the hospital said that Kinokawa's limbs had been instantly blown away. Suddenly, Ryo had a realization. Taiga was going to go ahead and say that he would leave his name in the history of his world created by horror. The first thing he wanted was to open an exhibition with their corpses for the whole world to see, although he was not sure that anyone would recognize these small pieces. Ariaki Subaru was running up behind Taiga. He turned around. The team was confused by his actions. Shikishima ordered him to stop. He realized that Taiga's skill was speeding up the time of everything he touched. Ariaki Subaru was approaching shouting at him to stay out of that smoke. Taiga looked at Subaru with a smile and called him a worm. Taiga realized that he was going to die in an instant, out of breath. He laughed ominously, using a black death trifle. Shikishima tried to shout out to Subaru. A rainbow fist crushed Taiga's nose. He flew backwards, completely unaware of what was happening. Subaru covered his body with blood. Ryo was in shock. Saya was happy for her master. Subaru's skill allowed him to turn mana into blood and manipulate it. Subaru continuously dispersed blood through his body to catch up with Ariaki Taiga with a strong attack. Subaru said that now that the period of fear of him was over, he would show Taiga strength. His nose was bleeding. Taiga was enraged by the sharpness of Subaru's tongue. Doors began to appear around them. They were next to the players. Subaru looked to the side. He saw the black door of the nigger port. They surrounded Saya, Ryo, Renji, and Udu. The door began to emit smoke. The players began to congregate in the center, moving away from the smoke. 
It was the first time Renji had seen a skill that allowed him to summon a door on his own. Taiga shouted that he would turn his friend into dust first. The slithering cat on Sai's shoulder began to hiss. Ariaki Subaru looked at her. He remembered the cause of Shiyaki's death. He closed his eyes. The team was surrounded by smoke. Ryo asked if they really had no way out of the situation. Renji turned to Shikishima and Udu, allowing them to use their second-level skill freely. My heart began to race. A rainbow power rose over the school. The team was tense. They saw Ariaki Subaru. He turned to the frightened Taiga. He looked at Ariaki Subaru with rage. The boy with the rainbow eyes said, that he had raised his hand against his comrades right in front of him. Hate was burning in the depths of his soul again. The condition of the hate brightness skill was activated. This was one of the three top-level skill given by Vanquish. It improved all abilities by 30% while the hatred lasted. In the first fight with Taiga, due to the difference in status, it didn't matter, but now he was outclassing her. Subaru and Taiga ran at each other. Taiga emitted his smoke. Subaru saw him from above. Taiga defended himself with his hand against Subaru's kick from his leg. Taiga was tense. It was hard for him. He could not withstand the blow of the Subaru. His arm was broken. Subaru launched the bloody cutters. They wrapped around Taiga's broken arm. Ariaki Subaru was approaching his opponent. Taiga was screaming incredibly. Ariaki Subaru said it was too late to make a move. Taiga was attacked from both sides. Subaru hit him on the chin. Taiga flew away, his blood splattering everywhere. Subaru used the bloody fist of the second version of the Immortal Inverness. The skill level increase could be invested in strengthening the nervous system. This ability allowed you to manipulate tentacles, which felt more natural than moving your fingers. And if you got into them, it was impossible to get out. Taiga was falling to the ground. Ariaki Subaru looked at him with his rainbow eyes. A voice came from the door saying that things were bad. Rinji and Udu were surprised at this. The voice went on to say that the owner of the door who had given Subaru the blood manipulation was not Kalion or Judith. It was Vankish himself. Taiga had no chance of winning in his current state. Shikishima asked Subaru to stop. The boy was tense. Suddenly his rainbow eyes disappeared. Subaru woke up and asked what they were going to do with the smoke. Shikishima asked Saya to set up the fog the way Ariaki Subaru did. Blood was all over the diagonal of the door. Ryo, Udu, and Renji were unhappy with the taste and smell of iron. Saya asked them to close the door. Saya noticed that the fog and smoke were disappearing. Shikishima said it looked like a chemical reaction called efflorescence. Ryo glanced to the side and suspected that the owner was coming out of the door. Subaru was shocked. The back door opened and a cracking sound came from it. Smoke was coming out of the door. The other door disappeared. A huge yellow eye was visible from it. The master called them intelligent because they found a way to counteract his skill so quickly. Shikishima told it to tell him what it wanted. The creature rolled its eyes upward. It wanted to destroy the celestial clock. Ariaki Subaru was surprised. Ryo asked how and why. The creature said that it was curious about him, but not as smart as Taiga. Ryo demanded to know something more valuable. The being spoke of a prophecy. Hirasaka Renji, Uduryusei, Shikishima Ryo. The being said their names because they would be killed by Taiga in the near future. Ryo thought it was rather impudent. The creature laughed from the back door. Someone shouted that this prophecy would not be fulfilled. It was Subaru. The creature looked at him and asked why the prophecy would not be fulfilled. Subaru said that he was the one who would not let it happen. The door disappeared with a laugh. 
It moved right to Subaru. The creature looked at the player and said that he was the mortal incarnation of Vankish. The fact that the being knew Vankish surprised Subaru. He asked the creature to introduce himself. It was the black baby. Outside the door, he was in the water. He was actually a baby, tied down by an umbilical cord. He was the ruler of the black amniotic waters named Black Baby. A school student stood next to the fence and said that Taiga had lost. He did not understand what power could compete with the golden rank. The three stood on the roof of the school. A friend asked Kay what they were going to do. They had seen a dark force on the roof of the neighboring building. Kay was focused and thought about what to say. In the courtyard, a black baby said that he was the one who carried his personal world and was destroying this one for him. Subaru started to attack saying that he would not allow him to do that. Suddenly he stopped. The door in front of him disappeared, plunging underground. They were under the taiga. Suba returned and saw it. Saya, Ryo, Renji, and Udu were ready to attack. They used their power against the door. There were marks on the ground from the attacks. The black baby was laughing at their failure. Ryo was angry. Subaru looked frightened. Sayo was surprised that the three gold rank people hadn't hit. Ryo said they couldn't act freely because of the control. Sayo didn't understand what control he was talking about. In the middle of the fight, two opponents appeared on the roof of the building. Sayo was surprised. Ryo was sure that the two were also black. He turned and looked his opponent in the eye. Ryo suspected that they had much more strength compared to Taiga. The cat started to climb on Sai's face. Shikishima stood thoughtfully. Subaru stared in front of him with frightened eyes. They were farther behind than they thought. Taiga was in the waters of the black infant. He called him weak, stupid, and ugly. The baby knew what Taiga was thinking. His arms were next to Taiga's. The creature told him that everything was fine. He squeezed it in his hands. The being wanted to change Taiga to the ideal. After all, if he was just himself, there would be nothing in the world that he could achieve. Someone was walking on the tiles. A black baby greeted the people walking through the underwater tunnel. The girl with long nails said that she would betray everyone right away if she was not made really strong. The guy from the boxing gym said he didn't care because Kay was there too. His friend met him. Kay said he came because he saw him. Two guys from the roof were also there. They were walking through the tunnel. They had long arms stretching behind them. They wanted to kill these people. In the flowers was a photo of a cheerful solitary with two black ribbons. Kana, Aidashima, Saya, Subaru, and Shikishima were in the room. Kana was devastated. Smoke was coming out of the tower. There was a building among the trees where the funeral was held. Kana held a photograph of her brother with a blank look in her eyes. In the corridor, Aidashima told Subaru that Saatari had apologized to him one last time. Subaru shook his head. Aidashima said that Saatari was as hopeless as he was. But there was one thing. Tears came to his eyes when he started talking about Kana. He was angry with Saatari. Shikishima sat on the bench with Subaru. Ryo said that the back door hadn't appeared since that day. He wondered how many people from the same town ended up there if five people left the same school. Shikishima was drinking a drink, and Subaru said he was going to get stronger and learn more about Sayaka. Ryo smilingly said that he was actually going to protect them from Taiga. Subaru confirmed this, but didn't really think they needed his protection. Ryo said that they were relying on Subaru. He told Subaru to start going to the gate with Hirasaka. Subaru was surprised by this. In Tokyo, there was an Asakusa neighborhood in the Taito district. 
There was an otherworldly gate next to the Kaminariman gate. Rinji was waiting for Subaru and was happy to cooperate with him. The boy came with Saya and also expressed his joy. Shikishima said that he was too different from Subaru, so he couldn't learn anything from Ryo. Since Subaru was not good with a sword, he advised him to learn from Hirasaki. Subaru could not believe that the moment had come when he would fight side by side with the best player in Japan. Subaru asked if he had changed his hairstyle. Rinji said it was just after sleeping. Subaru was embarrassed. They reached the gate. There was a man standing nearby who recognized Hirasaka. Rinji said hello to Yamada. It was the silver ranked team. Yamada's happy group. Yamada said they had booked that gate. Renji looked at his notebook. He stared at it. Grabbing his head, Hirasaka said he was confused. The gate he had booked was in Narama. Subaru was surprised, because it was a completely different neighborhood an hour away by train. An hour and a half later, they reached the right neighborhood. The gate was a four-star difficulty called the Dense Forest. Rinji told Subaru that he had heard of a guy going through a gate of this difficulty, but he warned him that the difficulty was only an estimate, so they had to move with caution. Rinji was in a quagmire. Subaru started yelling about it. Saya called him a clumsy man. Subaru was panicking and didn't know what to do. Rinji was completely in the mud and gave a thumbs up. Subaru did not understand what that meant. Saya and Subaru looked at the swamp where Renji had drowned. Shikishima had asked the boy to keep an eye on Hirasaka, because he only seemed to be a smart superhuman, but in reality, strength was his only advantage. Subaru was desperate. He was about to rescue him with his skill. Suddenly, a huge ant in level 43 iron armor appeared in their path. Saya and Subaru attacked. They heard gurgling sounds from the swamp. Fourth roll. A golden blade rose up in front of Saya and Subaru, raising the wind and nearly knocking Sushi off the girl's shoulder. A titanic blade of enormous size rose from the swamp. Saya and Subaru, who was ecstatic, looked up. The ant in the 43rd level iron armor was defeated. The blue shoes walked on the golden surface. The best player was Hirasaka Renji. He stood at the tip of a golden giant sword. This player was known for his beauty, his excellent behavior, but only those who had known him for a long time had this opinion. A person who was lucky enough to become a player. Renji thought he was going to die. In his childhood, Hirasaki Renji had nothing he was good at. His grades at school were not very good. Of course, his parents loved him and had high hopes for him because he seemed to be smart. But after a while, they were not very disappointed and continued to love him as before. Once, in fourth grade, he defended a friend of his from the bullies in his class. That friend cried and thanked him, and Hirosaki's heart warmed. But the next day, he became a plaything for bullying. Hirasaka was lying on the ground while four boys held him down, and one stood in front of him with a mop. He was more shocked not by what he had been put through, but by the fact that the friend he had helped had once sided with the bullies. He stood in front of Renji. The sun was shining behind him, and there was a halo around him. The boy realized then that people betrayed out of weakness. He looked at the mop his former friend was holding. Hirasaka closed his eyes and thought that he would be the only one who would never betray anyone. Then he made sure that in this way he would find a true friend. Blood was spilled on the lawn. And now there was a halo around the sun. Renji was in the swamp again, asking Subaru for help. Saya asked how many times he would fall into the mud. Subaru wrapped his arms around Renji's arm, who was apologizing. Subaru was surprised by the weight as he tried to pull Hirasaka out. Suddenly, 
it was clear that Renji had used himself as bait to lure the great monster out of the ground. Sayo watched with fascinated eyes. They understood this man better and better. Renji is someone who, when faced with an unknown enemy, will definitely start the fight first, as he did with Taiga or with the ant he just met. And all this in order to protect an ally. There weren't many gaps in his skills, although it seemed so. There were no problems with attention either. It was a free, open, and flexible outlook. This is what Hirasaka was like as a player. Subaru handed Renji a towel. He thanked him and said that Subaru had prepared properly. The boy was embarrassed and lifted his robe, revealing his bag, which he handed to Shikishima. With a sad look, he said that he would definitely need it. Subaru told Renji about Ryo with a smile. Renji said that out of all his friends, he was the one who caused Ryo the most trouble. He was sure that he was busy enough even now. Meanwhile, Shikishima was actually busy at his laptop responding to everyone and everything. There was an additional call on his phone. In general, he was a hard-working person, but not very tactful. Udu approached him and said that some of his work belonged to Rinji, but he said that Hirasaki was of no use. Kinokawa needed to grow his arms back as soon as possible and get back to work. They drove fast in the car while Udu tried to get through to an overwhelmed and irritated Ryo. Subaru asked Rinji if he was on good terms with everyone in the gold rank. He said yes. He, Kinokawa, Udu, and Shikishima were forming an alliance. Since its inception, everyone has fought side by side for the past eight years. Subaru and Saya went together. Renji said he would not accept any excuses. He couldn't forgive Taiga for doing this to Kinokawa. Hirasaka told Subaru that he had decided to destroy his brother. Saya looked at the silent Subaru. He was thinking about Kana and Sawatari. Subaru thought of them as a reason to fight Taiga. He was determined. Renji smiled at the boy and thanked him. They were standing on a cliff. Renji said it was difficult, but they found it. Their goal was six hours and twenty kilometers away. Renji saw the boss. Subaru was surprised that he could see twenty kilometers ahead. Renji said it was the skylight. It was a sub-skill of the falcon's eye. The field of view could be magnified up to a hundred times, the original skill common to the Golden Knight. Leaves were coming out of the mire. It was a tree that Ariaki Subaru himself could see. The boy was surprised. A tall tree grew out of the great swamp. Many eyes were hiding in its trunk. This boss was a cursed tree spirit, an 81st level illuminating wielding tower. The eyes began to glow. The tree emitted a golden light. The team was astonished. Renji began to use his skill. His sword was at a great distance from him. The titanic blade shattered. A strong explosion came from the tree and attacked underground. Many sinkholes appeared in the place. Saya was flying on her wings. Renji was holding Ariaki Subaru with his cutlasses. This was what Hirasaka meant when he said that the stars on the gate were just a guide. Ariaki Subaru noticed that Ryo's ability to attack from a distance was either the same or better than his. Ariaki Subaru felt a huge difference from the previous four-star bosses. A sword appeared in Renji's hands. It was obvious that this boss had the strength of a low-level five-star boss. Renji swung his sword. This was the difficulty of fighting the unknown for a long time. Subaru was shocked that if it wasn't for Renji's giant sword as a shield, he wouldn't have even been able to dodge. He was holding Hirasaka and had no idea how to defeat the boss. Renji asked if Subaru could really fly very high. He said it wasn't for long because of the huge mana loss. Renji said that Subaru saved him. Blue liquid poured out of the barrel. The golden strike cut through the boss and the ground beneath him. 
Rinji and Subaru were in the sky. Hirasaka said that thanks to Subaru, they had quickly dealt with the boss. Subaru looked on with astonished eyes. Rinji only had a hilt. Hirasaki Rinji's sixth skill was the sword of the end of the limit. It teleported an axe strike with the entire blade to any place within sight. Although there were risks such as a large gap in which the blade is lost after the technique, as well as a large mana consumption, if the decision is made, the victory will be almost certain. The boss has been defeated. Thirty minutes remained until the destruction of the underworld. The system asked the players to go outside. Traces of the battle were visible on the horizon. The sun was setting over the Players Association building. Renji thanked Ariaki Subaru for his good work. He returned the favor by standing near the front door. Hirosaki apologized for defeating the boss. He asked not to tell Shikishima about his many mistakes. Ariaki Subaru was scared out of his wits because he had already delivered the report. Angry, Shikishima walked out the door and angrily called for Renji. The player realized that it was his mistake. Ryo pulled Renji by the scruff of his neck. At the same time, he told Subaru to be there at the same time tomorrow. He had booked a five-star gate. Renji asked Ariaki Subaru to get ready. The guy was shocked. It was already getting dark. In the hotel room, Ariaki Subaru sat on his bed. He was thinking about the five-star gate. It was the highest limit in the boss world. He clenched his fingers. He closed his eyes. Ariaki Subaru imagined Harasaki's fighting style and how he could apply it to himself. He sat in his room, thinking. A man was walking in the waters of the black infant, inquiring about the number of people. The girl was playing a game and said twenty people of all kinds. The man said it was just in time. There was a park called Kanbayashi in the Shinagawa neighborhood. Team Gracchus was sitting at the table and turned around. It was two guys with black power. In the Bunkyuk residential area, Jolta Hizaki was walking to meet a man. She was angrily asking about a certain person and asking him not to talk to her so casually. This person had two huge centipedes. He said that Juliet was just like the rumor said. The man with the glasses talked about grinding and sorting before the war. After adjusting his glasses, he said that the hunt would begin from here. The morning at the association was anxious. Hisaki's son called on the phone. Shikishima was surprised that he was still alive. He answered the phone and told him that he was under close observation until decisions were made. He asked me not to be bold only because his mother was the director. Juliet answered the phone and said that she had been injured. She was attacked and could do nothing. Shikishima asked about the opponent's score. She looked at the card and said that his name was Kishikawa Suchi, a bronze-ranked player. She had some evidence. He definitely belonged to the black faction. Ryo asked her thoughts on this. Regardless of his strength, she felt that his insect manipulation skill was alien. Ryo sat at his laptop and was surprised to hear about the insects. The other guy had another registered skill, which was making and manipulating small amounts of iron. He was convinced that the back door gave him new skill. Last night, all members of the Gracchus team were killed at the same time. Ryo asked her to be careful. Juliet said goodbye to Shikishima. She hung up the phone and told Ryo to go to hell. She stood next to the corpse, which was covered by a policeman. She had the feeling of being in a different game. How to be a rainbow player. She thought about Ariaki Subaru's skill. Two guys in the park called K and said they had beaten the Gracchus team and Kishikawa had lost to Juliet. Meanwhile, K was standing under the roof where the dead player was lying. He said that things were going fast even with high-level silver players. K got permission from Taiga and Black Baby. 
The guy asked if K would be coming soon. He said yes. Yatsuruji K was a former bronze ranked player. He was going to take on the gold ranked players next. It was a busy day in the business district of Chiyoda, Marinucci. There was a gate in front of the new building. Players and people were standing there, thanking him for his care. This was the third group of the scouting squad with Kusaka Masago as its commander. Kusaka had heard about the five-star gate attack, and she wanted to explain everything to the players directly. Subaru was surprised that there were specially trained people. The Information Bureau squad, whose founder was Shikisha Mario, consisted mainly of people with movement and analysis skill, who provided players with information about the scene, contributing to the survival rate in the gate. Subaru noticed the ring on her finger and asked if she was engaged. She said that she had left the front line for her family, and that's when Shikishima offered her the unit. Kusaka's husband and children were walking around Maguro at the time they defeated the whale. She thanked them for that. Subaru said that the main thing was that the family was alive. He was pleased to know that he had made a difference. Kosura handed Subaru a tablet and told him to start describing it. There were hurricanes and thunderclaps in the gate. The scene was small and consisted of a garden and a palace. There were two thrones on the top floor of the palace. Rinji asked if the boss was there. Kusaka confirmed, but asked which one. Subaru realized that there was more than one boss. He had already had this experience with a goblin and a kobold. But how lucky he was to find himself in such a situation on his first visit to the five-star gate. Rinji clapped his hands to try to rouse Subaru from his thoughts. He asked if he was okay. He shook his head. With a charming smile, Hirasaka called Ariaki Subaru into the gate. The boy, his cheeks red with shyness, agreed. Ariaki Subaru clenched his hand into a fist and let go a little. It was not what he expected. He noticed how well Hirasaka was holding up. Rinji was opening the gate. The squad was standing in front of the entrance. Kusaka wished for no casualties. Suddenly, she heard a strange sound behind her. She turned her eyes. Her colleague was being cut in two with a sword. It was Kay. As he had expected, they were very weak. Kusaka was horrified to recognize him, for Kay was on Shikishima's general list. Suddenly, blood gushed out. Kay stepped on Kusaka's bloody head. Yatsuruji was reporting that Hirasaka and Ariaki Subaru had entered the five-star gate. He held the phone to his ear and asked to open the back door in ten minutes. The underwater corridor was empty. The guy with long white hair agreed, lowering his phone. He added that he would be waiting. It was Ariaki Taiga, who already looked completely different and had a dark rank. It took about 330 days to complete the five-star hurricane and thunder scene. Ariaki Subaru noticed the silence. The palace looked beautiful. The water in the pool in front of it was clear, and the weather was clear. Rinji had a strange feeling, so he decided not to let his guard down. He asked Saya to close the gate. She agreed. Saya began to turn the lock. Holding his golden sword, Rinji thought about his bad feeling. The gate closed. It was impossible to leave the stage until the boss was killed. Suddenly it started to rain. Saya and Subaru looked up. A strong wind came up. The clouds rose above the palace. The storm rose in one second. At the gate, enemies were consistently placed on the map from the moment the castle was activated. On such a small map, you could even feel the boss. Renji, Saya, and Subaru were anxious and wet. What they expected was far beyond reality. Subaru and Renji saw the stage boss. They were sitting on their thrones. 
one was a level 89 Storm Delta, and the other boss was a level 93 Thunder Carpet. The Storm sniffed something. It asked the Thunder Carpet if it was the smell of a mortal body, which they were familiar with. They smelled a gilded knight. Thunder smelled another. It was someone they had fought a long time ago. They smelled Subaru. The bosses were smiling, and Thunder said that the players even had a good chance of survival. A blue light appeared in front of Subaru and Renji. The palace guards appeared. They were fully dressed in protective suits. Subaru was shocked that these were the usual opponents of this scene. Each of them was above the level of that whale. The Wind and Thunder Guardians had an average level of 60. Ariaki Subaru shouted at Sai not to spare his mana. She was determined. Ariaki Subaru told her to act in such a way as to stay alive. Saya asked him to rely on her. She was ready to keep Sayaka's body safe. Saya flew up on her wings using blood manipulation derivation. Renji Hirasaka used the first slash of the golden sword. They decided to attack the crowd of guards. Ariaki Subaru realized that they would lose if they didn't fight with all their might from the beginning. His body was overgrown with skeletons, using blood manipulation, derivation, and bloody fist and immortal Inverness. Ariaki Subaru flew up, releasing his tentacles from his back. Renji held up two fingers. A bright golden light appeared around the guards. A titanic blade of enormous size emerged from the ground, slicing the guards to pieces. The guards attacked the players. Harasaki noticed that they were not agile enough for their level, because he did not wound more than half of the guards. There was a guard opposite Renji. He was running at the player. Ariaki Subaru attacked the guard from the leg. The player was standing on his head. Renji was surprised. Ariaki Subaru was punching the guard in the head. Suddenly he was grabbed by the leg. The guard flipped Ariaki Subaru over and hit him on the ground. The player was shocked. The guard punched Ariaki Subaru in the chest, breaking his suit. Ariaki Subaru was stunned by the blow which was on par or better than Sushi's or Kalyan's. The guard was ready for the next blow. Renji shouted at Subaru. His eyes turned rainbow. He kicked the guard. Then he threw an elbow. Subaru was breaking the guard's defense. The opponent was shocked. Subaru shouted that he was not here to slow down Hirasaka. He let out his cutlasses. They wrapped around the guard's body. He was twisted. Subaru continued that he was here to either fight with Renji. He smashed the guard with his drill. The 54th level wind and thunder guard was defeated. Subaru held his chest. He was shocked that the level did not rise and very few points were added. Ariaki Subaru remained at level 31. His health indicator had dropped by a third and his mana by half and all for the sake of one guard. There were four guards in a circle around Subaru. He took his chisel of heaven. He couldn't use the chopping attack in the air because of the high mana cost. Suddenly, Subaru saw something. A guard was making an incision on his arm. They were using the Vidra skill. The guards drew their swords. Ariaki Subaru was confused that they had a skill to summon weapons. He realized what the fifth level of difficulty was. Ariaki Subaru pulled himself together. Renji looked at the guy around him. Ariaki Subaru's gaze was cold. He was thinking about Hirasaka. A promising smile appeared on Ariaki Subaru's face. He knew he could do it. As Ariaki Subaru sat in his hotel room, he racked his brain all night. No matter how much he admired Renji Hirasaka, there was no way he could become him. The guy was recalling moments from his old days. He didn't need to. Subaru realized that Shikishima was not saying not to learn from Hirosaki, but that he wanted to learn from him. Ariaki Subaru, with blood on his face, 
said that he had become stronger. It was not only about the level, but also about readiness for battle, awareness, and the desire not to lose. Ariaki Subaru recalled Sayaka's death, Sawanari's death, Kana's pain. He wanted to become stronger, no matter how clumsy and ugly it was. This was the fight he had been waiting for. The guards began to attack Ariaki Subaru. Only a fight to the death could make the boy stronger. Ariaki Subaru jumped up, the guards flying toward him from both sides. He put out his chisel, stopping the guard. Their swords crossed, and Ariaki Subaru struggled to stand. The guard cut off his tentacles from behind. Ariaki Subaru was furious. He ran to attack the guards. His opponent was swinging his sword. The blade was almost at Subaru's head. He grabbed the guard's arm with a sharp slash. There were blows with the blade. The hand with a golden sword flew away, the guard's head was separate, and blue liquid poured from his body. This strike by Ariaki Subaru shocked the other guards. He had defeated another level 59 opponent. Ariaki Subaru's health was critically low. Ariaki Subaru was ahead of the competition. Ariaki Subaru's level has increased. His health and mana have been updated to the maximum. The guards attacked, but their targets suddenly disappeared. Ariaki Subaru was in the sky above the opponents. He swung his chisel across the sky. The guardians looked up. He attacked the opponents with his weapon. He killed two 53rd and 63rd level guards. Ariaki Subaru's level rose again. He stood in a heavy downpour. The guards looked at him with fear. Ariaki Subaru turned around and looked at his opponents with his rainbow eyes. Rinji was not far behind, and he looked at Ariaki Subaru with pride. In front of the gate, when he was in the association, Shikishima approached Hirasaka. He asked him not to save Ariaki Subaru to the last, and not to give him any tips. Renji asked why. Ryo said that Ariaki Subaru would soon be on the same level as them. All he needed was practice. Ariaki Subaru, meanwhile, used his last strength to fight, his blood running cold. Ryo told Renji that he didn't have the ability to teach people. This surprised him. Shikishima told him to just lead by example and called him the strongest. Rinji stood in the downpour and smiled as he thought about it. Above the calm Rinji, the guards were attacking. He made two swings. The opponents disappeared. Rinji stood there looking at Ariaki Subaru. Hirasaki wondered if they could have hoped for him. He thought back to the six-star gate wondering if Ariaki Subaru would be the match that would rekindle their fading hope. Eight years have passed since the first gate appeared in the world. Despair was spreading among the top players. When the first gate appeared, the maximum difficulty level was three stars. But then it went up to four. Three years later, five-star gates appeared. And every time the number of stars was increased by one, the difficulty increased tenfold. The association said that if the level of difficulty was updated every three years, the next year Shikishima predicted a six-star goal, and in four years there would be seven stars. Ryo and Hirasaka were sitting at a long table. He asked Renji if they were ten times stronger than they were two years ago. Hirasaka said no. They had no choice but to fight with the entire gold rank staff. Ryo put his hand on his face and sadly said that at this rate, there would come a time when players would not be able to keep up with the levels to fight the gate. The question was who could withstand a gate that had a difficulty level ten times higher than a five-star gate. Shikishima realized that the sky clock would break after one failed attempt. Ryo began to think that humanity had no choice but to accept defeat. Renji looked down. No matter how desperately they tried to find new ways, one by one, a heavier and heavier burden was pressing down on them. Renji was afraid of the moment 
when he would lose the true friends he had finally met. Suddenly he looked up and turned. Shikishima was talking to Kinokawa on the phone. Kinokawa was calling from the hospital. She said they were going to question a man from Mudu about the murder of a player. Savitari and Aitashima were behind bars. Ryo asked what was so strange. Ryo then turned pale when he heard about the rainbow door. Renji also became interested. Ariaki Subaru was flying with all his might. He was swinging his heaven bit in a battle with the guard. Renji looked at Ariaki Subaru and wondered. He noticed that the boy fought his opponents only with swords. Renji waved his weapon away. The guard also defended himself with his golden swords. Ariaki Subaru's foot touched the guard's arm. The opponent was shocked. Standing on the guard's hand, Ariaki Subaru swung the chisel of heaven. The bloody weapon flew toward the golden sword. Ariaki Subaru's gaze was full of fury. He cut through his opponent. The 56th level wind and thunder guardian was defeated. Ariaki Subaru was concentrating. He needed it for the chopping attack of the heavenly bit at the end of the blade at the moment of impact. Then, he could chop down enemies with strong defenses, while reducing mana costs. Renji Hirasaka noticed that Ariaki Subaru learned not from other people, but from his enemies during a fight. Ariaki Subaru called out for Saya. All that was visible in the sky were red lines. Her wings flew despite the gale of wind and rain. In addition to the red lines, viscous clots of blood appeared in the sky, surrounding the guards. Saya sliced through her opponents. Flying, she used the killing field. It was a skill that commanded blood cells to massively manipulate blood. The clock covered the body of the guards. The command was an explosion from the touch. The blood that touched the opponent exploded. Saya flew on. The guard looked down. Saya wondered what she could have done to make the blow decisive. But even so, Saya was reducing the enemies for Subaru and Hirasaki. The priority was to save the body of Subaru's comrade Sayaka. She flew at the guard. A golden sword was next to her face. Suddenly, the guard split into two parts. Ariaki Subaru helped Sayaka avoid being hit. Saya called out the name of her master. They approached each other. Ariaki Subaru thanked Saya and asked her to be careful. A sparkle appeared in Saya's eyes. She put her hand to her chest and said that she did not deserve such words. She flew away and told Ariaki Subaru to keep himself together no matter what. He left, calling out to Hirasaka, who was busy with the guard. Ariaki Subaru said that he felt his level would be hard to rise on this stage. Renji thought it was because of his high level. Raindrops were running down Hirosaki's face, who said that the palace was probably an extra stage. Ariaki Subaru recalled the vigilance he needed to defeat the glass cat, because the extra stage was not just the boss. Ariaki Subaru was shocked to realize that the guards were simply summoned by the skill. That's why they received a small amount of experience points. Ariaki Subaru began to realize that there were only two bosses in this stage from the beginning, Thunder and Storm, who were sitting on their thrones. Storm said that the players were paying attention. Thunder asked with a sly smile if they would send someone stronger or if they would go out themselves. Several bolts of lightning flashed in the sky. Ariaki Subaru realized that his level could still rise, and they were only wasting their energy. Renji, waving to the guard, said that they were also reducing the boss's mana. He added that they were acting in accordance with the boss's intentions, and their goal was to expose the authorities. Silhouettes could be seen in the palace. Thunder and Storm came out onto the porch. Renji stared at the bosses his eyes bulging. Hirasaka hesitated for a while when he saw the bosses. He thought about using the Boundary Warp Sword. 
This skill used 80% of all mana, reached the enemy in a short moment, and had the power to split the terrain. Renji doubted that it would help defeat those two bosses. Hirasaka decided to use the sixth skill. The downpour continued to flood the stage. But in a moment, the rain began to subside. Renji's eyes were filled with surprise. The clouds in the sky began to part, and the sun began to appear. Renji thought for a moment. He looked around. The branches of the trees stopped swaying in the wind. Thunder and Storm were walking side by side. They were behind Renji Hirasaki. The boss behind them said that decisive moves would be miserable. They wanted to compete in strength. Delta of Storm and Kilim of Thunder introduced themselves to the players. They called them strong. Ariaki Subaru stood in awe. Thunder and Storm asked for a fair fight. The weather was clear above the palace at the gate. Storm and Thunder stood next to Subaru, Arasaki, and the guards worshipping the bosses around them. Thunder and Storm looked at the players. Hirasaka thought that Subaru wanted to know something. Subaru mentioned Judith from the battle in the garbage dump. Hirasaka thought about how all the bosses behaved as if they were animals that did not allow outsiders to enter their territory. The weather was clearly changing at their behest, and they were leading the attack themselves, having tactics. Hirasaka asked if the bosses had a chance to talk. This puzzled the bosses. Hirasaka clenched his hand into a fist and said that he wanted to know many things. He asked about doors and gates. The golden player angrily asked what they were trying to turn the human world into. The bosses thought about it. Storm wondered if Renji had asked Ludwig, the one who owned Hirasaka's golden door, anything. Hirasaka thought that the bosses might be close to the center. The bosses agreed which surprised Renji Hirasaki. Thunder said they had been locked up for a long time themselves. Storm said they would tell everything they knew. Subaru and Renji were shocked. Subaru stood there in his bloody armor, open mouth, shocked that he had so easily agreed to tell such a secret. Renji hurriedly pulled out his cell phone, asking to record their conversation, as he was not sure they would be able to remember. Thunder allowed it. Renji put his hand to his chin. He looked a little upset, with Subaru standing anxiously behind him. Grim started to talk about the gate, scratching the back of his head, but fell silent. Subaru was looking at his bosses. Thunder said he couldn't continue. Storm asked him about controlling information. Thunder apologized with a smile, which made Subaru angry. He was surprised that the content of what they could talk about was limited. Suddenly, someone apologized. It was Hiroxica, who pulled out a notebook and pen, begging to tell them in this format, thinking of the angry Shikisha Mario. Subaru noticed the desperation in his eyes. Thunder said there was nothing he could do. The storm said why not? The lightning bolts flew in the clear sky. They asked to be defeated to get closer to the answer. The lightning flew next to the players. Thunder mockingly asked about victory and defeat, wondering what they would choose. Storm, folding his arms, said that they would quench their thirst with their souls. Subaru tensed up. Suddenly, the bosses started playing rock, paper, scissors. This surprised Subaru. Over the palace, Shouts of a draw could be heard over and over again. Finally, Storm jumped up and down with joy at his victory over Thunder, who was curled up in a ball of sadness. Hirosaki and Subaru stood there looking at them with a poker face. Renji's eyes opened at the boss's serious voice. Storm pointed his finger at the goal player and said that he wanted to compete with him. The wind rose around Subaru. Storm ran in his direction, trying to hurt Renji, but he pulled out his golden sword and swung it in front of the boss. Subaru stood there, covering his face from the gale of powerful wind. There was a loud and hectic fight near the palace. 
Storm was pleased with the process. He said that Ludwig had chosen a very good incarnation. Renji Hirasaka looked at his boss with concentration. Thunder said with an animalistic look that he wanted to taste more. Renji held his sword and felt that his opponent was strong. Stronger than anyone he had ever faced. Subaru stayed on his feet and realized that Thunder was on par with Renji Hirasaka's best five-star player. Thunder appeared at the side of the thoughtful Subaru. He suddenly ran away in fear from his boss. Thunder tilted his head and was disappointed that Subaru was an immortal mortal. Subaru did not understand what was being said. The boss said it was not his fault. Suddenly, Subaru became calmer and more relaxed. Being able to have a conversation without much discomfort or direct attention could change perceptions. Even though the creature in front of him was an enemy, Grimm said that at best he would amuse himself. Subaru did not understand. The boss's foot was approaching Subaru's player. The boss wanted to see how hard he had to kick him to make him die. Subaru turned his head and looked at his opponent with eyes full of misunderstanding. In front of the thunder was a long golden stream, carrying a stream of wind and stones. There was a column of smoke above the palace. Subaru should have foreseen this. No one bothered to put on any pressure. A long sinkhole appeared in the ground with Subaru and thunder in it. The boss approached the player and mockingly said that he couldn't even dodge. He didn't understand whose mortal incarnation Subaru could be but he was incredibly weak. Subaru was burned, lying in a sinkhole with his limbs torn off. Renji, distracted from the battle, turned around and called out to Subaru. Storm's hand suddenly fell on Renji's face. His eyes were full of shock. Blood was pouring out. Storm continued to fight with a smile. Renji was holding Storm's attack. Suddenly, the boss hooed and awed at the player with his mouth open. He was looking at his finger, which was bleeding. Renji stood in the wind, covering his face with his sword. It turned out that Renji's right eye was missing, and there was a bloody hole in it instead. Thunder was still standing over Subaru's body in the sinkhole. He was looking at him, covering his face with a red sword. The boss was holding the bit of heaven, which seemed strange to him, because it didn't have a single scratch from his lightning. He realized that this was the true uncharacteristic power he had felt earlier. Looking at the bit, Grimm talked about the signs that were felt from this power. He looked at the burnt Subaru and realized that the player was the personification of the vampire god Vankish himself. Thunder stood silently. Suddenly, Saya appeared in the vortex. She stood behind Thunder, who waved his hand and asked her not to get in because he would kill her. Saya's face was full of rage and despair at the same time. The boss said that Subaru probably would not have wanted her to die. Tears streamed from Saya's eyes, and she realized that she had to stay alive, no matter what it took. She remembered Subaru telling her to be careful. Saya closed her eyes. She was crying very hard. She asked Subaru to get up. She begged him to wake up somehow. Thunder, crossing his arms, said that he would not get up with his limbs set on fire. Suddenly, Sai's name was called. Behind Thunder, Subaru was recovering piece by piece, asking Sai to leave. Thunder looked at the player with an angry face. The tears on Sai's face decreased. Subaru used Taiga's black smoke defense. A large amount of semi-frozen blood poured out from his body. Although Subaru had lost two arms and legs, he was able to escape death. Subaru looked incredibly furious. His body was covered in black shreds of cloth. His health indicators were almost at zero, and his mana points were minimal. He was looking at Kilim Thunder, who was without a doubt the strongest opponent he had ever met. Subaru couldn't even imagine the difference between them. Subaru's eyes turned bright and his face was tense. He wanted to defeat his boss, 
because that would give him a leap in power. Thunder pointed a finger at his front and asked if he had blood instead of limbs. Lightning appeared around the boss, and he was only set on fire by Subaru's trick. Meanwhile, the battle between Renji and Storm continued unabated. He was grateful to Ludwig's incarnation, mocking the fact that now Renji was missing one eye. Renji's eye shone in a new way. His attacks became sharper. The golden sword was so close to the boss that he was frightened. Storm flew away after Renji's strike. Suddenly, he landed on his feet. The boss was smiling. Renji said that not everyone was strong from the beginning. He bowed his head and started talking. Renji said that when they were still weak, many difficult situations happened. He thanked Storm Delta in return. After all, Renji was sure that defeating this boss would make him even stronger. The player used the fifth skill called Imperial Blinding Gaze. Instead of continuing to spend mana, all the power and effect of the skill was increased by 130%. Storm smiled when he saw this trick up Renji's sleeve. He liked it. Storm attacked the gold player. He wanted an incredible fight. Renji swung his golden sword. Lightning bolts flew. They hit the ground, trying to hit Subaru, who was moving with incredible speed. Subaru was somewhat confused. The speed of the lightning substance was one-third of the speed of light, so it was impossible to dodge it. It predicted the course of the main lightning strike before it struck. The Subaru had to keep moving so that the lightning wouldn't hit it. There were explosions near the player. Subaru could have become a pile of ash if he couldn't dodge. Thunder bowed his head, releasing lightning from his eye. Subaru continued to run. He turned around and realized that things were bad. Soon all the guards would be defeated by these lightning bolts. With Subaru's health indicators, death was guaranteed from a single lightning strike. It was quite difficult for him, but he needed to defeat the guards and level up. In front of Subaru was a guard kneeling on the ground. Subaru flew into him from the side. He cut off the guard's head. There was an explosion. Grim took a closer look. Subaru had defeated the 64th level wind and thunder guardian and raised his level to 34. Subaru recovered and was happy to see his level increase, as it increased his status and fully restored his health and mana. Also, Subaru regenerated all his lost limbs. Grim saw all this and realized that it was very beneficial for mortals. Subaru stood in front of the boss, fully restored. He crossed his arms and launched his drill at the boss. The Fist of Thunder was right in front of the tip of the bullwhip. Lightning flew from the boss and pierced Subaru's skill. The player looked in confusion in front of him. He was flying away from the lightning strike. His limbs began to fry again. The player was croaking. The boss, twisting his finger in his ear, asked if a slight increase in strength could make up the difference. Subaru flew upstairs with his limbs restored in the form of a sword. The player with the vampire teeth flew to thunder. Claws appeared on his hands, and rainbow energy surrounded him. Thunder began to back away and realized the reason why Vankish chose this mortal incarnation. He shouted that he did not know how to lose, he was trying to maintain his dominance, and for this reason he acted foolishly. The boss attacked Subaru. Lightning was breaking up the blood. There was a bright yellow explosion in the sky. Subaru covered himself with his hands and realized that at this rate, he would be knocked out by the force before he reached his targets. Subaru was in the sky. Thunder was looking at him and telling him not to try to outdo himself in front of him. If the player could hurt him, that sword would be the only way. Glass Cat Sushi was walking along the moat with a heavenly bit. Thunder was shocked to see this picture. Saya and Subaru were puzzled when they saw Sushi. She was walking along the ditch with the bit in her mouth. The thunder sent a bolt of lightning at her. 
Subaru began to fly to help Sushi. A message suddenly appeared in front of his eyes. It said something about the glass Sushi. It was regenerating, absorbing mana. The cat kept walking, a little cracked, but with a bit in its mouth. Grim was shocked, and Subaru was relieved. Subaru had forgotten about its ability to regenerate. The player was surprised that she helped, understanding Subaru's strategy. The cat was walking toward Subaru. The player started shouting to Sushi. Glass Sushi swung slightly, turning her body to the side. Thunder's face was not happy. The cat shot the bit into Subaru's hand. The player was happy that it worked. Suddenly, Thunder appeared in front of his face. He knocked the chisel of heaven out of his hands and asked him what he had done. Subaru's teeth bared. He looked at his opponent. Behind Thunder stood a large glass sushi. It raised its paw. Thunder turned back, swinging his leg. He knocked the cat's head off. The boss was surprised at the cat's coordination with the giant. Subaru raised the bit of heaven up and approached Thunder. The boss quickly turned around to face the young man. Subaru was coming down. The player landed with the thought that it was either master or master. Subaru got down on one knee, swinging his sword. He decided to risk all his mana. Swinging his sword, Subaru used the chisel of the chisels of heaven. The impact caused many of the guards to stagger. He killed all the guards in the area. Subaru hoped that this would be enough for him. The player raised his level to 35. He was glad that it worked. Behind Subaru was Thunder, who stabbed his sword into Subaru's body. The player's eyes were devastated. The boss told him not to try. He wanted to know why Subaru wanted to live so badly and keep his dominance. The boss angrily said, that the players had come in the first place to defeat them. Subaru wondered why he wanted to live. Tears streamed down his cheeks. He remembered the hurtful words that came out of the mouths of the people around him. How his classmates called him a worm, and his parents called him a mistake of nature and useless. He remembered Sayaka, who suggested that they become stronger together. He remembered Kinokawa asking him what he wanted to do next. His eyes were full of hopelessness. Subaru said he wanted to meet. Grim was interested in his words. Subaru, remembering Sayaka, said that although they had spent a short time together, he had always enjoyed taking risks with her. His eyes were full of sadness. He closed them, and tears flowed from them. Subaru wanted to meet with her to thank her and apologize for getting her into this. And if he was forgiven, he wanted to be stronger together again. So he took the risk. Grim, who was standing behind him, asked what they were talking about. The boss stared at him. Subaru was talking about the blood usurper. Saya told him that the next slot would probably open up when Subaru got the next random skill. Subaru paid off that risk. Suddenly, a stream of rainbow power came pouring in. Thunder was shocked by what he saw. There was a rainbow door behind Subaru. Thunder was in a state of shock. They greeted him and said that they had been watching from the outside. The being came out of the door and said that the punishment for injuring his mortal incarnation would be severe. It was Vanquish. Subaru lay on the ground and tried to look back. Vankish was telling the player that he had done quite well. Tears were streaming down his emotionless face. Vankish said with a smile that the victory would be his. Behind Vankish, a rainbow force was flying. The thunder began to release lightning. Vankish let out a bloody shot from his finger. Bloody tentacles tied Subaru's body and lifted him up. Vankish walked through the rainbow door, taking Subaru with him. He told his boss to wait for Subaru to return with more powers. Thunder yelled at Vankish to stop. The boss said he would never forget the day Vankish decided to kill them. Thunder was furious 
and said that he would not let his sworn enemy escape so easily. Vankish was puzzled. Suddenly there was a thunderbolt on the side of the door. Lightning passed through it and created a sinkhole even in the other world beyond the door. Thunder's foot stepped through the rainbow door. He was furious. Before him was the hateful bone ocean. Thunder was surprised to see Vankish sitting over Subaru in a dying state. The player did not understand who was in front of him. Vankish said that he had changed because Subaru had become stronger. Vankish got his strength back. The creature healed Subaru. He stood up in amazement. Suddenly lightning flashed. Subaru and Vankish turned to face the direction of the strike. They were standing in front of Thunder, who was keeping the lightning around. Subaru became nervous when he saw Carpet. He saw his boss and felt his anger, and there was an oppressive atmosphere in the air. Vankish told him to leave, because he was not invited. Grimm was furious that Vankish had intervened in the fight. He had no intention of ending the fight with Subaru anyway. Grimm said that he would kill Vankish next. This surprised Vankish. He said that it was rather arbitrary, primitive, and shameful to come into the world of humans and force them to fight. These words made Thunder angry. Vankish thought about the words about killing him and Subaru. Holding Subaru's shoulder, he agreed. His hand passed over his body. Vankish began to merge with Subaru into one body. Vankish asked to borrow his body for a while. He said he would show him the old way of fighting by manipulating blood. Subaru thought about the word old. Vankish was rejoicing over the 35th level. Thunder looked ahead of him in shock. Subaru and Vansish had merged into one. Vansish appreciated the changes in his body. Grimm was irritated by the desire to defeat him with his pathetic mortal body. Vankish bowed his head and said, that he was going to defeat him in this way. Most of the power remained in the gate of Thunder's partner. The boss shouted at Vankish to shut up and said that it was as if they were in the afterlife. Suddenly he fell silent. A slap from Vankish hit Thunder in the face. His head flew off his body with incredible ease. Vankish looked mysteriously and said that Thunder's corpse would remain here. Two silhouettes stood out in the iridescent eyes, Vankish and Subaru. They were in zero gravity, and Subaru was quite puzzled. Thunder's head was jerking. As he recovered, Thunder was angry. Vankish put his hand to his boss's body, ordering him to freeze. Vankish pushed Thunder down. He looked down and saw blood shot into his chest. Vankish ordered him to dissolve. Thunder began to spin like a record. Vankish was using cursed blood and a furious whirlwind. In front of Vankish's hand, Thunder spun with all its might. It turned into a ball of thread. Suddenly, the whirlwind stopped, and small bolts of lightning blew from the thunder. His foot tried to reach Vankish, but he dodged it. He noticed that Thunder had managed to get out of his skins. Thunder launched an attack on Vankish. He kicked him, but Vankish defended himself. The veins on Thunder's face were showing from his rage. Vankish looked completely calm in Subaru's body. The fight continued. Vankish punched at Thunder, who began to fall backward. Thunder swung with his loaded foot. Vankish covered himself with his hand from the unsuccessful blow. A hole appeared in the boss's body. Vankish stood before the frightened Thunder. Vankish's face and Subaru's body looked frightening, and he walked forward, inviting Thunder to come to him again. The rainbow disappeared from Subaru's eyes. Subaru turned to Vankish. He asked if he was really that strong. This question shocked Vankish when he realized that Subaru thought he was weak. Subaru apologized and said that he had looked nondescript when he first met him. This angered Vankish even more, who began to remind Subaru of how bespectacled he had been in the past. 
Subaru asked if it wasn't strange that Thunder didn't take any damage despite the number and strength of the blows. Vankish smiled and was surprised that he didn't know that. Subaru said he had experience with a glass cat that had the ability to regenerate, but it didn't take much damage until its mana was exhausted. Vankish said it was a curse that was placed on his blood. The spirit itself was taking very deep damage. Vankish stood there smiling. He told Subaru about the cursed blow of blood manipulation. Vankish said it was particularly effective on regenerates, those with indeterminate forms, and spirits. Thunder clenched his fist angrily. Releasing lightning bolts, he shouted not to be neglected. Subaru asked Vankish if Thunder hated him for no reason. Vankish said that in the afterlife, he had beaten those two to death, and that he was the reason they were in the gate. Subaru looked at Vankish when he heard about the beating. Vankish offered to change the mood. In front of Vankish, an angry thunder stood in Subaru's body, releasing lightning bolts. The boss jumped up and prepared his fist to strike. Vankish and Subaru's body flew at his opponent with a devilish smile. Their fists were facing each other. They stood almost touching each other's foreheads. Thunder was full of hatred. Winkish was full of excitement and pleasure. Thunder Carpet launched an attack. His two arms were pierced. The same situation was with his legs. There were holes all over Thunder's body. Vankish said that one can rely only on one's own strength. These words stopped Thunder. Vankish went on to say that because of this, they had settled on a kind of perfection. Subaru looked at Vankish, who said that if Thunder had killed the player faster, he wouldn't be in this situation. Vankish said that Thunder lost when his door appeared. Grim stood there with his teeth clenched in anger. And Subaru won by making a superhuman effort to become more than incredible. Thunder's body was even more torn. Vankish mockingly addressed the God of Thunder. There was almost nothing left of him. Vankish turned around and walked away from Thunder, wishing he had been more serious. The system informed him that the boss was defeated. An instant later, Thunder realized that he hadn't regenerated. He couldn't save his soul form. He was in a panic. Thunder was furious with Vankish. Subaru was confused. Vankish was treating him like a child. Subaru realized that Vankish, or whoever he was, was very strong. Subaru wondered who Vankish was. The system notified him that he had defeated the boss. The notification was followed by a glyph. The notification informed him that the boss had been revived. Subaru was shocked. He turned to Vankish, who was laughing uncontrollably. He asked the player not to panic. After all, it was already a remnant. The thunder resumed. It was the second coming of the level 5 storm. This skill was only available to weather deities. After death, 5% of the maximum health was restored, and it could be used again after 240 days. Thunder screamed with all his fury. Bloody slashes enveloped Thunder's body and pushed Vankish's arm downward pressing it against the ocean of bone. Thunder lay there, his eyes glowing with rage. Subaru was surprised at the speed of the revival. Vankish said that a side effect was the absence of all reason. Subaru thought that he could only manage that 5% by risking his life. Thunder was preparing to attack. Subaru realized that Hirasaki's opponent also had the same skill. Vankish suddenly got out of Subaru's body. The player did not understand these actions. Vankish said that he had decided something about the door call. Subaru was shocked at the time he chose to do so. Pointing his finger at the boss, Vankish ordered him to defeat Kilim Thunder in this state. Subaru's face turned pale, and his eyes narrowed in shock. Vankish was puzzling over how to challenge him. Subaru wanted to protest. Vankish said that, on the other hand, 
Hatred was not there to hold on to the past. The thunder continued to roll, flashing lightning. Vankish went on to say that through hatred, he became stronger and left the past behind, moving on. That's what strength was, Vankish said, holding Subaru's shoulder. Tears were forming in Subaru's eyes. Vankish said to use hate. Subaru was holding a sword. He went forward when Vankish told him to be strong. And then one day, Subaru would be able to love himself. The boy's eyes were full of determination. Vankish wished Subaru to be happy, and a bright light appeared in front of him. The skill level of hating the brightness increased to the second level. The duration of the hate of all abilities was increased to 45%. Also, a special characteristic was inherited from Vankish. The curse of blood, which damaged not the body but the soul. Thunder fell silent when he heard Subaru apologize for the long wait. Subaru asked for permission to practice. Meanwhile, Hirasaka was lying on the ground, exhausted. His crushed eye was beginning to hurt. Rinji hoped that it would recover with the increase in level. He looked at the rainbow door, remembering the Subaru and his assistant. The door disappeared. Rinji was shocked. The system reported that the boss had been revived. Rinji's face showed shock. Storm was flying over the tired Hirashika. It was a level 5 storm second coming skill. Rinji realized that he had let his guard down. Storm was screaming like an animal. The boss was approaching the gold player. With the last of his strength, Rinji began to lift his body. Suddenly, a rainbow rift appeared in front of the surprised Hirasaka. The rift turned into a portal between two worlds from which Subaru flew out to meet Storm. The boy swung his hand at Storm. The boss was puzzled. Subaru hit him, which made the boss scream, because the player had used a cursed blood manipulation attack. Subaru's eyes were iridescent and full of hatred. The face of the storm began to fall into pieces. The second boss disappeared. Subaru told Hirasaku that it was time to go back. The golden player froze. Subaru stood in front of him with satisfaction. The system was telling him that he had defeated the boss. Ariaki Subaru was level 45 and had great power marks. The experience points of the storm delta were unavailable to Subaru as the damage dealt was below 20%. The team completed the Hurricanes and Thunder stage of 5-star difficulty in 22 minutes. Rinji held his palm next to his missing right eye. His level had risen to 85. Suddenly, his eye recovered. He turned to the smiling Subaru. Rinji Hirasaka thanked Subaru, because it was dangerous. The golden player was glad that the guy saved his life. Rinji was surprised that Subaru didn't level up. He replied that he had only killed Storm with the last 5% of his health. There was a gate rule. Experience points were not available if the total damage was less than 20%. Rinji was surprised because he didn't know about it. Subaru thought that Hirasaka had been fighting for 8 years. Shikishima who had told Rinji this ten times, would not have been surprised. Subaru shouted up, calling for Saya and Sushi. The player looked up at the palace. Saya and the cat came out from under the dome on the roof. She was happy to see her master in one piece. Rinji thanked her with a smile and said that everything was over. He called out to her that it was time to go back. Saya and Sushi were happy to hear that. The team walked through the door of the building. Suddenly, something caught their attention. In front of them stood an interesting company, with Udu sitting on one of the players. Udu, still holding the book, said that 22 minutes in the five-star gate was a new record. Nearby stood Japan's number one healer, Hishizaki Ruji, who praised Hirasaki's good work. Ruji was the brother of Kusaki Masago. Renji recognized Udu and Hishizaki, but did not recognize the third man. 
Udu said that he was Yatsuruji K, a former bronze rank, and now he was Taiga's subordinate. Yatsuruji started screaming when he heard the insulting phrase about being a subordinate and invited Hirasaka to fight. Udu went on to say that he had received an anonymous tip that helped arrest Yatsuruji. Udu continued to sit on a tense Yatsuruji and said that he should have taken the black man in for questioning. Udu also turned to Subaru and asked him about his impressions of the five stars. Rinji replied that they thought they were going to die. Udu took Yatsuji on his shoulder and told the team to rest. Rinji had already turned around to rest, but Uda grabbed him by his suit and told Rinji that Shikishima was waiting for him. Hirasaka said goodbye to Subaru. Sushi saw ya, and Subaru waved after him. Saya turned to Subaru. The player said with a concentrated face that he had figured out how to meet Sayaka. They arrived at the hotel. Saya and Subaru were on the roof. The passive skill Blood Usurper had a second skill that opened when the player reached level 35. Prana Vapas replaced the soul of the original owner. It was activated at the vassal's request. Saya had read about soul swapping. She touched her body with a smile and rejoiced that it probably still had Sayaka's soul. Subaru was smiling. Saya felt wounded, but she could heal with time. As soon as the soul was restored to a vital level, the exchange would be possible. Subaru asked how Saya could be active. She replied that she was a vampire who functioned on his mana. Subaru turned to Saya and said, with joy in his voice, that Sayaka would eventually come back to life. Saya happily agreed. Suddenly, Subaru fell to his knees, surprising Sushi and Saya. But a moment later, he jumped higher than the sky with Sushi on his head for joy. Subaru rejoiced as he fell down. Saya flew up on her wings and greeted her master. Sushi landed on the foot of the joyful Subaru, who continued to fly in the clouds. Suddenly he changed, remembering the Kalyan had not been telling the truth. Subaru and Sushi were flying back to the roof with arms and legs folded. Landing on a clot of blood, Subaru began to think about Saya's soul. He jumped away from the protective bloody pillow and wondered where the soul had come from. Saya asked Subaru about the trophy for completing the five-star gate. Subaru had almost forgotten about it. Hirasaka had given him part of the delta. The system talked about a trophy in the form of a thunder earring, which allowed him to use electric attacks in any attack. He also received the hurricane earring, which allowed him to take advantage of the wind. Saya said that although the items looked simple, they were actually quite useful. Subaru agreed and gave them to Saya. Saya began to smile silently. Suddenly she shouted at the owner. Subaru explained that he did not yet have the strength to protect her. He wanted Saya to protect herself with these trophies. Saya held the series in her hands and thanked him awkwardly. Subaru asked her to wear them. This frightened Saya a bit, who was asked to put them on immediately. Subaru did not understand her reaction. Saya surprisingly agreed. She stuck the earrings in her elf ears. She asked the player what he thought of her look. Subaru looked fascinated and said that they suited her. Suddenly, Saya flew upstairs with a worried face. Subaru looked at the girl who flew up like a rocket. Subaru was shocked to see where she could have gone. Subaru and Sushi on his shoulder looked up in awe. Suddenly, the cat hit Subaru in the face. The cat began to walk away from Subaru, who did not understand what was happening. It was evening in Ariaki's house. Ariaki Ryohei was thinking about where his stupid sons had gone. He was Subaru's own father and Taiga's stepfather. His wife asked Ryohei to move away from the window because he could be seen. Her name was Ariaki Keiko, and she was Taiga's birth mother and Subaru's stepmother. 
she ordered jewelry over the phone. Ryohei came to the kitchen and said that no one could have guessed that Subaru could be a player and also a savior. He realized that this was proof that his blood was flowing in Subaru's body. Ryohei was returning with a bottle of champagne, saying that their lives would continue to be peaceful and talking about the money that would soon be coming. Suddenly, he turned around and saw a man silhouette in the aisle. It was the renewed Ariaki Taiga. The father did not recognize his son and grimaced. Taiga brought his hand closer to his father, calling him a jerk. Keiko asked him to pour her champagne. But suddenly her face changed when she saw Taiga putting a glass of champagne on the table. He was standing next to her mother, who was sitting behind a chair. Keiko began to look closer. She realized who was standing in front of her. Her mother coldly welcomed Taiga home and continued to look at her phone. Taiga smiled at the fact that his mother recognized him even like this. As she continued to click on her phone, she asked if it was a skip or a change of image. Taiga started to speak, but Keiko interrupted him. She showed him a photo of the necklace she wanted. Naming the price of 20 million, she said that it was even cheap. Taiga looked at her with focused eyes. Keiko looked at her son. She began to be surrounded by Taiga's smoke, who did not like her attitude toward him. Taiga assured her of her disrespect, and the effects of Taiga's smoke began to affect Ariaki Keiko. He looked at his mother and said that he should not have been born. He held out the champagne and said that neither he nor this world was worth anything. Taiga dropped the glass from his hands. It shattered. They were showing it on TV. Last night, at about 7 in the evening, a house in Tokyo's Shinegawa district collapsed. At least two people were confirmed dead. They were a married couple, Ariaki Ryohei and Ariaki Keiko. Their bodies were very badly damaged. Subaru was watching the news in his hotel room in a daze. Sayo was on the other side of the window, turned upside down. She called out to Subaru, who had tears in his eyes when he heard his father's name. Subaru and the golden players came to the ruined house, where two covered corpses lay at the entrance. Subaru froze in front of the ruins. Next to his feet was a sign that read, Ariaki. Renji asked Hudu, who was examining the bodies, about the situation. He said that it was like the Kitokawa method. Udu was sure that Taiga was involved in this tragedy. It was hard for him to believe that he had killed his parents. Renji turned and looked at Subaru. Shikishima approached the boy and asked him how he was feeling. Subaru stood there silently. Shikishima added that he didn't have to go to the checkup. Subaru said that he was not sad about his father because he had no memories with him. Subaru was sad because he didn't care. Shikishima looked at the boy with sympathy. Subaru sat down by the nameplate. He wondered what was going through Taiga's mind. He watched and thought about Taiga. He wondered where Taiga was now. He was near the Players Association. Taiga walked to the entrance past people discussing the latest news. The doors to the building opened. The people around him were discussing Taiga's act and talking about Kiyokawa and how he broke Hirosaki's sword and Udu's shield. Taiga approached the reception desk, and the people around him said that they should have prayed not to meet this incarnation of Satan. The girl in the window happily greeted the guest. Taiga silently blew smoke. The girl in the window was no longer so happy. People around her began to turn around in confusion when they saw the smoke. Cries and requests for help came from the association. A crowd stood outside around the magician. He turned his magic wand into a bouquet of flowers. Doves flew out of his hat. The spectators clapped their hands and applauded the magician. The next trick was the disappearance of the wand. He clutched it in his hand. Suddenly, Behind the magician, the Players Association began to collapse. 
he and the other spectators looked on in horror. The building of the association was collapsing, and the remnants of Taiga's smoke were coming out of it. Ariaki Taiga walked past the collapsed floors. He thought about strength, wisdom, and beauty. These were the three things he had always dreamed of. But having gained all this, he still felt empty. Taiga saw no meaning in life. Subaru asked if he had found something. There was a commotion in the white limousine that was speeding down the road. Everyone was wondering if everyone on the board was safe. Renji said that was not what he was thinking. Shikishima was ordering over the phone to put Tachikawa's largest units in the heads of local rescuers. The goal was to prevent the sky clock from being destroyed. He said that it was dangerous to stay in one place, so they would use the car as a command post. Rinji was burning with anger. Shikishima's eyes were intense. Uda said he didn't understand Taiga's goals, but he was clearly successful. He asked how many people had been injured. Shikishima said there were more than 150 people among the players. He looked at his phone and couldn't imagine how many civilian casualties there were. Shikishima was irritated. He was scrolling through his contacts, looking for the number of the Subaru they had sent home. Suddenly his face changed when the phone started ringing. Odu and Renji looked at Shikishima. An unknown number had called him. He put the phone on the table. It was Kiryu Aisei, asking if they liked the war declaration. Rinji's fury caused the glass surfaces in the car to crack. Shikishima asked to speak quickly. Kiryu Aisei said that they would conduct attacks in six more locations in the same way. This enraged the team. Aisei walked down the underwater corridor and said that one of the attacks would be on Taiga's shoulders and told them to look for him with all their might. Shikishima was alarmed. Renji Hirasaka was standing on the roof of a car holding a sword. His face was full of rage. But it climbed out through the roof window and asked Hirasaka to stop, who had already jumped higher than the sky. Shikishima turned to Udu. He told him that Hirasaka was right and that they had to prevent more tragedies. Shikishima was on the phone and suspected that he was talking to someone who had been following them at the school. Kiryu Aisei confirmed it. Shikishima was eager to punch holes in the bastard who had participated in this war. Kiryu Aisei said he would look forward to it. The conversation, which lasted less than a minute and a half, ended. Udu asked how they would find out about these six places. Shikishima had an idea. The black baby spoke of the destruction of the celestial clock. Taiga's skill was to speed up time, which could blow away a body in an instant. Udu realized that it meant that Taiga wanted to speed up the time on the clock by using a gate so that there would be only zeros. Most likely, it would be the five-star ones that had the most left over. Shikishima said, that there were now 870 days left on the clock. That was enough for three gates. Shikishima said he would send people to the five-star gate. The players received a message not to let Niccolo fight with the enemies, especially with Taiga, whom only the gold rank could face. The scouting team was ready. The war had begun. Juliet sipped her coffee and was not happy about the news. She was sitting in the tower and thought it was idiotic to announce war. Himeno Yamino of the Black Faction asked why it was not possible to conduct surprise attacks in all six locations. She was told that it was not that much fun. It was Araya Kohei who said that the gold rank people had to be defeated openly and fairly. Himeno Yamino asked about Yatsuruji. Araya said that he was out of danger. On Kiryu's orders, they were looking for Ariaki Subaru. Your guys came to the roof of the hotel, where Subaru and Sushi were sitting. He was looking at the trio of black men with anger. Kuruki Taichi's faction was there. Yatsuruji K said 
that he had to defeat Subaru to be allowed to fight Hirasaka. He also had two henchmen with him. Kei said the battle would be one-on-one. -on -one. Subaru stood up and said to attack the three of them. This confused Yatsuruji. Subaru was already wearing bloody armor and said that he had to defeat them on Shikishima's orders. And they, in turn, would tell him about Taiga's whereabouts. They were standing on the roof. Kei asked about Subaru's desire to attack the three of them. Subaru looked at them intently. Shingo said that Subaru wanted to make them look like fools. Kei tried to shut him up. Shingo used the Obsidian Guardian's skill. Subaru looked at the enemies. Shingo was completely in stone armor. He said their types of skill in the armor were similar. Shingo rushed to attack Subaru, who was standing calmly. He punched Shingo. The opponent started screaming. Subaru's punch shattered Shingo into pieces. The other black Frenchman was spitting blood. Shingo was already without armor and spitting blood. He did not understand what had happened or how Subaru had hit his body. Shingo, bleeding to death, did not understand anything. Yatsuruji K saw the blood. He realized that Subaru had pierced him from the inside. Kuruki Taichi noticed Subaru's strength with a smile. The player looked angrily at his opponent. K began to emit dark energy. With his katana in hand, he was approaching to attack Ariaki Subaru. K missed and didn't hit Subaru, who managed to duck. Yatsuruji was swinging his weapon. He even hit Subaru. The fight was fast-paced. K's katana sliced through the air. The Subaru fell to the ground. Shingo was lying next to the other guy. K landed in front of the broken ceiling of the hotel room. Subaru sat on his knee and thought that it could also emit black smoke. So Subaru had to be more careful. Taichi asked K if he could peek. Subaru glanced in his direction. K allowed it and told him to memorize his valiant image. Subaru was surprised that Kei still intended to fight one-on-one. -on -one. Kei's foot was already cutting through the air. He was approaching Subaru, who had put up a shield to protect himself. Smoke was drifting past him. Kei said they had been walking side by side since they were kids. Kei was the brawler and Shingo was the little bully. Taichi sat on the bench and watched from the sidelines. Kei swung his sword and told Subaru, that there was nothing to be surprised about. Subaru jumped back from the blow. His face changed in an instant. Subaru sadly asked what he was talking about. K did not understand. Subaru said that if they were from the Black Faction, they supported the idea of destroying the Celestial Clock and destroying humanity. K said they were not interested in that. Subaru was shocked. He didn't understand how they had been drawn into this black baby. K said that being a brawler meant staying strong in fights. He added that if he had a chance to become stronger, he would take it. K enthusiastically said that they would do whatever it took to destroy the best player, Renji Hirasaka. And then the three of them would see the view from above. That was exactly what they wanted. Subaru was in shock. He couldn't realize this. Yatsuruji K held his swords and asked Subaru to attack. The opponent had a rather strange mindset. Subaru was shocked that the black Frank was not monolithic. He told K that he understood the reason. Subaru asked with a serious face if they had killed Kasaki's team because of this. He was referring to the people who were in front of the five-star gate. K remembered. He said it was a person's problem if they were weak as a player. Suddenly, Subaru's fist slammed into Kei's face. He flew backwards and screamed with his teeth knocked out. Kei crashed into the roof fence, bending it. His nose and jaw were bleeding. Subaru was angry and said that those people were from the intelligence department. They had a family children. They were working to protect the world. Subaru told Kei who he had killed. Kei looked surprised. 
Subaru was full of hatred and said that they were not the kind of people to sacrifice for their selfish dreams. Subaru activated the second level hate skill of brightness. Kei stood there miserably. Tai Chi stared at what was happening in silence. Kei was holding his sword. He swung it and shouted that Subaru was not standing in the way of his dreams. Subaru extended his hand using the blood curse. Tai Chi entered the fray. He kicked Kei with his foot. Kei turned pale. Subaru did not understand what was happening. Tai Chi said that it was time to end it and admit his defeat so that the three of them could try again. Kei was falling with a crash. He fell on the roof, dropping his weapon. Subaru asked Tai Chi if he would be his next opponent. He said no. Subaru was surprised. Tai Chi confirmed that he was a childhood friend of the two, but he had something else. There was a message for Shikishima, where he was sent Tai Chi's new face. Tai Chi said he had a subordinate, Shikishima. Tai Chi was a player spy for the Black France, which was primarily Karuki Tai Chi's intelligence department. He was here to tell us about the location of the six gates. Subaru was shocked. There were already black rank players and gold rank players at the gate. They stood guard in front of the six gates throughout the city. Himino Yamino was at the gate next to the Sayaki sisters. Kiryu Aisei stood waiting. The war had already begun. Taiga stood in front of the five-star gate. He turned around and said he was hoping to meet Subaru. But there was someone better standing next to him, Shikishima. With a smile, he said that today they would fight without any restrictions. Taiga said that Shikishima would die first. He stood in front of Shikishima, who questioned him. They recalled the moment when the black baby Tolrenji, Uduru Yusei, and Shikishima that the three of them would die by Taiga's hand. Shikishima said it was a bad prophecy. He jumped up and down. Ryo used his fifth skill, Rain of Sulfur. Blue orbs began to fall from the sky. They were approaching Taiga. He looked up and was ready to start the battle with the boss. Taiga moved away from Shikishima's attack. He looked cold and emotionless. Shikishima looked down at Taiga. The opponent was thinking. Shikishima Ryo was the first person to stand up to Taiga. Three years ago, there was a situation in the Players Association. Nineteen-year-old Ryo asked when Taiga would raise his level. Fourteen-year-old Ariaki Taiga was puzzled by this question. His leveling up was slow. The owner of the door that Taiga stole was Terangalia. He refused Taiga's cooperation. After he reached above the twentieth level, after which doors usually appeared, there was nothing in front of Taiga. Rinji said that some people had doors appear at the 30th level. He asked Shikishima not to doubt Taiga so much. Ryo said he understood Taiga. They discussed how someone could steal a door from another person. Taiga was sitting under his office listening to these conversations. He was irritated by what he heard. He heard that there was a master of stealing other people's skills in Osaka. Taiga sat exhausted under the office. Taiga felt his safety was threatened by Shikishima. So he wanted to kill Shikishima. Taiga in his new form was happy that his childhood wish would finally be fulfilled. Galei's power had already been enslaved by the dark infant's skill. Ariaki blew out smoke saying that it was a victory for the Black Death. Shikishima stood on the facade of the building. This smoke was spreading. Shikishima looked alarmed. He glanced toward his opponent. Tsukishima was using a clairvoyant skill that allowed him to warn the position of an opponent who was within a one-kilometer radius without running away. Shikishima could not let Taiga out of his sight. Somehow, Taiga was already close to Shikishima. His fist was approaching Shikishima's face, and he said that he couldn't do anything. Shikishima used his third skill. A bright blue light shone around him. 
Taiga looked at it while attacking him. Suddenly, there was an explosion with a rapidly spreading flame that shattered the windows of the building. Shikishima flew along with part of the facade thinking about Taiga's good skill of moving quickly in the smoke. Taiga stood silently on the ground. He asked about Ryo's strength. Shikishima replied that he had a chance of winning. Ryo was an 82nd level gold class. Taiga realized what he had heard. Suddenly, there was an explosion in the city, which scared Ryo. He turned back. Next to him was Ariaki Taiga without one arm. Taiga realized that they knew their goals, so they sent strong players to the gate. So at the last moment, they went for the five-star players. Their number was about 200. The monsters were already in the city. They didn't expect their attack. Taiga asked how they would get out of the situation when they lost so many players. The giant monsters from the underworld were already entering the sleeping quarters. Shikishima looked up and asked if Taiga had done it. And then he asked if this person was definitely Taiga. The answer he heard was that the soul and memories were his continuation, which meant that Ariaki Taiga had died. The wishes were still in his head, but he didn't care what the former Taiga wanted. He wanted to achieve only one thing, revenge on the world that disliked him so much, in memory of the former Taiga. Ryo heard this confession. Usually, Taiga was full of fear, boldness, envy, and vanity a thirst for recognition that was close to madness. This was not felt in the present Taiga. That is, he probably had a trump card that could kill the golden class. Ryo asked him if he hated himself when he became perfect. Shikishima wasn't ready to let Taiga do whatever he wanted. Butterflies appeared around him. He used the sixth skill of butterflies, which was gathering into flames. With a concentrated look on his face, Ryo said that after defeating Taiga, he would go guard the streets. Taiga said that it was his turn to talk about Ryo's death. Shikishima ran to attack surrounded by butterflies. Taiga, surrounded by smoke, ran to meet him. The opponents ran past the destroyed parts of the house. Over the city, two lights were seen colliding. People from the Black Faction saw blue flames over the city and suspected that Taiga was with Shikishima. Kiryu Aisei said that someone was his rival, that someone was Renji Hirasaka, who had cut the otherworldly slug. Renji looked intimidating. Kiryu Aisei adjusted his glasses and told Renji to drop his weapon. Sometime earlier, Kiryu Aisei was standing in front of the back door his child asking if he was going to work. He asked his daughter to listen to her mother and be a good girl. The mother hugged the child and asked Kai to come back soon. The man straightened his tie and said he would be back for dinner. The family waved at each other. Kiryu Aisei looked at his family and walked through the door. The back door closed. He heard a strange sound. The child and the woman had no eyes and blood was pouring from their mouths. A black baby who was nearby said that he had to kill all the enemies. Renji stood in front of the cut monster. Opposite him was Kiryu Aisei, who said that three of the golden class could work now, including Renji. The others could not participate for personal reasons. Renji looked at his opponent with anger. Kiryu Aisei said that he regarded today as a great opportunity to spend time. Renji started running to attack his opponent. Kiryu Aisei said that he was actually enjoying himself. Suddenly, concrete began to fall on Renji's head. The golden player fell in front of his opponent. Kiryu Aisei turned to the gold player. He said that Hirasaka was the easiest prey for him. The opponent was holding an object in the form of a huge axe that could divide any space, and he attacked Renji with it. Hirasaka sat on his knee with his sword, realizing the strength of his opponent. He looked at Kiryu Aisei and thought about how difficult his teacher was. 
he realized that it was the same as the sixth skill of the bending strike. After that, Renji became calmer. Hirasaka thought that it was better for Kiryu Aisei to pass out sooner rather than later. Hirasaka's thoughts were his weakness. Renji was attacking Kiryu Aisei, who was running away with his back turned. Suddenly, a dark seal appeared. It landed on Renji's shoulder. His expression was numb. His body could not move. He began to fall. Hirasaka fell to the ground. As he was getting up, there was a hole in space next to him that Kiryu Aisei had made with his skill. Renji stood up and didn't understand what was happening. He realized that the emblem was preventing him from moving, and it was impossible to see it until the moment of the collision. Kiryu Aisei looked at Renji with disappointment that he did not freeze. Kiryu decided to use another skill. Crest was a general type skill. Objects that touched the emblem stopped for a minute, and it was not visible to anyone before the collision. Kiryu Aisei filled the entire area nearby with his emblems. Renji ran to attack again. Renji ran into the emblem again with his head. Kiryu Aisei swung his weapon, activating the emblem that Hirasaka had touched. He was lying on the ground, grunting. Kiryu Aisei was thinking about Renji using a forehead breakthrough, which was quite arrogant. But Kiryu Aisei was satisfied with Renji losing mana and health. He wanted to kill Renji Hirasaka as soon as possible. The golden player waved his hand, using a whip blade. Kiryu Aisei thought it was stupid. The golden weapon flew straight into the emblems. An explosive split occurred in front of Renji. He was shocked that Kiryu Aisei had managed to stop him before he activated the skill. The opponent stood calmly. An angry Renji looked at him. He didn't understand why they didn't use it with such power to protect the world. Kiryu Aisei had a counter question. He asked why Renji Hirasaka was protecting the world. This caused the golden player to be confused. Kiryu Aisei asked him why he was angry. Remembering the ruined building of the association, Renji listened to Kiryu Aisei. He did not understand why they died for strangers just because it was their job. Kiryu Aisei's eyes were intense, and he asked if this anger proved him right. Renji Hirasaka stood there not knowing what was going on. Suddenly, there was a blow from above that knocked Renji to the ground. He lay there and looked up at his opponent. Kiryu Aisei had said that it was common for people like that to risk their lives to protect the world. Happy memories with Kiryu Aisei's child and wife flashed through my mind. He said that the players were forgetting important things. They stopped seeing the value of this world, Kiryu Aisei said, recalling his hug with his child. Kiryu Aisei began to cry out that this was wrong for him. Rinji gently addressed Kiryu Aisei but his words were overwhelmed by a strong punch to the face. Kiryu Aisei swung his weapon. Renji covered himself with his sword hand. He stood there, his gaze determined. Kiryu Aisei continued to target the players. Renji stood there, shielding himself from the attacks. The golden player's sad eyes were looking down. Kiryu Aisei continued to swing his sword. After losing his wife and child, Kiryu Aisei was upset. As it turned out, the killer of his family was an underage player. It was difficult for Kiryu Aisei to cope with the loss. He was traumatized by this event. He could not ask to legally try a minor murderer. So the black baby from the door offered to help the depressed Kiryu Aisei. He also offered to revive his wife and child. This is how Black Baby recruited Kiryu Aisei. He stood in front of Renji, who held a sword on top of him. This sword no longer had a point. He kept looking at the floor. Kiryu Aisei was shouting that he would kill the player and all his friends. Renji closed his eyes. He remembered Kinokawa, Udo, and Shikishima. A golden light appeared in front of Kiryu Aisei. 
Regaining his composure, Renji used his sixth skill, Whip Blade, again. He looked at Kiryu Aisei with different eyes. Kiryu Aisei began to bleed. Kiryu Aisei's weapon fell. The opponent grunted, saying that the sixth skill used eight mana points. Bleeding? Kiryu Aisei said that Renji had used it, and that he was drained of both health and mana. Falling down and dying with a smile, Kiryu Aisei said that his duty was fulfilled. He lay with his eyes open. In a pool of blood, he looked to the side and said that he did not understand something. He did not understand why Renji was crying. He was kneeling next to Kiryu Aisei and said that during the fight, his opponent's feelings were transferred to him a little bit. He cried every time he struck Kiryu Aisei. Renji felt a huge pain of loss. Hirasaka told the dying Kiryu that he was right, because he really wasn't fighting for the world or anything like that. Renji wanted to protect the world to protect his friends. With tears in his eyes, he added that he wanted to spend all his days with them. Kiryu Aisei felt surprised by the golden player's words. Renji expressed his understanding of the reason why he was struggling. With pride and strength, Renji said that this was why he could not give in to Kiryu Aisei. The opponent smiled. He closed his eyes. Renji was about to attack again. Kiryu Aisei said he couldn't resist the baby. He wanted his family back so badly. He was manipulating and exploiting Kiryu Aisei's weaknesses. Renji was furious. In the amniotic fluid, Black Baby was told that Kiryu Aisei had fallen. He replied that it did not matter. The Black Baby believed that Hirasaki did not have enough mana points to use the skill. In the underwater corridor stood Kiryu Aisei's eyeless relatives, revived. The Black Infant jabbed a finger in their direction, calling them gutted meat dolls. They began to disintegrate. The creature's loud, horrible laugh could be heard. Next to Subaru stood a red-haired girl with dark powers. In total, there were 19 people from the dark group standing in positions throughout the city, including Taiga. Everyone received a status upgrade from the baby for new skills. They were related to space and time. Subaru asked Taichi if they could combine them with their previous skills. He said yes and the red-headed girl used them all. The girl used the animal transformation. Now there was a red cat with glasses in front of him. The boys followed her. Suddenly she became several times bigger, using spatial expansion. She started hissing at the boys who were standing next to her on the barrel. Her attack was stopped by Sushi, who grabbed the cat with her bigger paw. She nailed the red cat to the ground. Subaru thanked his assistant. Taichi was amazed at what he saw. Toraharu and Sushi had been responsible for the destruction of the dark group. Subaru stroked the cat and asked Saya on the phone about her condition. There was a commotion. Saya reported over the phone that the battle south of Shibuya was almost over. Behind her, the monster was cut. Saya was responsible for the otherworldly creatures that had taken over the streets. Subaru said they had to cross paths. She heard and hung up the phone. Suddenly, Saya was surprised. She looked ahead of her and could not believe her eyes. Several columns of smoke rose above the city. Amamiya Hazuki was Sayaka's older sister and was level 48. Amamiya Mizuho was Sayaka's younger sister and was level 42. They were on their way to a rival dark group, to a girl with horns named Haimeno Yamino, who was level 54. Hazuki was flying to attack. Himino Yamino looked up. Sayaka's older sister's foot was getting closer, and she used the falling head of the dragon. This destroyed the building. By dropping the power of the Dragon King, the attack power was increased by 500%. The building collapsed completely, and Azuki was satisfied with the impact. Suddenly, she took a closer look. 
Hymeno Yamino was still standing there, not a scratch on her. Amamiya Mizuho was attacking her from the side. She used the skill Death Angel Scythe, which reduced the health points of the opponent who touched the scythe. Mizuho swung her scythe. She was already a centimeter away from the eye of Hymeno Yamino, who used flashing. The rival disappeared from Mizuho's eyes. She was shocked by this. Suddenly, Mizuho received a hard kick from Hymeno, who had suddenly appeared. Blood was flying out of Mizuho's mouth, and she didn't understand how Hymeno had disappeared and reappeared in the blink of an eye. Hymeno's skill, Yamino, was a real disappearance. For an arbitrary number of seconds, she could erase her existence from the world. One such moment consumed five times as many mana points. From above, Hazuki was flying to attack. But suddenly, Hymena disappeared again. Hazuki landed in shock. A moment later, Hyman reappeared and kicked her in the jaw from her foot. Blood poured out of Sayaka's mouth. Hymeno Yamino struck again. Hazuki was annoyed that not only could she not know how long Hymeno would be gone, but she also ended her appearance with a punch. During Hymeno's disappearance, Yamino also moved. She was running to attack Hazuki. It was a skill that combined stealth and deformation. Hazuki put her foot forward. Her foot suddenly moved. Hymeno reappeared and launched a series of attacks at Hazuki. The girl was hit in the face with her fists and her leg. She beat Hazuki mercilessly. Later, Amamiya Sr. fell to the ground. Himino Yamino was very happy. She asked the girls if they were sisters. Mizuha was already next to Hazuka, supporting her. Yamino said that the older one had better style than her, and the younger one was more determined than Himino. Yamino said they were strong together. This made her rival very happy. With crazy eyes, she said that at last she had the strength to kill the two she envied. Himena released her claws to slaughter the girls. The sisters were furious. Mizuka called her selfish. Kolisp had a phone conversation with Ariaki. He talked about Sayaka, who would eventually be able to return to life. Subaru wanted to bring her to the sisters. The sisters were thinking about Sayaka. They couldn't let the world that Sayaka would return to be destroyed. Yamino mentioned her and said that she was out of the game. This made Mizuho angry. Hymeno didn't understand the problem with the truth. Suddenly, Sayo appeared behind her. The sisters were shocked. Sayo was calm. The system was talking about upgrading skills. Sayo closed her eyes. The soul change was activated. Sayo began the transformation. Himeno turned back. A delicious punch from Sayaka flew into her face. She used the fist of a corpse. And she finished off Himeno with a lightning bolt. Her opponent's teeth flew off. Himeno was shocked. Half of her appearance was Sayas, the other half was Sayaka's. Tears came to the sisters' eyes when they saw Sayaka. She praised her sisters and said she trusted them. Sayaka was happy to have fresh air which she could now breathe freely. She was happy to feel the ground under her feet and to be supported by her sisters who were by her side. Her eyes were red with joy. The one eye that was left of Saya strained. She looked at Sayaka's sisters. Her fist tensed, she became angry. There was blood and loose teeth on the ruins. Himino Yamino was bleeding and missing several teeth. She was annoyed at her ugly appearance. Hymeno used the claw of cruelty skill, but a fist in the face from Sai calmed her down. Himino flew away, spitting blood. Sayaka stood in the stance, asking her sisters to show what they had learned. Sayaka stood across from Himino Yamino. Relatives and masters were connected by a chain of souls. Subaru stood in front of the slain monster from the afterlife. He felt something. Subaru turned his head back 
and said the name of his friend. There was a haze over the city. Sayaka was punching Himio's face with all her heart. She flew at her opponent with courage. Hymeno was already swollen, without teeth, and with a lot of scratches. She could feel every punch from Sayaka deep in her body. Himino felt that she might die soon. She jumped back and used blinking. With her eyes swimming, Hymeno looked at the system notification. It said there was an error that was related to foreign elements in the surrounding space. Hymeno was shocked that she couldn't use the skill. Another punch from Sayaka landed in Yumino's face. The girls stood opposite each other, and Hymeno was covered in red smoke. Sayaka disarmed Himino with her smoke. Hymeno stretched out her hand to attack. But Sayaka easily dodged it. Amamiya Sayaka waved her hand with lightning bolts and said that Himino would not be able to escape anymore. Her punch hit her opponent in the jaw. Izuki and Mizuho looked at their sister in amazement. They were amazed at her skill set, and Izuki noticed that her sister's level of physical strength was higher than hers. Izuki looked at Sayaka in awe. She remembered how Amamiya Sayaka had been kicked off the team when she was level 19. Sitting on the couch, Hizuka said that she had simply been suspended for a while from the task. Sayaka yelled that it was the same thing. Hizuka took her eyes off the phone and said that they were planning a successful attack, and they didn't have time to defend their sister. She suggested that they raise their level. Sayaka said that she should let her sister get stronger on her own if she didn't want to fall face first into the dirt. Her eyes started to water. Sayaka said it would be too late to ask her to come back when she was stronger. Hizuki asked if that was a phrase from the book. Sayaka left saying that she would be her strength and support. The weather was sunny that day. Hizuki approached Mizuho and asked if she had heard anything about Sayaka. Mizuho said that some boss had sucked her levels, and she was down to eighth. Hizuka was shocked that her sister had gotten weaker. She exhaled and held her head. Mizuho told her not to be disappointed and said that Sayaka would get stronger. She left the house and continued to say that Sayaka would definitely come back when she was stronger. Hizuki looked at her. Watching Sayaka fight with Himino, she said that Mizuho was right. She didn't understand what they were talking about at first. Hizuka started shouting that she would support Sayaka. Mizuho was still confused. The sisters started supporting and shouting at Sayaka. Himino attacked Sayaka, who was distracted by the sisters. A small smile appeared on her face. She slammed into Himino's jaw with gusto. Her opponent fell backwards. The sisters continued to shout words of encouragement. Himeno was different from the rest of the family. Little sister Marino listened to the pleasantries of others. Himeno Yamino did not understand why. She stood aside and watched everyone circle around her sister and ignore her. She coldly replied to Himeno Marino's messages, and they didn't even pay any attention to the photo of Yamino. They wore similar clothes, even spoke the same way. But only Yamino was treated badly, receiving negative comments on her posts. Marino was even on the cover of magazines. Yamino wanted to be herself, but she didn't know how to love herself. She bit her nails in anger that Marino was on everyone's mind. The dark baby gave her everything she wanted. Yamino walked into Marino's classroom one day. She clenched her claws. She slashed Marino's face with insane pleasure. Blood dripped on the floor, and her sister screamed. If anyone was taller than Yamino, she would pull them down. Marino did not understand why her sister did this. Yamino stood over her sister and said that if everyone in this world became shorter than her, people would start to notice her. Yamino was smiling crazily at her offended sister. Meanwhile, Hymeno Yamino was getting another punch in the face from Sayaka. 
she didn't understand why Sayaka was better than her. Yomino was suddenly filled with rage and began to attack Sayaka with a desire to let her go. Sayaka dodged the blow. Haimano Yamino flew into the wall. She lay there exhausted and angry. Sayaka was in the air while Haimano crawled and crawled out of the fog. Haimano used the flashing to hurt Sayaka's loved ones. The girl did not see her opponent. The sisters Hizaki and Mizuko stood waiting. Suddenly, Yamino appeared in front of her younger sister's face. She asked her to look closer at her sweet face. Yumino's face looked terrified from the blows. She madly dug her nails into Mizuko's face. Hizaki was scared and shocked. Yamino had a sick smile on her face. But in an instant, it disappeared without a trace. On Mizuko's face was a bloody shield that protected her from Yumino's claws. Haimino Yumino was disappointed. Sayaka was behind her, pointing her hand forward to protect her sister. The girl was using an animal form. Himino Yamino was screaming from not understanding why this world was not the way it was supposed to be. She was constantly being forbidden something, but she was angry at it and against it. There was a ball charged with lightning in the air. Yumino's eyes closed from the intense light. Sayaka was walking toward her opponent with lightning power around her. Haimano Yamino was sobbing and shaking. Sayaka told her that she could only understand one thing in her words. The girl raised her hand up, forming a giant golden charged hand. She angrily asked who gave her permission to raise her hand against her family. Himino Yamino continued to sob and say that she would not forgive. Sayaka struck with ferocity. A huge fist of lightning was approaching Yamino. A large explosion occurred in the ruins between the houses. The smoke from the impact rose higher and higher. Sayaka stood over the body of Himino Yamino. She looked down with a face full of strength. From the ditch, Sayaka looked at the bloody ball on the ground. It was split open, and inside were Hizaki and Mizuho. The older sister realized that Sayaka had not only fought, but had also protected them. She remembered the words that Sayaka had said that she would be her strength and support. She beamed with joy for her sister. Mizuha echoed Hizaka's words about their sister's strength. Sayaka jumped up and down and waved at her sisters. She said she had one. The sisters were happy and the younger one asked how much she had changed the angle. Suddenly Sayaka started to fall. The sisters were concerned and scared for their sister. Sayaka held her chest and started spitting blood. Inside her eye, Saya saw two faces. Saya told her that time was running out. She talked about the importance of starting the sequential restoration of internal organs. Sayaka thanked her for the warning. Saya suddenly regained consciousness and apologized for blacking out. The sisters rushed to Sayaka's side. The younger one asked if she would leave again. Sayaka asked them to wait a little longer until she returned. With a smile, she offered to reconvene the team when she recovered. Hizaki had tears in her eyes, and Mizuko asked her to wait. Sayaka turned back to see Subaru flying in the sky. He was hurrying to his friend. She looked at Subaru and froze. Sayaka was silent. It was Saya who spoke. Sayaka wanted to meet. At least once, even if she wasn't allowed to. She wanted to say hello and apologize for not helping with Thunder. She wanted to be stronger together. Subaru had always protected and saved the girl. Her death in front of Subaru left a deep wound on him. Tears welled up in Sayaka's eyes, and she wanted to become stronger with him. Saya turned to Sayaka, who began to break down. She began to fall apart. Sayaka thanked Saya for taking care of her body. She asked Saya to give Subaru something. Her face was covered with cracks. Saya's eyes were shocked. Subaru shouted his friend's name. 
but Sayal was lying in his arms. She apologized for making him nervous. He asked if Sayaka was here. Saya nervously said that Sayaka would come back when she had no problems with her internal organs. She had no choice but to return for a while. Saya stood in front of the red door. Subaru was blushing a little and smiling. Saya said she had a message for Subaru. She said that he would be waiting for him at the red table. Sayaka's hand went up, and she greeted. The girl said she was back, walking through the red door with the skeletal ocean. As she walked away, someone said they were spying on her. Sayaka asked if everything was perfect. Standing before her was the corpse king Cal Allen, a subordinate of Vankish. He gave her a score of 13. Sayaka was not happy with this assessment. Kalion turned away and asked her not to interfere with the school policy. Storm thought Sayaka deserved the full 30 points. Thunder began to argue with Storm. Sayaka was exhausted. Kalion said that they would continue their training soon. They walked toward Storm and Thunder, who were sitting at the red table. Subaru did not understand the meaning of the message. Saya apologized because she didn't know anything about the red table either. Suddenly, Ariaki Subaru was shaken by a shout. Izaki's angry sister was heading toward him. Subaru stood anxiously next to Sushi and Saya. Izaki clutched Subaru's hands. She tearfully thanked Subaru for meeting Sayaka with tears in her eyes. Subaru was stunned. Mizuko, behind him, was also thanking him and apologizing for her distrust. Izuka held Subaru's hands to her forehead and told him that they owed him. Tears also began to appear in Subaru's eyes. Izaka turned around, and Mizuko said that they had to continue clearing out the monsters. She fervently told Subaru to defeat them all, especially Taiga. Subaru and Sushi stood in a sinkhole. He raised his hand, thinking about Hizuki's words. He turned to Sai. Subaru said that Vankish had told him to be happy. He didn't understand what was supposed to make him happy, because the world was becoming more and more horrible places. He put his hand over his eyes, and said that he could only be happy with everyone else. Saya smiled softly. She said she would accompany Subaru wherever he went. Meanwhile, the city was still in chaos. Saya's level rose to the fortieth at Sayaka's expense. The soul's memories were partially restored, and Saya gained the wild blood skill. She could also now use Sayaka's Amamiya mana. Subaru, Sushi, and Saya looked up. They decided to move on to help the others. Ryo's butterflies were flying. Taiga jumped back. There were these blue-winged insects in front of his eyes. Dot there was a loud explosion followed by Shikishima flying in the air. He looked stern. Taiga suddenly appeared behind the player. He was rushing to attack Ryo. Shikishima turned and said that the teleportation skill was useless in this smoke. Taiga was entering butterfly space. There was an explosion behind Shikishima. He used the six skill of the moths that were gathering on the flames. He summoned flame insects to automatically track the target. It was worse than the fifth skill in terms of power, but it was unmatched in terms of energy consumption. He could not lose sight of the target. Taiga stood on the ruins and looked at Shikishima flying in the sky. Taiga realized that his teleportation radius was greatly reduced by the skill. Shikishima looked down at Taiga, who said that Ryo had no peace and complacency after eight years of fighting. The player landed on his opponent. Suddenly, behind Taiga on the building was Renji, who was using the fifth skill Sky Gaze. Fifteen minutes and thirty-seven seconds had passed, since the start of the fight between Shikishima Ryo and Ariaki Taiga, Renji Hirasaka has arrived. Eight years ago, the player's building was not so big. At that time, 18-year-old Renji Hirasaka met Shikishima 
and said that from now on they would act on equal terms as members of the gold class. Fourteen-year-old Shikishima was busy with his laptop and told him to stay away from it if Renji didn't want to cooperate. Hirasaka said excitedly that this was not the case and he wanted to talk. Ryo inquired. Renji asked Ryo for his laptop. Hirasaka held his laptop in his hands, which was fried by the touch. He activated the fire alarm. Hirasaka, looking like a superstar, asked for help. Ryo looked downcast. He grimaced and clenched his teeth. He asked him not to touch the other computer. The movie machine was screaming fire. But who wondered about the victims? Renji was looking down on his opponent from the top of the tower. Taiga noticed Hirasaka. He turned, realizing that he had defeated Kiryu Aisei. Taiga was silent. He felt happy to be able to catch two members of the Golden Class at once. Taiga was confident of his victory. He summoned the Black Gate. Shikishima was puzzled. A door appeared in front of him that could create smoke. Shikishima was getting ready. Suddenly, a large number of hands came out of the door and grabbed Ryo. The hands were pulling him through the door. He didn't understand how the creatures from the other world came out of the door, bypassing the gate. Shikishima tried to use the third arson skill in his captivity. Ryo despaired when he failed. He suspected it was the strength of the hand. It was holding him, emitting smoke. Renji turned his attention to Shikishima. Taiga looked at Ryo, whom he considered the weak point of the gold class. They each had skills that were too strong for close combat. Shikishima looked at his limbs, which were beginning to crack. Renji glanced at his opponent. Taiga formed a weapon out of his hand. He thought that Renji, with his sentimentality, could understand him. The spontaneous decision affected the fate of everyone there. Renji was angry. A golden light flashed behind Taiga. Ryo was bleeding in the hands of the otherworldly beings. Taiga was preparing to attack. Everything happened in a split second. Renji used the skill of the venerable star and jumped out of the building. He flew with a face full of shock. His pupils were constricted. He looked at Shikishima, who was bleeding to death. His golden sword cut through all of the creature's arms, freeing Shikishima. Renji held his sword with determination. His weapon fell to pieces. He looked to the side with sadness. Ryo flew down, looking and saying Renji's name. Hirosaki's body was cut in half. Blood was pouring out of Ryo's cracks. But when he saw Renji, his pupils constricted in shock. Taiga used his spear to cut Hirosaki's arm. The golden player fell backwards with a calm face. Blood flew past his golden eyes. He could see Shikishima trying to crawl to him. He was already closing his eyes. His last words were that it was good that he had made it. With a smile on his face, he closed his eyes. Half of his body was lying on the ground. Shikishima was screaming with sadness and pain. Ryo remembered how they had cleared the first gate of the ruins. Renji was holding out his hand to the young wounded Shikishima. They were both covered in blood. Ryo asked if Renji had defeated the boss. He replied that he was not good for anything but fighting. Hirasaka winked at Shikishima and said that it was all with Shikishima's help. He then received a level up. Ryo was clearly unhappy. Hirasaka said that the other pair, Kinokawa and Udu, also made it thanks to Ryo being the bait to distract the boss. He waved to his friends. Shikishima asked if they could fight in this condition. The boys clasped their hands, and Hirasaka said they would get stronger later. They stood in front of Udu and Kinokawa, who happily ran to meet them. Hirasaka suggested that they become stronger together. Kinokawa, who was 15 years old, drank a drink and asked what the intelligence department was. Ryo was sitting across from her, 
turned his laptop toward her, and said he would create a unit of gate map specialists. Rio was in charge of this project. She asked if it was to protect others. Rio looked away, holding his cup to his lips. In the window, he saw Hirasaka waving at him and Udu together. Rio thought about how these guys could die in battle. Kitokawa looked at his friend, who said that if the gate was gone, everyone would be able to leave with a smile. He expressed his opinion with hope in his eyes that this would be the case. And now Rio's wild cry could be heard over the streets. He was sobbing, holding half of Hirosaki's body in his arms. Shikishima was devastated. He held his friend's head, which no longer showed any signs of life. They sat on the ruins until they heard someone's voice from the side saying that people were willing to sacrifice their lives for what they valued. It was Taiga who greeted Ryo. He said that Ryo was a true friend to Hirosaki. Shikishima was incredibly angry, with blood pouring from cracks in his face. He wanted to kill Taiga, but he could not leave Hirosaki's body. In his arms was Hirosaki's slightly bluish body. Ryo's eyes were filled with tears. He hugged his friend and grieved. He was shaking with horror and pain. He thought that Hirosaka had died for him. Tears fell down Renji's face. Ryo said that he fought only to be with them. Taiga came up behind the grieving Shikishima. He swung his weapon. Taiga used the red drill skill. It was drilling into the player. Suddenly Taiga noticed something on the side. The drill landed. Everything was covered in smoke. Shikishima turned back. With teary eyes, he looked at the guy behind him. It was Subaru from Sushi. He was looking at Taiga, who was on top of a dilapidated building. There was anger in Subaru's eyes. Taiga, in turn, radiated indifference. Ryo started shouting at Subaru and tried to talk about Hirasaka. He kept holding his body. Subaru looked back. The boy had closed his eyes. He told Shikishima that everything was fine. The boy added that Hirasaka was not gone from their world. Subaru straightened his arm, using the dead man's skill. Blue flames appeared around Renji. Ryo was shocked as parts of Hirosaki's body began to fly off. Shikishima realized that it was due to the rainbow door. He thought back to when they were in the limo, and Renji had said that it was probably the first time they had seen it, and that Amamiya had been reborn. Ryo turned around, realizing it was a Subaru skill. The skill allowed you to inhabit an immortal soul into the corpse of a friend with whom you had a connection. At the time, it was Saya on whom he first tried it. She was reborn and became Sayaka. He had two composite skills in the blood usurper. Subaru stood with his back to Ryo, to whom he apologized for not being able to bring Hirasaka back immediately. But they were obliged to protect Hirasaka's body. He said with confidence that Hirasaka would return to them one day. Tears started to fall in Ryo's eyes. He began to sob and thank Subaru. Renji's body was being reattached in parts, held together by greenish threads. A smile appeared on his face. He suddenly started laughing. There was an explosion that sent Ryo flying to the side. Renji Hirasaka flew up into the sky with green flames. He stuck his tongue out of his mouth, laughing. Renji gathered himself into a single body and flew face up. Taiga and Ryo watched this spectacle. Renji spoke of the air of the human world with special pleasure. He liked it. Mittens appeared on his hands. Renji spoke of the power circulating in him. The creature liked Renji's body, which he considered the best. Subaru looked up and noticed the laughter. This gave him a thought. Subaru's body was enveloped by Vankish's first subordinate. His hair was green, and he had an eye patch over one eye. He introduced himself as Kalion, the corpse of the demon king, and now a relative of Ariaki Subaru.
Cal Ion had different appearances at different stages. He was a subordinate of Vankish, the immortal sixth king. After Subaru's long martyrdom trials with the gate earlier, like Vankish, he was partially restored due to Subaru's age. This strength was incomparable to what it was during the trials. Taiga's brow furrowed. He raised the black gate around him. He ordered to find and finish off the enemies. Hands flew out of the door. Kalyan met the hands approaching the king with open arms. Kalyan suspected a skill of desolation when he saw the hands. He went on to say that it looked like a black baby's nurse. Kalyan raised his hand using the blood bowl skill. He clenched it into a fist. A green vortex formed around Kalyan, who was flying in the air. He said they were a hundred million years too late. Kalyan launched an attack. He used the Reign of Influence skill, launching green drops toward the hands. These hands from the dark door began to break. After the corpse fist skill, the arms were torn apart. Kalyan launched another shake skill. The hands hid back in the door with a frightening scream. Taiga stood silently. Kalyan noticed something. He was forming an object in his hands. It was the skill of squeaky scissors, which he hurried to attack with pleasure. Kalyan flew with gusto holding the huge scissors. He launched them. They flew into the door where the hands were hiding. On the other side of the door, these scissors cut a terrible jellyfish-like creature in half. The creature was screaming. Ryo and Taiga were amazed. Subaru enjoyed the sight. The Kalion in Renji's body proudly began to descend toward Subaru. It was quite easy for him. He hugged Subaru, scaring Sushi, and laughed in the boy's ear. Taiga was walking in a dark fog. He was on his way to meet Subaru in Kalion. Taiga asked Kalion if he was his next opponent. He replied that he had not received such an order from Subaru, so he refused. Taiga clenched his hand into a fist and said that he would then kill Hirasaka. Kalyan scratched the back of his head, asking Taiga what he had just said. Subaru looked focused. He said that his opponent was standing right in front of him. Taiga asked again. Kalyan pointed and said it was strange that Taiga was avoiding a fight with Subaru. Taiga looked ahead of him. He was surprised to hear him say that. Kalyan told Taiga to start the fight with a smile, because he had plenty of time, unlike Taiga. Subaru stood still. Taiga was shocked to hear that he was avoiding a fight with Subaru. That wasn't true. He just wanted to make sure no one interfered with his decision. Just a tweak. In Subaru's eyes, he could see the image of Kalyan. Taiga was standing in front of Kalyan. He remembered the name Ariaki Taiga. Subaru had met Taiga when he was a child. The boy was scared and surprised. He remembered the fear he had experienced. He looked ahead of him and expressed his joy with gritted teeth. Taiga was standing in front of the ruined door, and he called Subaru in. Ryo was on his knees, screaming that it was a trap. Kalion spoke in his ear, that their meeting was over. He whispered to Subaru to do what he had to do. Subaru agreed. Ariaki Subaru called out to the glass cat. Shikishima looked ahead. Subaru was standing in front of the door. He had already entered the back door with Sushi. Ryo was shocked. He shouted at Subaru to wait. The guy was falling into a dark void. He remembered Taichi's question. What Subaru had done in Taiga's past. Subaru and Taiga were already in a deep, hollow darkness. Subaru suggested that they figure out what had connected them. He floated calmly in the waters. The black baby was next to him. The boys had almost reached the underwater corridor. The baby rejoiced at Hirasaki's death and praised Taiga for bringing the Subaru with him. He considered it an absolute victory for the black group. Subaru looked at black baby from the underwater corridor. He had been waiting for this meeting. 
Subaru stood opposite Taiga with sushi on his shoulders. Taiga asked the baby to hide his hands. The creature agreed, referring to a contract that stipulated that Taiga must kill Subaru with his own hands. He told Taiga to calm down and solve the problem. Subaru noticed that the dark baby would not kill him personally, as Taichi had said. The baby was saying that Subaru would be shot down by Taiga. It understood that Hirasaka had taken Kalyan's place, but if he killed Ariaki Subaru, the kin, skill would also disappear. He was the king of the darkness of the human world. Vankish was smiling. Kalyan in Subaru's body was flying around the city. He was holding Ryo, who was begging the fake Hirasaka to let him go. This made him angry, and he asked who else was fake. Shikishima thought he was carrying him to the enemy's lair. He yelled at Kalion. He yelled back at Ryo and assured him that it was a strategy. This interested Shikishima, and he began to ask about it. Suddenly, a system notification appeared in front of his eyes. It was a danger warning, because the remaining time in the five-star gate was running out. This puzzled him because Ryo now had only one five-star gate left. The girl stood on the roof, looking at the horizon, which was covered in black fog. She suspected that she was the only one who took her job seriously. Her name was Haji Maori, and she was from the Black Gang. Ryo looked at the notification and thought about the punishment. The punishment for the gate was that the minutes left on the celestial clock would go faster. Ryo was shocked to see that it was 8,000 hours. The days on the celestial clock began to decrease. They turned red, and the sky seemed to split. There were two and a half days left on the clock. Shikishima looked at the destruction of the sky clock. The message said that there were 63 hours left. A warning came that time had decreased by 100 hours. There was a possibility that the system's maintenance was having serious problems. This was the first time Shikishima had seen such a warning. It wasn't just a breakdown. Taiga had cut 200 hours off the gate. If Taiga interfered with one more gate, the people were doomed. Ryo was in despair at not knowing what to do. Kalion, who was carrying him, hit Ryo on the head and ordered him to take his chance. Shikishima took hold of his head and turned to Kalion, who said it wasn't that hard. He said that if Hirasaka was valuable to him, then let him protect him. Ryo looked at Kalion in Renji's body in silence. He squeezed his eyes shut. Suddenly, he clutched his face with his hands, and blood poured out of the cracks. He began to scream in pain. Kalion did not understand why the boy did this. Ryo angrily ordered him to shut up and not to throw advice around with Hirasaki's expression. Shikishima said they should continue to the hospital. Kalion didn't understand what Ryo was saying. Shikishima closed his eyes and began to explain with regret. He said that there was someone important at the hospital. He was referring to Kinokawa Sakura, who was lying in the ward. When Ryo entered the room, he noticed that the girl was missing. He was angry that he didn't see her there. Kalion asked why Ryo was so angry. There were two players standing on the lawn. One of them was beaten by a Raya Kohei from the black group. He was tense. And the other player was Udu, who was standing in front of him with his arms folded. Araya launched an attack on Udu, using the destructive Thurs Fist skill. But suddenly, he was knocked down by Udu's golden wall. She came out of the ground, throwing Araya up. Blood gushed out of Araya's mouth. He did not understand why Udu used protection as a strong weapon. He thought he was protected on all sides like a turtle. Ryusei Udu was a simple sage who acted on his own. The stronger his strike was, the stronger his defense was. Udu was not concerned about the possibility of attack. He stood with the phone in front of Araya, who was lying face down on the grass. 
but who picked up the phone from Shikishima, who asked about his condition. He asked the same in return. Ryo said that Hirasaka had died, and that another person had moved into his body. Udu, of course, did not understand. Ryo told him not to worry. The conversation lulled Kaion to sleep. Shikishima said that the more important thing was that Kinokawa was missing and asked Udu if he had any idea where she had gone. Udu Ryusei looked up at the sky with a thoughtful look. Meanwhile, the girl was using her second skill. Her body was covered with a golden shield on her arms and golden stockings on her legs. This was Kinokawa Sakura. She went on the attack, firing the weapon that was in her leg. It was a Karen pistol that she used to shoot a huge dragon. This was all in front of Uda's eyes, who explained it all to Ryo. Shikishima was shocked and angry because she was badly injured. Kinokawa walked on the ground, asking Udu what Ryo had said to him. She said that there was no time to lose, because the clock was on the verge of destruction. The Kinokawa Sakura replaced her arms and legs with her first skill. Ryo said that she didn't look weak. Kinokawa angrily replied into the phone that she would not apologize for it. Uda said that they had no choice anyway. Ryo agreed. He added that they were the players who would capture the gate and save the world. He clenched his fist with fervor. Ryo asked to notify all the players. They started receiving messages on their phones. It didn't matter how many stars there were. The players were standing in front of a two-star gate. Everyone needed to attack as hard as they could. The scout team also received a message. Ryo shouted that they would take back their time that was taken from them. Ledu scratched his neck and agreed. Kinokawa said with passion that they would wake everyone up. Ryo called for Renji's fake. He explained that his name was Kalion. Shikishima said that Ariaki was really worried. Kalion started laughing. With a calm face, he called it obvious. If there was no point in relying on him, then nothing good would come of it. Meanwhile, in front of the black baby, there were strange bubbles and rainbow glitter. He asked someone why he had come. The baby addressed Vankish, who was standing in front of him. Vankish said that the baby had not been brought up well. Taiga noticed Vankish. He knew that he was the lord of the Rainbow Gate who had given Subaru his power. Taiga turned to hear Subaru's voice. He was asking Taiga to show him something. Taiga's smoke and Subaru's blood could neutralize each other without control. The guy stood there with his arms outstretched and offered a competition without tricks. Taiga bit his lip in rage. Subaru proposed a fist fight as brothers. From start to finish, Subaru covered his eye with his hand. 